Hey, what's up? It's John from Coding Addict, and welcome to React tutorial video, where we're going to take a deep dive into awesome world of React. We're going to start from the very scratch, so think setup, install, and general concepts, and slowly but surely move towards more interesting and more complex React topics like React Hooks, Context API, and React Router, just to name a few. So by the end of the video, you're going to have a good grasp on how to use React for your next project. As a side note, I'm currently working on additional React projects video where we'll put all of our tutorial knowledge to good use by building a bunch of cool apps with React. If you'd like to see some of the projects we're going to build, just head on over to react-projects.netlify.app and look for the video link in the description. And lastly, both videos are part of my React course, where we build even more cool and complex projects using React. And if you're interested, you can check out the course at johnsmilga.com. All right, and welcome to the course. And we're going to kick things off by quickly covering what in the world is React. And there's no better place to start than the official docs of React, which, by the way, are located at reactjs.org. Once we navigate there, we are greeted by this one profound sentence. React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. And that's it, my friends. Not a PhD dissertation paper, just a short, concise one sentence explanation. Well, I'm a big fan of straight to the point answers, and this one by far sums up React the best. Let me elaborate a bit on that. So React was developed at Facebook in 2011, and currently it is by far the most popular. Yes, you heard correctly, the most popular JavaScript library to build user interfaces. As a side note, some of React's competitors are Angular, Vue, and Svelte. If there's one thing that I would want you to take away from this video, it is this one. When it comes to React, it's all about components. And you can think of components as independent chunks of user interfaces. Components can be as small as one HTML element, or you can be a rebel and jam your entire Facebook clone in one component. At the end of the day, a lot of it depends on your needs and wants. In reality, though, you probably will avoid the one component route since it somewhat defeats the purpose of using React in the first place. You see, the benefit of the component is that you can build a bunch of independent, isolated, and most importantly, reusable user interfaces that you can then piece it together just like Lego blocks. And as a result, build even super complex apps without going insane. While your app can have as many components as you would like, it will always, always have at least one called root component. We already glossed over it a bit, but just to reiterate the major benefits of using components and essentially React to develop your next app are following. You can build independent pieces of user interfaces, meaning changing logic or layout in one component will not break your whole app. Once component is ready to go, you can reuse it all throughout your app. But component code is still stored in one place. So if you ever need to make some changes, you don't have to run around like a headless chicken. Simply locate the component, apply the changes, and all the instances will be automatically updated. And of course, let's also not forget about speed. You see, behind the scenes, React is using something called Virtual DOM, where only the component that needs to be updated is affected. And what's really cool, it's done without re-rendering the whole app, which in turn, of course, increases the speed of your final product, and as a result, the user experience as well. Before I let you go, I also would want to show you a somewhat typical example that everyone uses to show React components in action. And that is no other than our beloved Twitter. So as we're looking at the screen, and by the way, I can see you getting distracted by my content feed. Focus, people, focus. 
We are here to learn. Where was I? Oh, yes, the components. Let's take a look at the sidebar. And as I'm looking at it, I can see a bunch of links. However, you probably notice that each link has pretty much the same structure, where there is some kind of icon as well as the text. So essentially, what we could do is set this up as one component. And what that means is that we'll just set up a structure and everywhere where we would want to use it, we would just need to pass in the data. And by data, of course, I mean the specific icon that is going to be rendered. And then, of course, the text. And as a result, what that also means that I can reuse that component all throughout my application, however I would like. But if I would want to make some changes, for example, if I would want to add something here, I can just change it in one place and then all the instances will be automatically updated. So that would be a links example. And you can probably already guess that the same, for example, would work with the post. Because when we're looking at the post, what do we have? We have some kind of picture, we have the name, of course, we have the text, we have all the retweet options as well as likes and the comments. But the only thing that is changing is the data. So the person who is posting it and how many likes and that sort of thing. So the point that I'm trying to make is that as you're looking at the application, you can see a bunch of places where we can set up a React component and then use all the awesome benefits the components provide. Before we go any further, let's also cover the main goals of the course. And tell you honestly, there's only one. By the end of the course, I would want you to be comfortable with React. Now, what that means to me is that you can do two things. First, you are aware of external resources. And more importantly, you're comfortable with using them when you would want to learn something new about React. So essentially, you know where to find useful info. And second, you are comfortable applying theory to practice by building your own projects using React. Now, goals are nice, but what is my plan to get you there? And the answer is simple, by building a bunch of projects using React. You see, the course goal is not to cover every smallest aspect of React's ecosystem, since it's impossible. A course that covers everything that there is to know about React doesn't exist. While the core API of React is actually quite small, since it is by far the most popular framework out there, the ecosystem surrounding React is as vast as you can imagine. What that means is that essentially, there will be always something new to learn about React. That's why I would suggest adopting a student mindset instead, where you're always open to expanding your React knowledge. In my experience, the best way to learn and get comfortable with language or framework is by building a bunch of projects. So that's exactly what we'll do during this course. We'll start small. Our first project will be somewhat silly. But slowly and surely, we will expand on our knowledge. And by the end of the course, you will be comfortable building your own complex React apps. As far as the course structure, we're going to start by setting up our dev environment. So think text editor, browser, basic terminal commands, and etc. Followed by extensive React tutorial, during which we will build already some small project to enforce that particular subject matter that we're learning. And once we're done with the tutorial, we'll simply put our heads down, roll up our sleeves, and build React projects like there's no tomorrow. Now, as a side note, at the very end of the course, we'll also cover Redux and why it is used. While I'm fully aware that the first part, the setup part, might seem tedious, boring, and maybe even unnecessary, please keep in mind that it is extremely important for me that all of us are on the same page. And don't worry, we'll get to React in no time. When it comes to course requirements, it would be extremely beneficial if you would be familiar with HTML, CSS, and most importantly, JavaScript. 
I can honestly say that the more JavaScript, especially ES six, you know, the easier is going to be pick up react because at the end of the day, react is just JavaScript. So if you're familiar with things like spread operator, RL functions, the structuring and et cetera, you'll be in good shape. Now, it's not the end of the world. If you're still getting comfortable with JavaScript, just keep in mind that once in a while, you will have to do some extra studying since it is my assumption that you are familiar with ES6 JavaScript topics. And while I will try to cover as much JavaScript info as possible, please understand that at the end of the day, this is a React course. Now, if you need to brush up on your JavaScript knowledge, or if you'd like to find out more about specific JavaScript topic during the course, I would suggest utilizing my YouTube channel, Coding Addict, more specifically playlist called JavaScript Nuggets, where we cover React specific JavaScript topics. I'm constantly adding new topics. So while at the time of recording, there are only three videos, by the time you'll be watching this, there will be more. So again, the channel that you are looking for is Coding Addict, and more specifically, the playlist name is JavaScript Nuggets. So the way it works, as I'm recording the course, and once I hit a specific JavaScript topic, for example, map or unique values or dynamic object keys, I will create a separate video about that, just in case you would want to find out more about the topic. When it comes to our dev environment, we will need following tools. Node.js installed on our machine, web browser. I would suggest Google Chrome, but technically it is optional. As long as you have a web browser, you'll be good to go. Just remember that once in a while, your results might differ because the browser that you choose, if it's different browser other than Google Chrome, maybe, I don't know, it displays CSS a little bit differently. Then a text editor, again, I would suggest Visual Studio Code, but we all have our preferences, so no hard feelings, as well as React developer tools, which are not required, but will improve your dev experience in the long run. And I guess let's go down the list. And first one, we have a node. Now, in order to check whether you have node installed already on your machine, in a terminal, you would need to run a node and then dash dash version. So you'll see whether the node is installed. And then if it's successful, it will also tell you what is the version. And then if you don't have it installed, then it's probably going to say something along the lines that it cannot find the command or something like that. And what you're shooting for is at least 5.2, because later we will use a package called create react app. And more specifically, we'll use npx install it. And that comes with a version of 5.2 minimum. Of course, if you have a higher version, that is even better. So in order to test it out, I will navigate right now to my terminal. I'll massively zoom in just so you can see what is happening. And we type here node dash dash version. So of course, it spits back that I have version 12. Okay, so I'm good to go. Now, if you don't have node installed, I would suggest navigating to node.js.org. And of course, you can just get there by going to Google and typing node, for example, here, you can say node. And of course, the first link that's going to pop up is going to be node.js.org. And they will right away detect which operating system you're using. So in my case, that is Mac. And then I would shoot for a long term support option. So click it over here and you'll get yourself node. Now I'm not going to install it since I already have it on my machine. And also it's just clicking a bunch of checkboxes. Then we have Google Chrome. So again, if you don't have it, go for Google Chrome. And then one of the first links is going to be to a page where of course you can download Chrome. Then we have Visual Studio Code. Same deal, just look for Visual Studio Code. It is a awesome open source text editor from Microsoft that is just amazing as far as the development experience. 
And once you go to their site, which is code that visual studio.com again, they will detect which operating system you're using and you can right away get yourself a nice fresh out of the oven copy of the visual studio code. Then we've got react developer tools again, just look for them. And one of the links is going to be right away to the extensions. And then of course, in my case, I already have it. So I would need to remove it. But in your case, if you don't have it installed, then of course, you'll have add to Chrome. So you'll add that extension. And what you're looking for are the components and the profiler. Keep in mind that of course, if for example, you are at the page that doesn't use react, then of course, it's just going to be gray. And what I'm talking about this little icon notice this react developer tools, then essentially, it's going to be gray. However, if the site is using react, then of course, you'll be able to see it. And then once you open up the console, so of course, you can either do it with a shortcut, which I believe was option command and I and there it is. And what you're looking for is this profiler and components. Again, I'm not going to look at them right now, because it's not going to make sense. But eventually, as we're progressing with the course, you'll see how react developer tools will make your life a little bit easier as far as working with a react application. As far as my specific text editor setup, meaning what extensions I'm using, and which ones I would suggest using during the course as well, as well as my settings JSON, I'm not going to cover them too much in this video. Because essentially, I don't see the point. Once we start building the react application, then one by one, or I'll set up a separate video, where essentially, I'll show you all the extensions that I would suggest getting, and also what settings we would need to set it up in our Visual Studio code in a text editor. Now, if you are impatient, and if you'd want to see all the extensions that I'm using, as well as my settings, you can just navigate to my GitHub, and the handle is john hyphen smilga. And then the repo that you're looking for is VS code setup. And in here, you'll find all the extensions that I'm using, as well as small description, and also my settings JSON. Now again, let me reiterate that a little bit later in the course, I will cover which extensions are crucial for you to follow along, meaning which will make your life much easier as you're working with react, and also what settings you need to set up in your settings JSON. But if you'd want to see them right now, everything that I'm using, even though some extensions are not required for this course, then again, navigate to a repo, which is john hyphen smilga, and then VS code setup. And here you'll find my settings JSON, as well as all the extensions that I currently have in my Visual Studio code. Hopefully everyone was successful setting up the dev environment. And now we can move on to the next phase of our setup. Normally, this would be the point where we download and examine create react app tool. Or there's something that I would like to cover first. And that is no other than the scary terminal and some of its most popular and used commands. You see, even though this is a React course, we will use command line and NPM during the course. So we might as well get some basics out of the way. Now, if you're already comfortable with terminal and NPM, which by the way, we'll cover in the next video, feel free to skip these videos. If however, you are seeing the scary terminal for the first time, hopefully you will not feel that way after watching this video. Please keep in mind, though, we will just cover the basics. So if you would like to learn more, I would suggest utilizing endless YouTube videos and medium blog posts about command line and its commands. And first question, coming out of your mouth is probably along the lines, well, what is terminal? And why would want to use it? Well, you see, if you're watching this course, it is safe to assume that you have successfully tackled the graphical interface. 
at least the basics, the GUI. What is GUI? Well, it is this. It is the icons. We can find more commands and along those lines. Now, what we can also do is control our computer, not just using the GUI, the graphical interface, but also the command line. And that's where the terminal comes in. I fully understand that the first time seeing this is scary, but don't worry, it is not as bad as it looks like. And the first command that I would want to look at is pwd, which will show us a full path name to a current directory. So where are we at as far as our machine in the terminal? So we just type pwd. And I can tell you right away that we will be in the root. By the way, you can notice this by this little symbol. Okay, so now where is my root? It is forward slash users and then forward slash my last name. So that is my root directory. Now, if I would want to see what directories I have in that folder, well, I just go by ls. And this is going to spit back what directories I have in my root directory. Now, to prove my point, I'm going to navigate to my hard drive and then I'm looking for the users and I'm looking for my last name. And there it is. And now you can clearly see that I'm not making this up. I'm in the root right now in the finder as well as in my command line. Now, if I would want to navigate to a specific folder, we would need to type CD and then whatever folder name. So in this case, if I would want to navigate to a desktop, I would just need to write desktop. And that's it. Now, of course, we navigate to a desktop. And I can clearly see that here as well. Now, if I would want to navigate one level up, basically back to a parent, I would need to go to CD and then dot dot. So now, of course, you can again see that I'm sitting in the root. So if we would want to navigate back to a desktop again, we would type CD desktop. Or also remember that we have option of using arrow key up or down where we can look for previous commands. So if I'll just press arrow key up, notice this will give me the last command, which of course is navigating back to the parent. However, if I press it one more time, this will spit back the CD desktop. So of course I can run the command again by pressing return. And of course I'm in a desktop. Now, once I'm in the desktop, if I'll run LS, you'll notice that technically it doesn't return anything because of course my desktop is empty. However, there's going to be maybe some cases once in a while where you would want to also check for hidden folders. And most likely in our course, that is going to have to do with Git. And in that case, you can run with LS and then hyphen and then A. So this will also show you hidden folders. Now that is a little bit out of the scope of the course. So don't worry about it too much. We're not going to utilize it that often, but once in a while, you maybe would want to just double check whether there is a git as far as your folder structure. Now, once that is done, why don't we create a new directory? And in order to do that, we would need to run mkdir. So here we can clear the console. And by the way, for that, we have a command of clear. So we can clear the console. And now in the desktop, I'm going to make a new directory. And I'm just going to call this testing. So I'm going to go with MKDIR and then testing. And there it is. Now, of course, I have my testing folder. Now, in order to navigate to that directory, again, either I would need to run CD and then testing, or there's also another option where I can just type CD, then space, and then just grab this particular folder. So just drag and drop over here. And now notice how it right away tells me that. I would navigate to users, then Smilga, then desktop, and then testing. So once I press over here, notice how I'm nicely sitting in the testing folder. And what else we have? We have CD, CD dot dot. So that's going to navigate again to a parent and clearing the console, which already we have covered. So now let's test it out how we can navigate outside, of course, again, where we go with CD and then dot dot. And again, we're sitting in the desktop. 
So those would be the basic commands of the terminal. And hopefully you don't feel as scared as you did in the beginning of the video. When we install node, we also automatically install npm or node package manager. The reason why it's so useful is because npm allows us to save time, automate our tasks and avoid reinventing the wheel. We do that by installing packages or dependencies. Packages can be as simple as utility functions and as complex as full blown frameworks and everything else, of course, in between. Keep in mind that the package we are going to use later, the create react app already does all the heavy lifting for us under the hood. So this video is just to give you a general overview. And for the most part, you'll be just hitting npm start on a keyboard for the remainder of the course, a command that we'll cover a bit later in the course. As far as general npm commands, we have npm in it that is going to create package JSON. So essentially the manifest file for our project. We're also will see list of dependencies. Then we can install package by running npm install and then package name. And then we would need to run dash dash save. Now, as far as dash dash save in the latest versions of node, you already don't have to run that, meaning this would just save it to a list of dependencies. Or like I said, in the latest versions of node, you don't have to do that anymore. Now, what I've noticed, though, that once in a while, students ask the question and they share the project. And then I can see that they have been using older version and they have not been saving the dependencies. So in order for me to run their project, I still need to install those dependencies. So as a safeguard, I would suggest still always using dash 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 save just in case. I don't know. Maybe your node version is out of date. Now that is going to install that package locally, meaning in the project. Then we also have the npm install package name dash global. Now that is going to install the package globally and we can access it anywhere. However, it comes with a gotcha where when you're doing the global install, most likely you'll be asked for permission. And of course, don't worry, I'll show you that with our example. And lastly, we also have an option of installing package only while we're developing. And the flag would be dash dash save and then dash dev. Now, what would be the most common one? I don't know, maybe testing. So essentially, we only need that package while we're developing. Then, of course, we're just using it. And then once we ship to production, we don't need that package anymore. So remember that testing folder that we created. So now let's try some things out. What I'm going to do is first, of course, zoom in in my terminal. Then, of course, I would want to navigate there. So I think the fastest way will be just drag and drop. Now, of course, I'm in my testing. And remember, first, we would want to create that manifest file. Again, something that create react app the package we're going to use does already for us. So this is just to showcase the general setup. And in order to get our manifest file, we'll just run npm in it. Now, there's a bunch of questions there. So if you would want to admit that you can just go with dash y, or in my case, I'm going to go with npm in it. And then it creates a question. So in this case, what would be the package name? I'm going to call this app version. And as you can see, I can skip them if I would want to. Since again, this is just to showcase how it's going to look like. Of course, I'm just going to skip them by pressing enter. And then this shows what I'm going to currently have in the package JSON. So of course, I'm going to say, yeah, that that looks OK. So I'll say yes. And now if I check out my testing, I'll have the package JSON. So let me open my text editor here. And I'll just drag and drop the testing. Just so you can see that, of course, I have my package JSON. And there it is. So app name, the version description, what is going to be the entrance file. So the main file. And in this case, it is index.js. That is by default. Of course, we don't have the index.js. And then we have scripts and author. Now, scripts is an interesting one because with create react app, like I was saying, 
the script that you'll use most is going to be npm start. So essentially, these are just commands that you can run. Now, let me showcase how we would install a package. And we can do it directly from the text editor, or we can do it from the terminal. Please keep in mind that as long as we're sitting in the same folder, it doesn't matter. And that's one of the reasons why I like Visual Studio Code. It comes, it comes with integrated terminal. Now, how we can access integrated terminal in Visual Studio Code, we go with Control and tilde. And notice here, all the way in the bottom, I have the terminal. And what's really cool that notice I'll right away gonna be in the folder. So it's not like I would specifically need to navigate there, just like I would do in a terminal. In this case, when I'm opening up the integrated terminal from the Visual Studio Code, I'm right away at my project. So I'm in a testing. And of course, I would want to install first dependency. And I'll just randomly install Bootstrap. So we go with npm install, and then whatever is the package name. So I know that it is Bootstrap. And then, like I said, just in case, I'll run dash dash save. And what you'll notice is that, of course, we're installing dependencies. And the moment I do it, notice here how I have the property and the value right now is Bootstrap. So now I installed this dependency. And of course, I can use it locally. Now, what you'll also notice is that we have node modules. This is going to be a folder where we'll have a list of our dependencies. Now, at the moment, we have Bootstrap. But then again, once we start using Create React App, you'll see that, of course, since it is a bigger package, it uses way more dependencies. So our node modules folder is going to be way bigger. Now, as a side note, when you're sharing this, for example, when you're adding this to a GitHub, your folder, you usually just add package JSON. So essentially, you wouldn't share no modules because usually that is a massive, massive folder. So much more easier way is just adding everything to Git, but not the node modules. So essentially just a package JSON. And then once you clone or fork or download the folder, you can do is just run npm install, which installs all dependencies. Now, don't worry. Of course, we'll cover that a little bit later in the course because there are some projects that I already set up for you. So the only thing you'll need to do is just follow the link to the repo, get it. And then once you get the link, meaning once you clone it, fork it, or download it, then you just need to run npm install. So this would be for the local package, where essentially once I've installed Bootstrap, now I can start using it. However, remember, I also said that we can use global packages, correct? Now, I can install global package from the integrated terminal, or I can do it again from the terminal. That's up to you. The difference is that if you install package globally, you can use it anywhere in your machine, meaning you can use it on the desktop, you can use it in the project or whatever. Now, again, the gotcha with a global install is that it is going to be asking for permissions. So in this case, you know what? I'm going to go to terminal just to showcase that, for example, I would be installing a Gatsby CLI from the root. Remember, this was a root folder and the name was npm install. And then I go with Gatsby CLI and then I need to go with dash G. Again, you don't need to run this command. This is just to showcase that if you won't have permissions, which at the moment I don't, since I'm not running sudo, then of course, I'm going to get a big fat error. And there it is. Of course, like I was saying, we get a bunch of errors. So again, in order to omit that, we would need to add sudo. So I could go back to my previous command and I would just add sudo over here. And then once you run it, of course, it's going to ask for your password. So you would need to add your password. And then once you do, of course, you just press enter. And then the install is going to be successful. So that's the general overview of NPM, how we would install locally and how it set up globally. Again, when it comes to create React app, it does all the heavy lifting already for us under the hood. So the only thing we'll really need to care about is just checking out the scripts. 
So essentially the script commands that we have. So that way we'll know how to set up the dev server. And also once in a while, of course, we will install some package locally to our project, whether that is bootstrap, whether that is react icons or something along those lines. Well, there are many ways how to set up react application by far the easiest and fastest would be using create react app tool, which is built by Facebook developers. And it allows us to just focus on building our apps instead of spending our precious time on tinkering with configuration and build tools. If you're interested in finding out more about the package, just type the name in the search engine and look for the link in the repo. I would like to reemphasize though, technically, you don't need to use create react app to work with react, you can build the whole setup yourself. But trust me when I say that, in the long run, create a react app will save you a bunch of time, as well as some sanity. Because while tinkering with webpack sounds a lot of fun in the beginning, in reality, it can get nutty, pretty, pretty fast. Under the hood, Create React app uses Babel and Webpack. And while we're still on the subject, let me just quickly cover them as well. So a Babel is a JavaScript transpiler that converts the newest JavaScript into the good old JavaScript. So we can use all the newest features of the JavaScript language. So think things like spread operator, the structuring, and all the other goodies that come with ES6. And behind the scenes, Babel will turn it into ES5, which in turn will make sure that our app runs smoothly in the older browsers as well. So essentially, we can have our cake and eat it too. Well, Webpack does a lot of other things as well. Essentially, Webpack works as a module bundler. The main features of Webpack would be bundling our resources, watching for changes, and running Babel Transpiler. In order to bootstrap a fresh instance of React App, they suggest using NPX. So essentially, we won't need to install their CLI tool on our machine, which is a setup they had before. And as a side note, that's why our NPM version needs to be at least 5.2, since we do want to use NPX. So while we're still on the subject, their previous setup was that we had to install the CLI tool, the Create React app globally, or now they switch to NPX. And they're also suggesting that if you have already installed the Create React globally, so for example, maybe you are watching some other tutorial and you already installed Create React app globally, they suggest that you uninstall it. So you would need to run this command, the npm uninstall, and then g create react app to uninstall the CLI tool. Because that way, it ensures that npx uses always the latest version. Now I already did that. So I'm good to go. And we're only looking for this command. Now you can grab the whole thing. That just means that your app will be called my app. But in my case, I'll just copy npx create react app. So I'm going to navigate back. And by the way, if you want to check what is your npm version, same as with node, we just run npm, and then dash dash version. And of course, I can see that I have 6.12. Now at this point, I would want to navigate to a desktop like so, and then copy and paste my command. And once I have command in place, I just need to come up with a name of my folder. And in my case, I'm going to go with tutorial. And you'll see how the create react app starts bootstrapping your react application. Now it does take a little bit of time. So I will stop the video. And I'll resume it once all the dependencies are in place. And once create react app is done, installing all the dependencies and essentially setting up a ready to go react application, we can see in the terminal that we have quite a few commands that we can use. Now again, as we're progressing with tutorial, don't worry, we will cover other ones as well. But for the time being, 
the one that we really need is the npm start, which starts the development server. Now, let me tell you right away that there are two places where you can run the commands. So essentially, start up the dev server or build the production ready application, or for example, install the dependency. I don't know, extra dependency, for example, react icon. And these two places are following where I can run all my commands in a terminal. However, I just need to make sure that of course, I'm located in my folder. So for example, in this case, I would need to navigate to tutorial. And then I can run, for example, command of npm start. And the other place is going to be our text error. Now I'm going to run my commands in text error in the integrated terminal. The reason why I'm showing you this is that once in a while, some students who use Windows have complained that unfortunately, when they run their commands in the integrated terminal in the Visual Studio Code, they're getting some issues. So just keep in mind, you don't have to run your commands in integrated terminal. Now, of course, I will do that throughout the course, because I'm not having any issues once I do that. However, if you do, just remember that you can always set them up in your terminal as well. So in my case, I'm going to drag and drop my application. And then I'll right away set up side by side a browser, because that's just how I prefer while I'm developing. So this is going to be a fresh instance of the browser. And this is going to be our project. Now, don't worry, in the next video, we'll take a closer look of what is our folder structure, and what essentially we can find in the fresh instance of create react app. However, for now, I would just want to spin up my dev server. So like I said, I would open up the integrated terminal with control and tilde. And then we run npm, and then start. And then on localhost 3000, we're going to get a brand new instance of our application. So essentially, we'll see what create react created for us. Now, you see that we have some logo, we have some text. And like I said, in the next video, we'll take a closer look at the folder structure. But for the time being, I would just want to showcase that the way the dev server works is each and every time we'll make some change. If there is no error, we'll automatically get the latest version of our app right away in the browser. So for example, if I change the text in the app, and again, you don't have to do that, but I'll change the text from the paragraph to a hello world. So whatever I have over here, I'll just change to hello world. And you'll see the moment I save, I right away get the latest version of my app in a browser. So create react app does this cool thing of hot reloading, where essentially every time we'll make some changes, unless we have some bugs, meaning some errors, then it right away restarts the application for us. And before we go any further, let me just give you a brief overview of the folder structure in create react app. And I must warn you that throughout the video, I'll probably zoom in and zoom out quite a few times. So up on the top, we have a node modules. So of course, this is where we have all our dependencies. So if you remember previously, when we installed bootstrap, we essentially had only one folder. Now, of course, since the dependencies that our project has, have their own dependencies, well, our node modules folder, of course, is way, way bigger. And of course, this is why when we'll be setting up our source control, we will ignore this folder. Now, before we go any further, I just want to show you a cool thing, how the package JSON works together with node modules. Please keep in mind that is not unique to create react app. But I think it's going to be a very useful info. So for example, if I navigate to package JSON, we already know that of course, this is going to be our manifest file. And in here, as you can see, these are the dependencies that we are using in our project. And then of course, in order to start up our application, we would need to run npm start. Now, what if I 
delete the node modules. What if I say, you know what? I don't need this particular folder. Okay, I delete it. Now, in order to stop the dev server, the command that you're looking for is control and C. So that is going to stop the dev server. And now, of course, once I refresh, notice I'm going to get a big fat error. Now, I'll try to run npm start, but of course, I should get a error. Why? Well, because I don't have my dependencies anymore. So if I run npm start, I will, of course, get my big fat error. Now, do you think everything is lost? And of course, the answer is no. What we would need to do is run npm install. So this, of course, will just check that in the package JSON, we have a list of our dependencies, and it will just install for us. And then the moment we run npm install, this will install all our dependencies. And again, we're good to go. And this is exactly what I was saying in the previous videos, where once we get our project from the GitHub, whether we clone it, whether we uh, fork it, whether we are downloading, then of course, we just need to run npm install, because list of our dependencies are going to be there. So that's why, of course, we don't need to share our project, meaning we don't need to share the massive node modules folder. So in this case, what we could do is just run npm start, and everything will run exactly like we expect. Because of course, now, of course, we installed all our dependencies back. Now, after that, we have the public folder, where we'll find index HTML. Now, this is the index HTML file that is displayed over here. So I can tell you right away that all of our work will do in a source, but there are some few useful things that we can do in the index HTML. For example, we could change the title, correct? So at the moment, I have React app, but I could go with React and then tutorial. And don't be scared of this file is just like a regular HTML file that we have worked already before. And if you're looking at the syntax, it also resembles everything that we have seen already in the HTML files. Now, what other useful things that we can do in the index HTML? Well, we can add Google fonts, because like I just said, the syntax would be exactly the same like we have been using already in the index HTML, or the font awesome icons or things of that nature. And then more importantly, we have over here, this div with an ID of a root. And I know it sounds mind boggling at the moment. But this is where our whole JavaScript application eventually is going to live. I know it sounds really mind boggling at the moment. But don't worry, of course, I will swing back to root when we cover some basics of the react setup. So that is going to be index HTML in our public. Then we have a folder that we currently don't see. And that is the build one. Remember, in the package JSON, we had the command of start. So that of course, starts the dev server. So now let me stop it. But we also have a build. And this command essentially sets up a production ready build. So let me run it. And then of course, I'll show you. So npm run build. So we run this command. And then of course, we'll see the build folder as well. Now it's going to be very hard to tell anything in that folder, meaning if I'll open up index HTML, you'll notice that everything has been nicely minified. And essentially, what you can do with this folder, is just static assets. So for example, on Netlify, you can just use for drag and drop option. Now Netlify is, of course, the hosting provider that we will use throughout this tutorial. But of course, you can do it in any other place where you can just grab the static assets. That should do it for the build folder. And up next, we have the source folder, where we'll do most of our work. And that's why we won't cover it in detail in this video. As far as the files, we have the app CSS, where eventually there's going to be a CSS for our application. We have app JS, where eventually all our components will meet. However, keep in mind that the name is optional. You can call this shake and bake. It doesn't really matter. It's just the convention is to call this app JS. And then we have the file for the testing, which we don't care about. We have index CSS, 
And of course, in here again, we have more CSS for our application. We have index.js where we will start working starting from the next video. Although technically in the next video, we will just wipe out all the boilerplate. So I guess more properly would be say in the video after that, we'll start working in the index.js. And even though there is a lot of things already here, most importantly, what I would want you to notice is that we are targeting that root div. Remember, I showed you in the index HTML. I said that, of course, this is where all our application is going to live. So essentially, we have index.js. We're importing the app. So app, of course, is going to be a file where all our components eventually will meet and we'll place our app in the root, in the div with an ID of root. That's why I said that even though it looks a little bit mind boggling, but all our application will live in that one div with an ID of root. Of course, then we have a logo self explanatory. That is the logo that we see all right now. And then, of course, the service worker as well as setup desk, which we won't cover in this particular course. While we're still on a subject, we have get ignored. And like I said, this is a file that just specifies which files will be ignored by our source control. And of course, up on the top, you can see the node modules, which like I mentioned previously, will be ignored because there's no point of adding them as well as the build. So build will also be ignored because either you'll do your own drag and drop. That's one of the options that you can do as far as your production build, or you'll use some kind of continuous deployment where essentially the provider, the hosting provider, does the build process for you. And then, of course, at the end, like I said, there is a package JSON where we have the manifest of our project. Most importantly, we care about the dependencies as well as the commands that we can run, start and build. And all the way at the bottom, we have readme, which is a markdown file that just contains information about our project. That should do it for the folder structure. Next video, we'll clean up some of the boilerplate. And then finally, we'll start working on our first React component. Well, Create React App is a awesome tool. One of the issues that I have, especially as we just start exploring the React world, is the fact that there's a bunch of boilerplate. And since, in my opinion, it will help us the most if we'll start everything from scratch, I would want you to do something barbaric, and that is to delete pretty much all the files in the source apart from index.js. So I would want you to select app CSS, app JS, also the app test JS, the index CSS, logo SVG, service worker, and setup test. So pretty much all the files apart from index.js, and I would want you to delete them. Yes, we would want to remove all these files. So at the moment, we just have the index.js. And index.js, I also would want to wipe it clean. So just delete all the contents that we currently have in the index.js. Now, of course, when you run npm start, don't be surprised that there will be a big fat error. Don't worry. Once we create our first component, then of course, this error will be fixed. But for the time being, we just want to remove all this unnecessary boilerplate that we had in a source folder. So that should be a start where we have a clean screen. And now, of course, we can create our first React component. Awesome. Once we have removed all the boilerplate, let's kick things into gear and start our React land adventure. And the first thing I want to do is to create our first component. Normally, in order to do that, we will need only two things, a import from React dependency and a function. However, keep in mind that since index.js is our JavaScript entry point, we'll need to add some additional code. But normally, it's just React and a function. So let's start working on that. Now I will toggle my sidebar just so we have a little bit more real estate. And I'm doing that with a command of command and B. Notice here, 
Now I'm toggling the sidebar in Visual Studio Code. And like I said, we would need to import React from our React dependency. Now, please keep in mind that the code that I'm writing, and I'm starting with import, and I'm looking for React, and then from React. So this code is not React specific. Essentially, this is something called ES6 modules, where essentially we can get a piece of functionality into our file. And if you have been taking my JavaScript course, of course, you're already familiar. However, if you haven't, don't worry. Later in the course, we'll spend entire video on taking a look at the syntax and what will be the purpose of using ES6 modules. Just keep in mind, this is just JavaScript. This is nothing specific to React. Now, since React is our main dependency for a project, I don't need to go with specific path. But later, you'll see that when we're setting up our own files, you'll have to specifically say, well, which file are you looking for? Again, we don't have our files. So normally, if it's just a dependency that is for the whole project, meaning it is in the node modules, then you simply go with whatever is the name. So I'm importing React from React. And now I would want to set up my function because I would want to create my component. Now, there is a gotcha, meaning I can create whatever function I would want whether that is a arrow function or whether that is going to be good old function with a function keyword. However, as far as the name for React to know that this function is special and that this function is a component, you must capitalize the name. So again, we can create a function however we would like, function keyword or arrow function. And throughout the course, I will switch just so you can see that, of course, it will work regardless. But what we need to do in both cases, regardless which option you choose, is to capitalize the name. So for example, if I'm creating a component by the name of greeting, I must start with a capital G. And then I'm going to go with name. Then we have the parameters, which eventually we'll use, but for the time being, we'll just leave them empty. So we go with parentheses. And then we have curly braces. So as you can see, traditional JavaScript syntax. We just created a function. Now, one gotcha was the fact that we needed to capitalize the first letter. So that way, JavaScript knows, or I'm sorry, React knows that this is special. So this is a component. And then from React component, we would want to return HTML. Now, technically, it is not called HTML. However, you'll see that in a lot of blog posts and videos and all of that. Technically, it is called JSX. And don't worry, we'll cover JSX in more detail. For now, I would just want to have something on a screen. So from this function, we must, 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 must return again. I will call this HTML and you'll see that as HTML in a bunch of places. Or keep in mind that it is officially called JSX. So we go with our return and then we simply come up with a heading for it. So that's the HTML that will be eventually displayed on screen. So I go with my heading four, and here I'll write, this is John, and this is my first component. Awesome. Now, once I've created, as you can see, even though I saved, well, nothing is happening. But there's no reason to worry, because remember, I said index.js is a JavaScript entry point which means that, yes, normally, this is the only thing you'll need to set up the component, the import, as well as the function, which essentially is your component. However, since index.js is an entry point, we'll need to add some additional code. And what we're trying to do, we're trying to add this functionality at the moment, or whatever functionality you'll have into our index HTML. Remember, I said there was a div with an ID of root. So now what I would want is take whatever functionality I have, which in my case is just this one component, and somehow, some way injected into my div with an ID of root. Now, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to go with import, then react DOM, and that is coming from other dependency. So there are multiple dependencies. You can clearly see them in package.json. And one of the other 
dependencies was react dom so we import this from react dom and then react dom has the render method so we go with react dom then dot and then we type here render now render method is looking for two things it is looking for what we're going to render which of course in our case is going to be greeting and the second thing well where we would want to render it and of course that's why i showed you the root so now first let's pass the greeting so i'm going to go here with a greeting and i'll close it out and i'll talk about why we would need to close the components as well in a second and the second thing so we add comma and then we go with document and then get element by id and now i'm looking for that root and the moment i save it if everything is correct i should see it now let me double check of course what happens right now my dev server is not running so of course that's why i cannot see anything so I'll go with npm start i'll spin up my dev server and now on the screen i should see my heading four and the text will be this is john and this is my first component and of course there it is now it's kind of small so let me zoom in and now i can clearly see that this is john and this is my first component now the gotcha about the closing tags in react is simple where even though your html element might not have a closing tag and as example that could be for example image because you know that for the image you don't have closing tags you still need to self-close it so what i'm trying to say in this greeting i cannot pass it like this so i'm going to get a error so in order to avoid that error either i would need to set up two tags like so where i have the greeting and then i'm closing out the greeting component as well and once i save it notice how everything works or if you don't want to add this empty closing tag or for example in the image tag you already don't have that closing tag then you would still need to add this closing tag inside the opening brackets so that's something you need to keep in mind because with html5 of course we can do that willy-nilly for the image we can include it we can omit it it's up to us but in react you must 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 have the self-closing tag if there is no closing tag and let's go over the setup one more time where if we would want to create a component we need to import react from react we need to set up a function that function will be component so this is our component however in order for react to know that it is going to be a component you need to set this up as a capital case letter so that's how react knows all right so this is not just a regular function this is going to be my component and then from the component we are returning html which officially is called jsx because of course there's some nice goodies that we can do it's not just going to be a simple html and then since this is a entry point so only in this case and essentially i can tell you right away that in most cases it's just going to be in one place in your application so you only have to do it once and by the way if you're using create react app you won't even have to do that but normally you would do that in one place where you inject your javascript into that index html and we do that by importing react dom and then we have a render function and then in that function we pass in two things we pass in whatever we're going to render and then where we're going to render and then since of course in the index html we already have the div with an idea of root that's why we're targeting that div and now of course we have our first component successfully displayed on a screen awesome before we continue exploring react now would be a great time for me to show you which extensions and which settings json setup is going to be really helpful throughout the course so first let me show you the extension that will help us to format the code as i keep on scrolling notice here i have the extension by the name of prettier code formatter 
Now, of course, in my case, I already have installed it. But if you don't have it, you would need to install. And then once you install, you can navigate to a settings. So this is going to be a GUI for sending. So graphical interface. And also later, we'll take a look at the JSON file. But for time being, just check for the prettier or you know what? No, you can just go for format. And then once you look for the format in a graphical interface, you'll find format on paste as well as format on save. So I would suggest checking both of these boxes. And then as a result, as you're typing, Prettier will format the code for you. Now, what am I talking about? For example, if I just keep on adding some spaces in between, and basically I just make it a big fat mess. The moment I save it, notice how Prettier right away nicely formats the code for me. So that would be the first thing. Now, the second thing that I would want to show you is the Emmet. So you're probably aware that when we work with HTML and CSS, we have option of using Emmet, which essentially just speeds up our workflow. And of course, in the Visual Studio Code, that is built in. However, when you work with React, as far as JSX, it won't work right out of the box. Now, what am I first of all talking about? For example, if I would want a heading four, or I don't know, the div with some kind of IDs and classes, which we'll add later, I don't have to start with opening tag and then type heading four or article or whatever HTML element. I can just go with heading four and right away notice how Emmet gives me the suggestion. Again, we can go the same route with article or we can go with section or whatever. Notice how it right away creates for me. Now, of course, it's going to be way more beneficial once we start adding classes, but there are some gotchas about classes in JSX. That's why I'm not going to cover them right now. But essentially, in order to have these suggestions, so essentially, in order for you to have this option, so you don't have to type out everything from the scratch, you need to go to your settings. And once you navigate there, the property you're looking for is this Emmet. And then it is include languages. And then you would want to set up JavaScript and then JavaScript React. So that's the code you'll need. Again, if you just want to copy and paste the code, I would suggest going to a GitHub. Again, my handle is going to be John hyphen Smilga. And then you're looking for VS code setup. So in here, you'll find settings JSON. And then of course, this is the property that you're looking for. So if you set this up as a raw, you can right away just copy and paste this particular value. So that will enable Emmet in your JSX as well. And as I said, don't notice, this is going to be format on paste and format on save. You can also add them manually like so, meaning in the settings JSON, you don't have to do that in a GUI. And then I have some particular things for the prettier. For example, here I set up only the single quotes and my JSX, but that is irrelevant. That is really up to you whether that is your preference as far as the single quotes or double quotes. However, using Emmet will definitely speed up your workflow when you're working in JSX as well. And lastly, I have this awesome, awesome, awesome extension by the name of ES7 React Redux GraphQL React Native Snippets. Now, why this particular extension is so cool, because it saves us on the boilerplate. So for the time being, let me just go back to whatever I had. So I don't have some kind of error. So let me save it here. And let's just create another testing file in the source. So in the source, let's create a new file. And I'll call this testing. Now, don't worry, we won't use it. But just to showcase how the extension is going to work. For example, if I would want to create this new React component, I don't have to type import React and then set up the component. I can simply type my snippet, where if I go with R, A, F, C, and E, it right away will create it as a arrow function, and then it's ready to go. So notice how it right away imported the React, 
right away set up the component and you right away have the return as well. Now, don't be confused by the fact that in this case, it is set up with a lower case. The only reason for that is because we're exporting something that we'll cover later. And then once we import, then we will still need to use it with a uppercase. Okay, so it's not like I was just making this up where this needs to be uppercase. You can clearly test it out. If you'll go with greeting and greeting, you'll see that there is an error. So essentially, you don't see anything on the screen because, of course, you must, 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 must have this component with a capital case. Again, in this case, it's a little bit different because we're exporting and we are not at that point yet. So we'll cover that later. But this extension just gives you a awesome setup where you don't have to keep on typing this boilerplate. Now, of course, the arrow function is not the only component that you can create. You can create components with regular functions. You can create them with classes, which is the older syntax. And if you want to see what kind of options you have for the snippets, just go for the extension. Keep on scrolling and notice you can use IMP for imports, for example. Keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling. These are all the options that you have here. And then I think the regular function was RFC. So this is going to be for the class components. We're going to keep on scrolling. And eventually we should see the regular function component. And there it is. So RFC is going to be just a React component, but with a traditional syntax. So if I go back and I can right away delete everything. And instead of RA, I type RFC. And then again, I'll add right away export. So we're exporting. Notice how we create the same component, or in this case, it is using regular function syntax. So these are the things that I would suggest adding to your project as far as the extensions as well as the settings JSON, because they will improve your workflow tremendously. Now, you know what? By the end of this video, I can just delete the testing JS. We won't need it as well as close my extension. And now, of course, we can go back to React. Now, the one thing, of course, is the fact that I would need to change this back to a greeting. Because remember, when we're setting up React component, when we want to render it, it must be capitalized. Beautiful job. Once we're back from the useful extensions detour, now I would want to make a plunge into our component. So essentially, we know that we will cover imports a little bit later. We know that as far as the render, it is only in one place, essentially where we inject our JavaScript. So now, of course, let's talk about this sucker. And essentially, the official name is going to be stateless functional component. Now, they're also called dumb components because at the moment it doesn't have something called state, something that we'll cover later. And as far as the rules, well, the biggest one would be that we always, always need to return something. For example, if I'll select and if I'll delete, you'll see that there is a big fat error where it says nothing was returned from the render. So you always, always must return something, even if that something is an empty HTML element. So of course, you can save it. And of course, you can see that at least now we don't have the error. Now, I also would want to talk about this JSX, because technically, you don't have to type here this HTML. Now, this HTML is to help you. Okay, I know it sounds weird, because for a lot of people probably seeing that we are returning just HTML might seem a little bit foreign. But just keep in mind that essentially, under the hood, we're still calling functions. Now, don't believe me? Why don't we do this? Why don't we set up here? Hello world. And then I'll create another component with the same name and everything. And I'll set it up using the function calls, just so you can see that under the hood, when we type this heading four, we're still making those function calls. Now, since we cannot have 
two components with the same exact name, and I'm too lazy to come up with new component and then change it over here. I'll just comment this out and let's set up our component one more time. So in here we go with function, and you know what? Why don't we do in this case as a R function? Just so you can see that it's gonna work the same way. So we're gonna go here with a greeting. So that is going to be my arrow function. And then instead of returning HTML, which is to help us to have a little bit easier syntax, what we could do is go with return. And then we're going to go with react, then create element. That is the function. And then this function is looking for three things. What element we would want to return? That's number one. Then props object, which we haven't covered. So don't worry, we'll just pass in the empty object. And then what is going to be the children? So what is going to be rendered inside that element? Now, as far as the element, I think I'm going to go with heading one. And then, like I said, props object haven't covered props yet. So let's just pass empty object. And then last thing is going to be the children. So in here, I'm going to go with hello world. And then once you save, notice everything works, correct? So like I said, we can use the arrow function. That still works. We are returning heading one, and then we're using hello world. Now, one thing that when you're passing in the element here, you need to pass it in the quotation marks. So when we're working with components, then of course, we don't have to do that. But then if we're passing it into the function, we must set it up as quotation marks, because then react knows that, well, this is going to be a HTML element. And then this is going to be the content in our element. Beautiful. Now, the thing is, it's not as easy as it seems, because at the moment you might be, well, this is extremely foreign. I rather use this function setup. Okay, well, let me comment this one out for now. And let me show you what happens if we have some more elements, because normally, probably you'll have more than just one heading for. And what's really cool about JSX, I mean, we can definitely do it. So I can go with div. And then within this div, I'm going to create a heading one with a hello world. So of course, I can see that it works. Now at the moment, of course, there's a div. So technically, it is hard to see, but I can tell you right away that it does exist. But the gotcha here is how would I do that here with create element? So yes, this video might be a little bit annoying where again, I'll comment this out. And then we'll take a look at how we can do that using the function. Well, everything worked really smoothly when we just had a heading one, correct? Everything worked out of the box. But now we need to understand that where we pass in the children, we would need to invoke create element one more time. How is that going to look like? Well, we would go with react because that is our import. Then we go with create element. Then again, what element we would want to set up. So in my case, that is going to be heading one, then props object, again, empty object for now. And then eventually, what is going to be a text? Well, I'm going to go with hell world. So you can probably already see, and I'm sorry, you know what, this was heading one, and it should have been a div, my apologies. And now you can see that it can get messy really, really fast. Because again, we're just talking about right now a div that has the heading one. That's it. But keep in mind that, of course, your normal structure for the component is going to be way more messier. That's why I'll leave this for your reference. So you know what is happening under the hood. Just keep in mind that the reason why you have this HTML syntax is so it is easier for you to set up your return in your component. Because I don't know about you. But even though it might look a little bit foreign where we're returning straight up HTML from the function, at the end of the day, what we're setting up looks way more readable than starting with these endless, endless function calls. Beautiful. In a previous video, we covered that as far as the return from the component is a JSX. And in this video, I would like to continue because in a previous video, we learned that it is kind of like HTML, but not really. 
So there are some specific roles, so we might as well cover them right now. And we'll start with a first one where we always, always need to return a single element. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, inside the element of that we're returning, we can get extremely, extremely creative. Like I said, you can return the whole website. For example, I could write heading three. Hello, people in here. And then after the heading three, I'm going to go with on our list and then list item. And then here, let's place a link. And I'll just add a hashtag. So it's not going to go anywhere. And then we'll write another hello world. So I can save it. And I can clearly see that there are no issues. Everything is working like peaches. Now, the one thing we cannot do is notice where we have this div. I cannot add adjacent element. Now that could be any element, but of course, just because it's going to be simpler, I'll just place a div. And notice even before I save, you'll have this red squiggly line. Well, that just means that something in your project went bananas. So if you save, notice you'll get a error where it says adjacent JSX elements must be wrapped in the enclosing tag. Did you want a JSX fragment? Now I'll talk about JSX fragment in a second. Just keep in mind that we always need to return a single element. Now, what would be the solution in this case? Well, I could wrap everything here in a div, correct? So I'll place my parent div. And once we save, we're not going to get any error. Now, please keep in mind one thing, though, that at the end of the day, we're still rendering the HTML. And HTML, we have something called semantics, where if we just return everything as div, 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 so essentially we're just creating a div soup, that is not the best practice. So first, I would encourage you to follow the semantics. For example, if this is something as a section, then we return a section instead of a div. Then, for example, if this would be an article, we return the article. Now, of course, keep in mind, it doesn't mean that instead of the list item, you're going to return the article. Just as a common sense, don't place everything as div, div, div. Now, there's no rule against it, but a better practice is to follow the HTML semantics. And one more thing, remember this little error, how it said the fragment. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. But for example, if I would have the situation, by the way, let me go back to these div div divs. If I wouldn't want to wrap everything in div, since in that way, I'm creating div soup. In React, we also have something called React fragment. How does that look like? Well, instead of enclosing everything in a div, I'm going to enclose this into a React fragment. So I'm going to go with dot, and then we are typing fragment. And you'll notice that this won't create a div in your HTML, so in your final application, but also you'll have no error. And a shortcut essentially would be just typing the angle brackets and then the closing ones. Again, we're skipping a little bit of head. Don't worry, we will talk about fragment a little bit later on. But just keep in mind that either you have an option of using proper HTML semantics, or you can use a fragment. Now, in this case, I'm going to remove the div that was causing the problems. And I'll remove the fragments as well. And once I save it, everything works nicely. Then we need to talk about the attributes in the HTML. Because again, we're returning JSX. And for example, when we work with JavaScript, we can have these inline event listeners. For example, I could type here on click. Now, please keep in mind, I'm adding this to a div. Normally, probably you would add this to a button, but that doesn't change the setup. Where essentially in React, you're not going to write like this. You're not going to say on click. Notice how since this is JavaScript, we must capitalize it. So what I'm saying here is on click. Now, I'm not going to talk about the events right now. I'm just telling you that each and every attribute that will need a capitalization, you must add it. Otherwise, there's going to be an error. So the same will work with a class. 
where with ES six class is already a keyword because we know that we can create classes. So on a div, if we have the attribute of class in JSX, we cannot write class. So this will spit back error. Okay. Now, of course, the error at the moment is the fact that we cannot see anything, but in general, you must use class name. So that is the proper name. Now we'll talk about CSS a little bit later. But just remember, every time you talk about HTML attributes, if you'll need to use the camel cache, you have to do that. Otherwise, it won't work. And then also remember how I talked about how we need to close out the elements, even the ones that don't have the closing tag, and even the ones that in HTML5 you can write without the closing tag. Well, in React, that's not going to fly. So, for example, right after the list item, I'm going to go with image and notice how the image right away creates it for me with a closing tag. And if I'll omit this and if I'll save again, I'm going to get the error. And it clearly tells me expected corresponding JSX closing tag for the IMG. And once I add, of course, everything is going to work beautifully. Once I save, there is there's no error. So the same will work for the input, for example, I go with input text. Again, if I'll omit this closing tag, again, I'm going to have the error. And the last thing that I would want to mention in this video are these parentheses. Because as you start working with JSX, you'll notice that once in a while, they will be added by the prettier. And once in a while, prettier will just omit them. So what are the rules? Now, technically, you don't have to use the parentheses, but I can tell you right away that your life will be a little bit easier if you do. So let me show you what I mean. For example, here I have the return and I'm just going to go with heading one and I'm going to say, hello world. Life is awesome. However, if, for example, you will move your whole thing over here, notice how this one got grayed out and essentially now once you save it you'll have this semicolon so technically you can omit the parentheses but then you always always need to make sure that your opening tag is in the same line as your turn otherwise it will add that semicolon and then you will get this error so this just saves you from running around like a headless chicken and looking for the error where the error does not exist. However, if you add those parentheses, it will be fixed right away for you. Again, prettier a lot of times will just add them or will remove them. So don't stress about that. But I'm just telling you the rule that if you add these parentheses, then you don't have to worry about placing this div, meaning the opening tag in the same line. Here, I can simply move it to the next line. And again, I can go with heading one and then hello world. And you'll see that there are no issues. Okay, that's something that I would want you to keep in mind. Again, we must, 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 must always return a single element. Then it is beneficial if we pay attention to a HTML semantics or we can simply use the React fragment. Then as far as the attributes, we're using the camel case because at the end of the day this is javascript then the class is already keyword so we must use a class name and we'll talk about the css in detail a little bit later on as well as we would want to close out every single element even the ones that are not technically required by html5 and then lastly it is beneficial to use these parentheses because you just don't need to worry about setting up your opening tag in the same line as the return. Not bad, not bad. We covered JSX rules. So now let's talk about whether we can nest components. And the short answer is yes. Also, let's take a look at the React tools. Because remember, when we install them, I said probably won't make much sense, but now it will, since now we have already a general understanding how the components work. And first, let's start by creating the nested component structure. Like I said before, if you want, you can place your whole app in one component. However, it somewhat defeats the purpose 
of why you would want to use react in the first place. Because the idea is that you can split up your application in nice separate chunks of functionality. Now, in our case, of course, we're just setting up simple HTML. So it's not going to look as useful. But in general, it's going to give us a good idea how and why we want to do that. For example, I have the div. And I'm going to have a heading to with a text of John Doe, John Doe. And then I'm going to have a paragraph with the text of this is my message. And now let's think about it. So I have the greeting component. I have the heading two and I have the paragraph. Why don't I set up two separate components, one that just deals with heading two and the other one that just deals with a paragraph. And just to spice things up, I'm going to use arrow functions. And in one case, I'm going to use a implicit return. And in another case, it's going to be a explicit return, just so we can see that it is going to work regardless. So in this case, I'm going to go with cons. Now we do need to come up with a name. So I'm going to go with a person. And this is going to be my implicit return. So for those of you who are familiar with arrow functions, of course, I can add here curly braces. So of course, then I would need to set up explicit return, which we'll do in the next component. Or I can simply say that whatever I'll type, well, that is what I'm going to be returning. So in this case, what I would like to return? Well, I would want to return John Doe, right? So either you can write it from the scratch, or in this case, I'll just copy and paste. And now, of course, once I render, well, I only have this is my message, because now this value is in the person. So how can I render whatever I'm returning from this component? Well, simple. In the greeting, instead of HTML element, I'm going to go with my React component. What is the name of the component? That is person. Again, remember, we do need to self-close it. And the moment we save it, I have John again. So of course, now we can put two and two together that I can do the same thing with the paragraph. Again, the only difference is going to be that I would want to set up explicit return just so we can see the difference. So let's call this message. And again, we have our function. And in here, we'll just write return. And then what I would like to return, of course, the paragraph. So grab the paragraph. And this is what we were returning from our message function. And now, of course, let's just set up a message right after the person. So once I save, I have both of them. But notice how we're nicely splitting up our application into separate chunks. And that is really, really cool because we can use them later as Lego blocks to build our application. And as a side note, this is a somewhat traditional way of how to set up a React application where, of course, we'll use the exports and imports and everything of that nature. However, we will set up this one component. In most cases, the general convention is calling this app. Then in that app, there are going to be either one, two, three, four, or 55,000 components that will meet. Please keep in mind that you can have more components in those specific components. So for example, in the person, I could render even more components. However, there's going to be this app where your components will meet. And then you will import into index.js that particular component, again, shake and bake app or whatever you have decided to name it, and then you will render it. So this is going to be pretty typical setup. So that's how we can nest components inside other React components. And now let's also take a look at the React developer tools. So I'm going to make my right screen bigger. And then I'll open up my developer tools. And we're looking for the components. So of course, we installed already React developer tools. That is out of the way. And then we're looking for the components. And now you'll notice something interesting, where this is going to be our root component. So at the moment, we call this greeting. And then of course, inside the greeting, I have a person and a message. Again, we haven't covered props. So 
none of that makes sense. However, we can clearly see that this is going to be our component structure. And as our apps and examples are going to get more complicated, of course, we will still be able to see what in a world we're actually rendering. Amazing work so far. And I think we have acquired enough knowledge to create a simple Amazon best selling book list. Now, what am I talking about? If we navigate to search engine, just type Amazon best selling books. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to buy anything, but we will try to recreate at least some parts of it using React. Now, you can pick any book you would like, but I'm going to go with this one because this one is by far the most favorite book of my daughter. And I have probably read this. I don't know. I want to say a thousand times, but I don't think that's even close to a real number. So here, what are we looking for? We're going to go back to our application and we'll just give it a more meaningful name. Keep in mind, you can call this greeting, but I'm going to go with a book list. Let's say book list, since eventually there will be a list of books. Then we're going to go with book list as well. And then I'll do a little bit of spring cleaning where for the time being, I'll say that it is going to be a section. And here, let's write this is a book list. Now, of course, there's nothing there right now. And where we have the person and message. Well, eventually it's going to be two different components. So I'll just remove them. And once we save it, of course, we have this. This is a book list. So now, of course, I would want to create four components. Now, please keep in mind, technically, I could just set up one where I have the book. And in the book, I could have the image, I could have the title, as well as the author. Now, I'll purposely split this up into three components, meaning there's going to be book component. And then in there, there's going to be three separate components, one for image, one for title, and one for author just to showcase how we would nest those components even more. And then later we will refactor it back to one book. And this is just to showcase that it is up to you how you want to structure your application. If you want to create everything as a component, you can definitely do it. Or you can just place everything in one book component. So where we have the book list, right after that, I'm going to create another component. Now, in this case, though, I'm going to use arrow function. Again, you can use regular function if you want, but I'm going to go with arrow function. We have our parameters, we have implicit return. And then as far as return, I would want to return the article. So another HTML element. And in there are going to be three separate components. For the time being, I'll just say this is a book. Okay, we save that. And then where we have the book list, now what we could do is just get rid of this generic text and say that I'm looking for the book. So once I save it, I have this is a book. Now what's really, 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 really cool about React is that I can add multiple instances of that book. So if I'll start just copying and pasting the same instance of the book, notice how here I'm getting these values as well. So what that means is that the moment I'll change something in my book, then of course, it will affect all the instances that I have. So in here, I'll say this is a book. And I'll change this around to this is a car. Now, of course, it's not gonna make sense. But you'll see right away that all my instances in here are changed, which is really, really, really cool. And of course, I can have 5,000 of them, I can one of them, I can have three of them, or whatever. And then later, we'll take a look at how we can render with a different info, because we need to understand that, of course, at the moment, we'll just hard code this one value. But it's already really cool that we can multiply it on a fly, and then change it in one place. Because notice, it's not like I had to hop from one place to another one to change this text. I just set up the component. I copied how many times I wanted. And then once I change something in here, that's it. 
all the instances will be affected. Now I will go back to my one single book. And like I said, it's going to be a little bit of overkill right now, but I will set up three separate components. So in here, I'll call this image. And let's just try implicit return, because why not? So we'll return image. And in order to get that image, just click on it. And you're looking for the copy image address. That's the one you need. And then place it here in the source. Now, as far as the alternative, I'm not going to worry about it. And then where we have the book, instead of this is a car, which totally doesn't make sense. Now I'm just looking for this image. So like I said, even though this is a component, I can nest even more components. So I have a book that is rendered in a book list. However, in a book, there's going to be three separate components. Let's save it. And there it is. Now, of course, I have my image. Now what's next? Well, now what I would want is to grab a title as well as the author. And again, it's going to be a little bit of overkill, but we'll create two more components. So let's call this author. And of course, we would need to set up our return. Again, you want implicit, you can set up implicit. If you want explicit, you can set up explicit. I think I'm going to go with the implicit where I'm going to go with heading one. And by the way, I need to add this fat arrow function. And then as far as the value, let's just, or you know what, didn't copy. So let me grab this one. And by the way, I think I was going for the author. So my apologies. I think I'm going to have to rename this. It's not going to be author. It's going to be a title. My bad. So this is my title. And then right after this image, I would want to add my title. So that's, of course, my title component. And there it is. Now I have my component. And lastly, of course, let's also add the author. So we're going to go with const and then author again, implicit, explicit, whatever. You can set up a traditional function if you want. And then we're looking for this value. So let me figure out how I can copy that like so. And I don't know, I'm going to place this in heading four, copy and paste. And then, of course, I'll do the same thing over here, where we're going to go with an author. So now, once we set this up, notice I have my book component. In that book component, I have three separate components, one for the image, one for the title, and one for the author. And then where I render my book, if I'll increase it, notice. So now, of course, I'll have these multiple instances. And we already saw. The moment I'll change something around here, it will affect all the instances where I render my book. And in my opinion, it's really, really awesome because as you can see, we can nicely utilize our component structure where we can have as many instances as we would want, but we control them in only one place. And the moment we add those changes, all the instances will be affected. Nice work. We've got our list. Now, granted, there's a bunch of hard coded values, but of course, we'll fix that a little bit later. Now I'd want to focus on the presentation because it looks somewhat okay. But at the end of the day, it could look a little bit less hideous. So essentially, I would want to set up some kind of grid layout with some columns, and maybe a better coloring as well. And in the process, we'll take a look at how we can add CSS to our React project. Now, I also would like to mention that this is going to be the only video where we'll type out the CSS for the remaining of the course, since it is a React course at the end of the day, all the CSS is already prepared, whether that is going to be the examples or projects or whatever. However, in this case, in this video, yes, we will type out CSS properties. Now, if you're not too familiar with CSS, don't worry, just type them along and we will be in good shape. So we've got our project. Now, if I navigate to a new tab, and by the way, I think I failed to mention that if you'd want to see your project, you'd need to navigate to a local host 3000. So essentially, when the dev server spins up the server, the port is localhost and then 3000. That's the one 
that you're looking for. If I open this up, of course, this is what I see. I see a list of books. And like I said, I just want to take a look at how we can add CSS. So we have some minimal grid layout with some columns and maybe a little bit different styling as well. And if I take a look at my project, yeah, of course, I have the react tools, and that is very useful. But of course, I can also inspect the elements, correct. And what I see here is the root, like I said, this is where we place all our app. And then we have a section, since that is my tag, and then I have the article. And this also underscores the point about those divs. It's not like they will disappear. The more divs you place over here, the more harder it's going to be, of course, for you to navigate around your project, because you'll have div, 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 div. So again, I'm returning to that point, but I think it's quite important. And of course, as you can see, as I'm hovering around, these are my items. So we could put two and two together. We have the HTML. Now, how do we usually add CSS? We create some kind of CSS file, correct? So let's navigate back to our project. And we're looking, of course, in the source, and we'll create a new file. We can call it whatever we want, but of course, convention is that if this is the file for index.js, then I might as well call it index CSS. So once I create this file, let me just add some general styling. And then of course, we'll need to figure out how we can attach it, because I can tell you right away, whatever changes we'll write right now won't affect our project, because we haven't connected to. Now what I would want is to set up basic reset, where we've got a margin a zero, then padding zero, padding zero, and then we'll set up a box sizing to be a border box, so box sizing to be border box. And then let's also target the body with some background and the color. So we're looking for the body, then font family. And here I'll go for the system font. So let's try to get the system font. And then also let's add a little bit of gray background. So we go with background. And then we're looking for hashtag F one F five F eight, like so. And then lastly, I would want to add a color for all my text hashtag two, two, two. Okay, that's it. Beautiful. Now, once I've got this, of course, how do we connect it? Well, the same how we were importing our code, meaning functionality from the dependencies, we also would need to import our CSS. Now the gotcha here is following where if it's going to be a JavaScript files that we haven't covered, of course, we'll cover that a little bit later, then we don't need to add the extension. However, if it is a CSS, you need to provide a full path. So if I'm going for CSS, I'm still going for the import, then I need to use the relative path, because this is not my project's dependency anymore. So here I'm looking for a specific file. So I go with a dot and then forward slash. Now what that means, that means that the file is in the same folder. If it's going to be one level up, then we're going to go with two dots. And of course, we'll take a look at that example a little bit later. For now, this is a relative path that just says that this file is in the same folder. So dot and then forward slash. And like I said, if that would be a JavaScript file, would simply would write a file name. So file name like so. However, if this is a CSS file, then we need to go with index and then dot and then CSS. So full extension. Now also, of course, with JavaScript file, we'll probably import something from there. In here, we're just grabbing everything. So I'll save. And we should notice some changes. And of course, we do. Now see how the margin is not there anymore, the padding, also the background changed a little bit. And overall, it looks a little bit more presentable. So that's an awesome start. We know that we can start targeting the elements. And of course, since I know that I have these heading ones, I could simply say something like that color, and then a red and beautiful. And now all my heading ones, of course, are going to be red. Now that's a little bit drastic. So now let's take a look at how we can work with classes. So index JS, remember, I said, class, we cannot use. So if I go with section, 
and then say here simply class. And I don't know, I'll write this as a book list. You'll notice, and I'm going to go to a bigger browser window. It's going to be easier to see. If we take a look at the console, we have warning invalid DOM property class. Did you mean class name? So we always, always need to use a class name. So we go back, we fix it. And now we have a book list again. Please don't worry about the CSS. This is the only time we have to write the CSS. But essentially, I would want to set it up as a grid once we get to, I don't know, 768. So now, of course, I added my class to my section, the book list, just like I would in normal index HTML and CSS project. And then, of course, I need to target it in the CSS, correct? So we go with book list. I'll add a little bit of width. So 90 view width, then we're going to add max width to be 1170 pixels. We're going to add a little bit of margin top bottom five REMs, but I would like to place it in the center. So we'll also add auto and then we will set it right away as grid and we'll add some gap in between. So we'll say gap two REMs. So that just means that for my rows and for the columns, I'll have two REMs as far as the gap. Okay, looks already a little bit better. And now let's set up quickly that three column layout once we get to 768. So we're going to go with media screen. And and in here, we're looking for men with men with and that will be equal to 768 pixels. Awesome. And I'm looking for my book list again. So that's the class that of course added to a section. And I'm looking for grid template columns and we're going to go with repeat and three and then one fraction so essentially once we navigate to a bigger screen there it is we have our three column layout and then of course let's add a little bit more styling here for the book itself now what is a book my book was that article correct again let me go back to my root then in the root i have my list and then I have all these items. So now, of course, I would need to add a class on the article so I can target them. Then we navigate to index.js. Now, where I would need to add this class? Do I add it here where I'm rendering the book or where I'm setting up the book? And of course, the answer is where I'm setting up the book. So we go with article, class name, and that will be equal to a book. So now in the index CSS, right after our media query we go with book we'll add different background so we're going to go with hashtag fff so white then border radius uh i don't know i'm going to go with the one rem i think that should do it and then also i'm going to add a little bit of padding so we're going to go with padding to be one rems and then a two rems like so so that's our padding and then, of course, I could also target the heading one. Now, the reason why I'm showing you the heading one is not because I really want to work on the CSS. It is because in the next video, we'll take a look at another way how we can do styling in React. So let's just target in this time heading one. Now, again, I can target all the heading ones if I want, but a little bit more precise would be going for the book and then heading one. And then I'll just say margin up to be equal to 0 0.5 REMs. And that's it. And now, of course, we add the margin. So that probably is the most straightforward way how to add CSS. However, of course, keep in mind that this works nicely if you have somewhat of a small project. The bigger the project gets, then, of course, you need to start spinning your wheels because still same issues apply as far as for example, a name collision, so you cannot reuse the same name, essentially the same rules add with CSS. So that's usually when, for example, solutions like CSS in JS come into play. And yes, we will cover that a little bit later, since I will use that solution throughout the course, because that's just easier for me to add all the CSS that we'll use. But this is definitely one of the options where we create a index CSS or app CSS, whatever CSS file you would want. And then in there, we add our classes, we add our roles. And then of course, the only thing we need to do is include that file 
in our index.js or app.js or whatever. And once you include it, then of course, if you add these classes, if you add those styles, they will right away affect your project, just like in a normal HTML and CSS project. Well, adding your CSS from the CSS file is definitely an option. We also can do it directly in the JSX. Now, for my example, I will pick my heading four. Just please keep in mind the same rules would apply for heading one or image or article or whatever HTML element we are placing. Now, of course, I'm doing the air quotes right now around the HTML element at the end of the of course, it is a JSX. And the way we do that, we need to add a style attribute on that particular element. So I'm going to look for my heading four, and then I'll type here style. Now in the following videos, we will take a look at what it actually means as far as the JavaScript. But for now, just remember that if you would want to access JavaScript world, in the JSX, you would need to set up here curly braces. Now, why am I setting up these curly braces? Well, because in order to set up values for the style, the gotcha is that you need to have a JavaScript object, meaning object, and then all the properties are going to be as a JavaScript values, like you would have in the object. And you'll see what exactly that means in a second. Now, why am I telling you all this is because once I'm in the JavaScript world here with these curly braces, of course, in order to create an object, I would need to set up another pair of curly braces. And a lot of times for students, this is confusing, where they think that this is somehow a special syntax. In fact, it's not. It only means that if I set up here these curly braces, I'm back in JavaScript land. So for example, I can type whatever I would want as far as JavaScript. Now, of course, that whatever in this case is just an object. Okay, that's why we have these double curly braces. So with the first ones, we go back to JavaScript world. And of course, we will cover the other things that we can do as far as JavaScript in the following videos. But for now, we only want the object. So that's why we have another set of curly braces. So what we could do is of course set up the style and like i said this is javascript now what that means is you cannot write properties like this because you're setting up a javascript object how that would look like well for example if i go with color it's somewhat straightforward where that is my property notice i don't need to capitalize it or nothing like that however as far as my value i cannot simply go with one rem notice it spits back the error because in JavaScript, of course, we have properties and then values. So in this case, all your values must be in the quotation marks. So in here, if I go with hashtag and then six, one, seven, and then I'm going to go D nine, eight, of course, I'll change the color of my heading four. Then I would want to go with font size. And this is the case where I will have to capitalize because again, I cannot write font and then hyphen size. I have to go with font size. And again, the same thing values must be in the quotation marks. So we go with 0 0.75 REMs. So a little bit smaller. And then also let's add a margin to the top. So we're going to go with margin. And then again, we'll set it up to be 0 0.25 REMs. So once we save it, notice how we nicely applied those styles. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind, though, that when we add these styles this way, so directly in the JSX, this is set up as inline. So what that means is that, of course, we know that when we set up something inline, and notice this is what I'm talking about, then, of course, if I'm targeting the same element from the CSS, from my index CSS in this example, of course, rules, whatever I'm applying, are not going to be added. Why? Well, because inline CSS is more powerful than the one that's coming from the CSS. For example, if I would go here and say book, and then what I was using, I think heading four, if I'll try to change the color, so color to red, 
you'll see that that is not possible. That's not gonna work. However, if it's a property that of course, I haven't added, like, for example, letter spacing, and I'll set it equal to five pixels, then of course, it will be applied. So what I'm trying to say is that be careful, when you start adding the CSS here in the GSX, this will right away go in line. And once it goes in line, it is stronger than the CSS that you're adding from your specific CSS file. Now, why am I telling you that? Because of course, later, as you're progressing with react, you will start using some libraries. And a lot of times in those libraries, there are some properties that are already added this way. So when you're targeting from the CSS, it looks like you're not applying those properties, but always, always double check whether the library that you're using hasn't already added those styles in line. And then, of course, you would just need to figure out how you can override that. Okay, so that would be another way how we can add CSS in React. And that also underscores another point that I would want to make. One thing about React is there's always multiple ways how you can do the same thing. So my job is to show you what are the options. And then your job is to decide well, which route I'm going to take. And I would suggest judging that on your experience and on your project, not on whatever the influencer is saying on a Twitter, because at the end of the day, you're going to be one working on a project. So my preference, of course, is at least setting up index CSS. Now, in general, my preference, of course, is using CSS and JS, but that is my preference. That doesn't mean that it is some kind of rule. No, it is just my preference because I find it easier to work in index CSS and then just add classes. If you prefer this type of way, there's nothing stopping you from applying your styles this way. Not bad, not bad. We now know how we can add CSS to our React project. But in a previous video, I mentioned that in order to access JavaScript world in the JSX, we need to add these curly braces. So let me expand on that. So essentially, we're going to take a look at the other options we have as far as adding JavaScript directly in our JSX. Now, before we do anything, though, I would want to do a little bit of spring cleanup. Just because I'm looking at the file, and I think it's getting quite busy. Now, at this point, I will switch from these three separate components to one component big component, and then I'll add all my return in there. Again, that is up to you. If you want to keep everything a separate component, you can definitely do it. My goal was to showcase that no one is stopping you. But in general, my preference is not to go too crazy as far as splitting up. So in here, the only thing that I would want is where I have all the returns. So I'll just place them here. So for example, in this book article, I'm going to have the image, I'm going to have my heading one, and also add a little bit more things in here. Now, in here, of course, I placed it side by side. So right away, I have the error. And then as far as the styling, that's not usually my preference. So I'll just remove it altogether. So I'll remove style, please keep in mind, you always have a reference to the files we have been working on. So here, right after the heading four or heading one, I'll place my heading four. I'll remove all my components that I have. We'll save. And then, of course, I'm going to go back to the CSS that I added in the previous video. So in here, of course, we just need to change it, where if I remember correctly, the color that I had was hashtag. So let me go back hashtag and six one seven, and then D nine eight, then letter spacing, I'm not going to add that. And by the way, I messed it up here. So it's not F, it is six. And then what else font size, I guess was different, right? So font size, and we're looking for 0 0.75 REMs. And also we'll add a little bit of margin to the top so margin top. And we go with 0 0.25 RMs. That's it. Now, of course, we set everything up correctly. So back in the index.js. Now let's take a look at what else can we do 
as far as the JavaScript, because in a previous video, we had a look of how we can add a CSS. But of course, we can do way more than that. Again, in order to go back to a JavaScript world, what do we need to do is to have curly braces. So now I would want to replace this heading one with some kind of variable value. Now I'm going to start here where I'm going to say const and then title. And that is going to be equal to whatever text I have. So I love you to the moon and back. Of course, I'll set this up as a string. So I'll copy and paste. And in here, once I go back to the JavaScript world, how do I access the variables in JavaScript? Well, simply, I just write a title, correct? Because that is the name of my variable. So now, of course, I'm not hard coding this anymore. Because in here, this is sitting in the variable. And if I'll just start adding s's here, of course, you can see that this value also right away changes. And if you want, of course, we can keep this outside as well. Now, are you always going to keep the variables inside the function or outside? Well, that depends. A lot of times you'll be getting this as props, something we haven't covered yet. So it really depends. I'm just showing you the options where you can store those variables for this particular example. And then if I would want to have the author, I'm going to create another one. So there's going to be a variable outside this time, just so you can see that it will still work. So let me grab this value. And then of course, I'm going to have my author like so. Now one rule about setting up JavaScript here in the JSX that it must return a value. So it has to be an expression, it cannot be a statement. So in here, let's create a paragraph. And let's just test it out. So we have here a JavaScript, but I'm going to write a statement. So I'll say let x is equal to six. Now the moment I'll save it, I will have a big fat error, where it's going to point to a let. So essentially, we always need to pass something here that returns the value. So now let me comment this out. And by the way, the way we comment out in JSX, we have curly brace, and then we have forward slash, and then the star. Now, I'm using the shortcut, which is command and then forward slash. But if you want to check it out, how to actually do that as far as your setup, then look for the edit. And then you're looking for this toggle line comment. And as you can see, in my case, it is a command and then forward slash. That's the shortcut that I'm using. Also, as a side note, if you want to check out all the shortcuts that you have, and the reason why I'm showing that because not everyone uses Mac. So of course, some are a little bit different for the windows, just go to Visual Studio Code. Here we'll open up in a new window. And by the way, I'll open up also right away a new browser window. And then once you open up before you drag and drop anything, just look for printable keyboard cheat sheet. And this is where you'll find for your operating system. Now I'm not saying that you need to sit for one month and memorize them. But for example, if you learn one keyboard shortcut today, trust me, it will overall improve your workflow tremendously. So that is a quick side note. And now of course, we're heading back to our project. So that's how we can comment out, we cannot have here a statement. But if we'll set up a expression, everything will work. Now, if I'll try to do the same thing, for example, with a paragraph, and in here, I'll pass six plus six. Now, of course, I'm returning a value. And as a result, I'm going to have this 12. So that's how we can work with JavaScript in the JSX. So we set up here curly braces, that means we're going back to a JavaScript land. And then of course, as long as we're setting up expression, we are good to go. Now, of course, we can do tons of cool things in here. For example, I have the author. Now, what is the property? Or I'm sorry, what is the method that we can use on a string? We can go to, for example, uppercase, correct? And I can just invoke it. And I'll see that my value right away is invoked. So these are just few things that we can do. Now that we know that we can set up JavaScript in our JSX. And essentially, you can see that 
we right away make our JSX way more dynamic. It just means that we don't have to hard code everything. Amazing job. Now that we know that we can access JavaScript in our JSX, of course, let's take a look at the props. And why I would want a props? Well, even though I could set these ones up as variables, and I can pass them when I'll copy and paste the book, essentially when I'll have multiple instances of the book, at the end of the day, they will still display the same result. So now I'd want to take a look at how we can change these values here, depending on whatever we are passing in. Now I'll start by moving all my variables right after the CSS. So I'll say here, set up vars, and then I'll do the same thing for the title. So I'll place it over here. And you know what, I'll do the exact same thing with an image. So I'll call this const, and then IMG, and that will be equal to whatever value I have over here. Now I'll right away copy as a string, because it's going to be easier. Copy and paste. I have author, title, image. And now, of course, where I have the source, again, I go back to JavaScript land. And what is the variable name? That is IMG. So once I save it, nothing breaks, which is beautiful. Then I'll remove some of the stuff that we added in the last video. I don't think it is necessary over here. And let's remove both of these things as well. So now we go back to our standard setup. So once this is done, well, how we can pass something unique over here, because like I said, if I copy and paste, yeah, it works really well. We get the same instance and everything is beautiful, but the values don't change. Well, book is a function, correct? Now, what do we know about functions in JavaScript? Well, we know that there are parameters and there are arguments. So if I would have a simple function, if I set up some kind of parameter, for example, name, and then if I pass it in, then of course I can use it in my function. So can we do the same thing in React? Well, let's see. And you can probably already guess that if I'm suggesting that, that most likely we'll be able to do that. Otherwise, I mean, that would be kind of mean, wouldn't it? Okay, so I have my book component, which is a function. Now, where do we write usually parameters? It is right here, correct? So let's write a parameter name. Now, I'll write this as a prop because that is a general convention. It just stands short for properties that we usually pass in. However, you can call this shake and bake and bake or whatever you would want. Okay, just keep that in mind. And of course, we'll take a look at the example a little bit later where we call this shake and bake. So we've got our props. Now, of course, I would want to console log it because I would want to see, well, what is this value over here? What is this props? And I can console log in two places. I can do it above the return. And I can just say props, just make sure that the name is exactly the same. So if you're trying to test it out that you can call this whatever you would want. So if you wrote here bananas, don't console log props, console log bananas. And also I can do the same thing here, correct? Because remember, in the JSX, we could console log, meaning we can go back to JavaScript land. So in here, I'll write props as well. And we'll notice something interesting where if I inspect in my console, I have object, object, object. Hmm. Okay. What's happening here? Well, there is an object. Now, the cool thing now is that, of course, I can access that object. But obviously, the next question is, how can I pass something in here? I do have the object. That's why you can see that we can name it whatever we would want. It can be bananas, it can be shake and bake, whatever. At the end of the day, it's always going to be an object. However, convention is using props. So unless you want to be a real rebel, I would suggest sticking to that convention. And you know what, I think there's too many console logs at this point. But beautifully, we can see that it is an object. Now what? Well, 
in order to pass this in, we need to go back to where we are rendering the book. So not where we're setting up here, we'll access it, or where we render the book. This is where we need to pass it. And the way we pass it, we have a prop name, and then whatever value. So if I'm going to go here with a random prop name of job, and if I'll set this up as a value of developer, you'll notice that now when we console log, we have job, and then we have developer. So that's it. Awesome. Now, of course, we can access those values. Now, a few things that we can notice here for the second book, I'm still console logging the props. However, I didn't pass anything, correct? In here, of course, I have the job with the value. However, in here, I just have the empty object. That's why the second console log essentially is just an empty object because I didn't pass in. Can we pass something in? Yeah, I can say title and I'll call this a random title. Then can we pass, for example, a number? Yeah, I could go with number or price or whatever. And I can just say simply over here that the value will be equal to something. Again, I go back to JavaScript because again, this is still JSX. And for the time being, I'll just pass in 22. So now notice for the first one, I have job and developer. That is the property and the value in my object. However, for the second one, I have a tile property. The value is a random title. And in here, I passed in a number property with a value of 22. So what I'm trying to say, as far as the value, same as with JavaScript, we can pass the values here in the props. Now, the next question, of course, is, well, how we can access them. Uh, there's multiple ways how we can do that. That's why we'll split this up in multiple videos. But the most basic one would be using the same name that you used over here. So again, if I go with shake and bake, I'll still be able to do it. Keep that in mind. But you use the same name. And now, of course, we are just accessing those properties, just like in a regular React. Now, I did not pass my correct values as far as author, title and image. So for the time being, I'll just create two paragraphs. Well, I'll show you how I can access those values. So in here, I'll say that I'm looking for props, and then a job. And then we'll see two things. We'll see that for the first value, we do have the developer. So that is correct. But then for the second one, we have nothing. Now, why is that happening? Well, because I did not pass the prop by the name of job for the second one. So that is what is going to happen when the prop is not there. So if the prop is not there, it just won't be displayed. However, in this case, I have the title for the second one, right? So we can copy and paste. And again, I'm looking for props and then title. So now, of course, this will be displayed on the second one, but not on the first one. So hopefully this makes sense where when you're setting up a list, of course, you need to make sure that the props that you're passing actually match to whatever you're looking in the component. Correct. So if, for example, in a component, I'm looking for a job and make sure that all your instances have that job, because if that value won't be there, well, you just won't display it. And last one, let's go with paragraph here. And again, we'll look for props. And then what was the property that I was looking for? And that is, of course, the number. So now, of course, I'm passing in the number. And there it is. That's how we can start making these values more dynamic, as you can see, because we're accessing the props. And then, of course, when we're rendering the book, we pass it in. Again, we have prop name and then the value. And now, as I'm looking at my values over here, can we set this up as two separate objects, where essentially what I could do is for the first book, pass the property values from the first object, where of course, I'm going to have my image, my author and title. And then of course, we'll do the same thing for a different book. Now, let me look for a short name. 
I think uh, I'm going to use this one because I just don't want to copy too long of a name. So let's do that. Let's refactor these three values into a object and let's call this first book. So const first book that will be equal to our object. And then again, we have a bunch of properties. I'll start with an image and I'll just take these values. So cut it out, copy and paste. Then what else we have? Of course, we have the title. So we're going to go with title property. And then what is the value? It is this one over here. And then we have the last one of the author. So we go with author and we'll set this equal to whatever value I had. And now, of course, I would want to access them. Now, keep in mind, we could have accessed this as a straight up variables like I just had them before. The only difference right now is going to be that, of course, I'll set up proper props. So in here, let's start with IMG. So that's my IMG prop. And that will be equal to first book, because that, of course, is my object name. And then property value is IMG. And then where I'm accessing the props right now, I'm not going to be looking for job title and number since I will remove them. However, for the image, I'm going to go for props. And then I'm looking for the IMG. So now, of course, again, I'm grabbing whatever I have in the first book. And I would need to do the same thing for the title. So again, the prop name is title. Again, we're going back to a JavaScript land. And in here, I'm accessing first book, and then I'm looking for the title. So I'll say first book, and then title. Again, let me emphasize something where it doesn't have to be an object, we could have just accessed the properties. But since I would want to set up two of them, two objects, since I would want to have two different values, that's why, of course, I set it up as a object. And last one was the author. Again, we have the prop name, which is an author. And then we look in the first book. And then the property we're looking for is the author. So now, of course, I can remove these ones. They were just for testing purposes. And then just replace where I have the props. I'm looking for title. And then where I have the author, I'm looking for the author. Now, the problem right now is going to be that, yeah, the first one is displayed nicely. However, for the second one, notice I'm just passing in some random values. So like I was saying, yeah, we can pass whatever props you would want. But keep in mind that if in the component you're not looking for them, well, nothing is going to happen. You can pass all day long, but nothing is going to be rendered. However, if the component is looking for a specific prop and you're not passing, notice I cannot see the image. So what we would need to do? Well, eventually we'll set up a list and we'll iterate over the list. Now all that is coming up, but for the time being, what I would want is just copy and paste, and then we'll write a second book. Now, why am I setting up a second book? Because now, of course, I would want to change those values. So in here, I'm going to go for copy image address, and we'll replace it. We're going to copy and paste. So this is going to be a different image. Then, of course, I would want to also get my name. So let me see. Now, of course, this navigates here. So I guess I can just copy and paste from here. Like so. So let's navigate back. We're going to go with a different value here. And of course, I also would want to get a author. So let me somehow copy and paste, copy and paste the author. And there it is. Now we have this value. So what we need to do right now for the second book is pass these values as well. But remember, of course, now I'm looking for the second object. Now I could technically look for the first one, but it somewhat doesn't make sense since I wouldn't want to repeat that. So I'm going to go with IMG. That will be equal to a second book. And then again, I'm looking for IMG property. Then the same goes for the title where I'm looking for title. And then I'm looking for second book. And then the title and the last one, of course, you can probably already guess we have the author. And then we're looking for second book, and then the author. And once I pass in these values, now notice, I have my first instance, all that is beautiful. 
And then I have the second instance where I'm getting those unique values. So we can already see how nicely we can start creating these lists where, yes, they all will be displayed the same way because we made sure that when we're setting up our component. However, because we have something called props, we can start passing in unique values where we have prop name and either we can hard code here like we did in the beginning with the string. Either we can set up a variable or we can set up objects or arrays or whatever and then pass it as a value here as well. Since when we set up curly braces, we're going back to a JavaScript land. A couple of rules, we can call it whatever we want, but convention is calling it props. One way how to access it is just by looking in the object that we're getting. So we go with the props and then whatever name of the prop. And the last thing is that if you pass in some prop that you're not looking in the component, nothing will happen. But if the component is looking for the prop that you're not passing in, essentially, you'll just have the empty space since component is going to be looking for the prop, but the value will be undefined. Nicely done. While we're still on a subject of the props, I also would want to show you two alternative ways how you can access them. And they all have to do with the way we destructure properties from the objects in JavaScript. So if you would need to study up on that, please do so. Because again, this has nothing to do with React. It is just JavaScript. Where if I know that I have this props object, and if I don't want to repeat myself, where I go props dot, props dot, props dot, I could just destructure all the properties where I can go with const or let. So in my case, I'm going to go with const. And then I'm just going to signal which properties I would want. Now, keep in mind, though, that, of course, I still need to access the same thing that I'm setting up as a props in my parameters. So these names need to match. Otherwise, again, it's not going to work. And then I'm just going to say, yeah, I would like to access image. I would like to access title as well as the author. So I go with IMG, then the title, and then comma the author. And once I have access to each and every property in my props object, now I'm going to select multiple cursors. And I do that by pressing option and then a mouse. And then of course, I will remove the props. I don't need them anymore. And as you can see right now, I'm accessing each and every property and everything is still rendered. So that's one of the options we can do. And also, if you're familiar with the structuring, you also know that you can do directly where you're setting up the function parameters. So here's what I'm saying right now. I'm saying, yes, I will get a object. I know that my props, of course, is going to be an object. And I will destructure it here in the parameters instead. So I don't even need to set it up equal to props because now I'm just saying, yeah, there will be a props object and this props object is going to have these properties in there. So we can simply say IMG, then title, and then the author. Now, please keep in mind that both of them are exactly the same. So the result is exactly the same. These are just the syntaxes that you'll see around where some people prefer doing the structuring here, where they just set it equal to an object, or you can do it directly where you're setting up parameters. Again, if you need to jog your memory, please check object destructuring in JavaScript, because this is not React specific. Essentially, this is JavaScript. And if you are familiar with object destructuring, you already know that, of course, we can destructure even more nested structures. And in here, I'm not going to create a more complicated example just to showcase that. But I would just want to let you know that if you are familiar with that, then yes, the same rules would apply. Or for example, if in the author, I would have more properties, essentially, if the author would be an object, I would just place a colon, and then I would keep on the structuring. And yes, we will do that in some of the later projects. But for now, just remember that if you don't want to set up props object in your parameter, 
and then access each property by typing the props and then dot and props and dot. You can either destructure them inside the function body where you just look for specific properties that are in the object. In my case, I'm G title and author, or we can simply destructure the props object in the function parameters. And while we're still on a topic of props, I also would like to talk about the special prop called children. So this is going to be the case where please don't name this Mamba juice. Okay, this is not the case where as usual, I say, yeah, you can name it whatever you'd want, shake and bake, Uncle Bobby, or whatever. In this case, the name has to match exactly. Now, what am I talking about? You see, the children prop is everything that we render in between the opening and closing tag of the component. So, for example, for the first or second book, you can pick whichever you like. I would like to add the description. But again, the gotcha over here is that only one of them will have that description, not all of them. Because if we would want all of them, of course, we just need to add that property in the object, then I'm looking for a prop, I set the value, and I'm good to go. Now, this is going to be the case where only one of them will have that description. So I'm going to go with the first one. But as always, you can pick whichever you would like. So of course, first, I would need to change this around where I'm not going to be self closing, because children prop will be here in between my tags. And I'm just going to go with a paragraph and I'm going to use lorem ipsum. So in Visual Studio Code, you just need to type lorem and how many words you would like. So in my case, I'm going to go with 20. Now, the moment I run it, Notice how nothing changes. I don't see any difference. So the paragraph is only for the first one, but there's no difference on what is rendered. So how I can access whatever I place in between. And keep in mind, again, you can place here the whole project. It doesn't matter. In my case, I just placed one paragraph with 20 words, but you can place here buttons, you can place here forms, whatever you would like place to in between the opening and closing tags. Now, the better question right now is, how can I access this? And the thing is, I already destructured the props object, where I said that I'm looking for the IMG prop, title prop, and the author prop. Now, the children prop is on the props object, I can tell you right away that it is there. So what I could do is just write comma, and then children. No, don't worry. I will refactor a little bit later. So essentially, that way you can definitely see it. But for now, just look for children. And the name again here is important. And what you'll notice that since again, we can access JavaScript, we can just place children wherever I would like. So once I run it, notice, now, of course, everything is displayed correct. Because this is my paragraph. Now, as far as where you would want to render, it's really up to you where if I will move this up, notice now, of course, it's going to be above the author. If I'll move this up above the title, then of course, it's going to be above the title. Again, the name is very special. It is children. And in this case, I destructure it right here in the function parameters. And then of course, you also access it. So we use the curly braces, we go back to JavaScript. And then we access the same name. And then wherever I'm going to place this in the component, it will be rendered, meaning we'll place it in between the opening and the closing tag. And then where we set up the component, we can render it anywhere, anywhere we would want. Now, in my case, of course, I'm going to do this in the bottom. So now let me rewrite where I'm not going to destructure everything in function parameters. Essentially, I'll go back to props. So I'm going to go back here to the props. I will comment this out. So I'm still accessing these values. And of course, now I would need to go with props and then dot children. Now, the reason why I refactored a little bit, because I clearly want to show you that, of course, the props will be there. So if we go back and if we inspect, take a look at the console. Notice again, I have two objects. So my props object, however, 
for the second one, it has this children prop. That's why I said the name is special. Or I'm sorry, for the first one. For the first one, we have children prop, and the second one doesn't have that. So, of course, that's why the second one doesn't display the children, and the first one does. Now, CSS specific thing, for example, if you don't like this CSS grid, meaning that both cards right now are extended, you can simply go back to index CSS. There, where you're setting up the grid, you can say align items, and we can just say start. And what you'll notice right now, that only the one that has the children, meaning the paragraph, that one is extended. So that's up to you. If you like this type of CSS better, where each card has its own height, you can keep it. If you don't, then of course, don't add it. So for example, if I comment this out, then of course, notice how both of them are extended. Now, I will add a little bit of CSS where I'm going to say book, and then we'll just say margin top, and we're going to go with, I don't know, 0.5 RMs, something like that. Not much in there. And now, of course, we know how we can work with a children prop in React, where again, it's going to be content in between the opening and closing tag then the name is special. You need to go with children. So either you destructure it here, function parameters, or you still keep the name, and then you destructure the rest of the properties. And by the way, please keep in mind, you can still do it here as well, where I say children. And then, of course, when I access, I also need to access children. I can also do it this way as well. Nicely done. And once we're experts on props, now let's focus on our data. Because at the moment, notice we have first book, we have second book, and life is great, but we are somewhat repeating ourselves, aren't we? Where I'm creating same component that I pass in the props. Then, for example, I would be setting up some children, and we can already imagine that if we have lists, like they have in the Amazon, it would be somewhat tiresome to keep on repeating the same stuff. So each and every time we would need to create a object, then each and every time we also would need to set up a component and then notice how our file is getting bigger and bigger. So if I have 100 books like this, it is not very practical. So how we could change that around is we could set this up as an array. So we would still have objects, but they will be in the array. And then we could iterate over that array. And for each and every item, display that book. So that way we don't have to repeat ourselves. And yes, again, we will refactor the application. Now let me just quickly mention the reason why we keep on refactoring, because of course, we're starting with the most basic example. And then we're slowly building up. And then as we're building up, yes, we will delete some stuff. Yes, we will refactor some stuff, because that's the only way how we can do that. So I'll remove my children for the time being, we really don't care about the children. Then when of course, we're dealing with children, we're also will remove them. Now, of course, you can keep them if you want. But since we're not passing anything in, it doesn't really make much sense. I'll also remove this children as well. And I guess let's start with our list. So first, where I have the first book and the second book, I can just simply remove both variables. So these will become our objects. Now what do we need to do over here is simply set up array, and I'll call this books. So const is equal to a box. And then of course, let's enclose both of our objects. And of course, in here, it's not going to be a semicolon anymore, it is going to be a comma. And same thing over here, let's remove that semicolon. So now, of course, we get a bunch of errors. Why? Well, because there is no variable anymore, first book and second book. And I think it's actually going to be quite easier if we just remove the both books as well, for the time being. Don't worry, Later, of course, we will add it. So what I would want to showcase first, 
Well, first, I want to showcase that, yes, of course, we can access this books array. So in the book list, I'm going to go back to JavaScript. So I will set up my curly braces and I'll just type books. Now, life is great, but it says over here that objects are not valid as react child. Hmm. Okay. What is happening over here? Well, we have the array, but each and every item in that array is an object. And React will complain that, listen, I cannot render the object. Okay, so let's test it out with just an array of strings. So in here, I'm going to go with const and the names, and I'll pass in the array again. So John, and then Peter. And then also let's set up Susan. So three names. And now let's test it out. And by the way, the reason why I showed you this error, because once in a while you will hit this error when essentially you'll set up a map method that we will cover a little bit later. So once you hit this error, just try to remember that you're not accessing the proper values. Because if you have this error of the child where it is an object, that just means that you either haven't structured properly, or you're not accessing properly. So now let's test it out with those strings. So now I'm going to go back to names. And life is awesome. I am displaying my array correctly in react. Now the gotcha here, of course, is that I'm not wrapping those names in anything, right? Now how we can wrap our JavaScript values in the HTML. And of course, in JavaScript, we do that with a map method. So I can write it here where I'm accessing the JavaScript land, or I can set up a new variable. That is up to me. So I'll try it with a new variable over here. And then when we work with those books, then of course, I'll do it right here in the React, meaning in the JSX. So let's call this new names. So const new names, and that is equal to a names. And now, of course, I'm iterating over this array using a map method. And now what I would want is to wrap each and every name in a heading one. Because at the moment, yeah, it's nice. I can see my list of names, but it's also somewhat meaningless because it is not displayed nicely. So I already know that with map method, I'm accessing each and every name. Now, if you would want to access that, of course, you can just set up a parameter. So I'm going to say here name. And then for the time being, if you want to console log it, for sure, console log the name. And this is also something that we'll do a lot in the course is we will console log it. Now, I'll also console log new name just so we can see the result. And once we take a look at the console, I can see that each and every time I'm logging a name. All right, so that is John, Peter, and Susan, but my values come back as undefined. Now, the reason for that, because I'm not returning anything. So, okay, we have the names, and I can access each and every name. Why don't we wrap this in the HTML? Meaning, instead of just displaying what items I have in my array, now I'd want to display each and every item wrapped in a heading one. And the only thing I would need to do is go with return, then I'll set up my heading one, and then I'll pass in the name. So in here, of course, if I would want to access that particular variable, I would need to go with a name like so. So that's how I'm accessing right now. So I'm mapping over and I'm saying, yeah, get me the heading one, and then I'm going back to a JavaScript. Remember, that was the setup where essentially we were setting up the name. So now, of course, if I check it out, my value, then this will be already different than I had before. Before that, I had undefined. Now, essentially, you can see that I'm getting something interesting. Now that something interesting is my heading one. Now, what I'm trying to say over here is, by the way, you know what? I want to rename this to new names. So if we will go back, and if we'll say new names, you'll see that now I have John, Peter, and Susan. 
don't worry about this warning. We will fix it. But the more important part is here that yes, in react, we can right away render that array. However, that array, of course, cannot be objects. So if you're going to have objects, you will have some problems and errors and all that. However, if it's just a simple string, yes, of course, you can render it. However, it's going to make way more sense if we will wrap those values in something more meaningful. In this case, of course, that is heading one. But in the next video, we'll take a look at how we can iterate over the array that has the object. And instead of just heading one, now I would want to return a component for each and every item, not a heading one, not a heading two, or whatever, but the actual component. All right. And once we have covered a simple example, now, of course, let's iterate over our books array and access each and every item, which is a object. So I'll start by removing the suckers starting from line 20 to 24. I'm also not going to be looking for the names. I'm going to go right for the books. So like I said, we can set up separately variable and then render it here, or we can iterate over it in the JSX because remember that map will return a new array. So now I go with a map method, and then I would want to access each and every item in my callback function, correct? And I'll name my parameter book. Just keep in mind that whatever you name this parameter will just point to each and every object in our iteration. And for the time being, I'll just return a hello, because I would just want to see how everything is going to work. So once I return this hello, notice I'm not accessing the book. So that one is grayed out, but I have two values. Now, why do I have two values? Because I have two items in the array. So as I'm iterating with map, I will always return the amount of items that I have in the original array. So if I would have 2000, since I'm just returning a hello from this function, I'll have 2000 hellos. So now, of course, if I really want to test it out, I can say, well, show me that book. And that book should be this object. It should be the first object and the second object. Okay. And we already know that, of course, I can either access those properties using dot. So I can say book dot author book dot image or whatever. Or, of course, I can use the structuring. So in here, I'm going to say const. And then what properties I'm looking for? The same ones, IMG, then title, and then the author. Now that is coming from the book. Now I'm not going to console log them anymore. I just want to showcase that here I can return whatever I would want. So if I really wanted to, I could say that there's going to be a div. Now I'm not going to add a image, but I'll add the other ones where I'll say heading three, for example, with a title and then heading six is going to be with an author. So let's add those two values. And now, of course, I have the name as well as the author. So I have these two values. Like I said, I can return whatever I would want from this map method. And of course, that will be displayed. The key, of course, was that we could not render the object. That's why specifically we need to look for those properties. Okay, good. Now what? Well, if we put two and two together, I already have the book, correct? I already have the component. So in here, if I can return whatever I would want, well, why don't we return a book? So what we would need to do is just change around the div to a book. And now in a book, of course, the biggest question is, how do we pass in the props? Well, I could add them one by one. I could say IMG is equal to IMG, title is equal to title. That is doable because please keep in mind that in a props, I already destructured them, correct? I already did the structure IMG, title, and author. However, there are two other ways how I can do that. So in this video, I'll show you the first one. And then in the next video, I'll show you how we can use a spread operator instead. 
So instead of passing all of them here one by one, I could simply say, all right, you know what? There's going to be a book prop, and that book prop will be equal to a book that I'm passing in. So remember, we were looking for what? We were looking for the object here, correct? So instead of destructuring one by one, IMG, title, and author, I can just say, I'm going to be passing this object as a prop. Nothing stops me. However, the problem is going to be that we will get an error here. Why? Well, because now props is not simply a object with IMG title and author. It's going to be a object with a book object. So let's see. We're going to go with props. And like I said, there's going to be no values here because we're not accessing the title. But notice how props now has the property that is the value. And then in that object, I see that I have my properties. So what do we need to do over here? Well, simply, we would just need to set up props and then the property that I'm looking for. What is the property? That is, of course, a book. So once I do that, now I only have this warning about the child, which we will fix in the next video. However, let's see the cool thing where now I'm iterating over my array. And for each and every object, I'm returning that book. And what that means is, for example, I can go and find another book. So for example, this one, I'm going to go and I'm going to set up a copy image address. And in here, let's just make another object. So I'll copy and paste as far as the image value. That is, of course, going to be equal to my new book. Then, of course, we'll also get the author like so. And I would want to do the same thing with a title as well. So I'll copy that value. And of course, I'll pass it in the title. So now if we navigate to a bigger screen, check it out. Whatever items we will have in our array. Now, of course, we are displaying them. And for each and every item that we have, we're using that book component. And we set up the map method. So now we don't need to manually keep on adding this book component each and every time. And we don't need to manually keep on adding IMG, title, and author. But what we could do instead is just grab our book, meaning our parameter, which will point always back to that item in the array, which in our case is the object. And then, of course, where we have the props, we are just destructuring. However, in this case, we're not destructuring the props. We're destructuring the book property. So in this case, of course, I can just remove this book altogether. Correct. So now, of course, I can see in my console that I have three items. Why? Well, because now I have three items in the array. So I guess I can remove this console log as well. And now we just need to fix this little warning about the fact that each child must have a unique key prop. Excellent job. We have our list. The only nagging thing is the fact that we have this warning about that unique key prop. So what is happening here and how we can fix it? You see later as we're progressing with React, of course, what we would want to do with lists is, for example, to remove some items or maybe add the items and react wants to keep a track of what we're adding, what we're removing. So react is always in the loop. Now, in order to do that, we would need to set up a special key prop for each and every item that we're turning. So essentially, each and every time you have a list in react, you need to add a key prop with a unique value. Now I can tell you right away that in most cases, we'll be hitting up the API anyway. So there's always some kind of unique value, whether that is for the product, whether that is for the user, or whatever. However, in this case, since we are the ones who are setting up these items, well, of course, I would need to add that. So in here, we just need to go with ID, and then whatever value you'd want, as long as it is unique. So in my case, I'm just going to go with ID of one, then ID of two, and then ID of three as well. So copy and paste, and then ID of three. So 
So now, of course, you'll notice that, well, we have the error because we're not passing it in. Now, how I can access that? Well, I could destructure it if I would want, correct? However, in this case, I think it's just going to be simple where I go with book and then ID. Now, I don't need to deal with that key, anything in the actual book. But now you'll notice that React is not going to complain anymore, where now everything is fine. As long as you pass this special prop, again, this is not shake and bake. This has to be a key and unique value. Now, one thing you'll notice once in a while where people are adding index because in the map you can access index. Yes, you can technically do that. In this case, there's going to be no problem. You can. However, it's going to be a problem if you're actually doing something with a list. So my suggestion would be following where if you know that your list will never pretty much change, so you won't be removing the items or adding them dynamically, you can technically let this slide and use the index. However, it is a better setup if you would always definitely use something unique, because keep in mind that indexes change as your array is changing. However, the ID, so that unique property won't change. All right. And the last thing that I would want to talk about in this video is another way how we can pass in those props. So one of the ways was setting up this book as an object prop, where I have the book prop, and then I'm passing in, of course, this book object. However, there's also a case where we can use a spread operator. Again, my job is to show you multiple syntaxes, multiple ways how you can solve it. It is up to you whichever way you prefer. If you don't like the spread operator setup, you don't have to use it. However, that is my favorite. So I will use it somewhat often throughout the course. So what am I doing over here? Instead of passing this as a object, what I'm saying is that I would want to spread out all the properties. So in ES6, we have spread operator where I just go with dot, 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 and then whatever is the name of the object. So now what happens when I'm passing in, I'm not passing anymore this book property as a object. What I'm passing this in as a separate properties. And in that way, I don't need to use anymore this book property altogether. What I can just say is that I would like to spread out all the properties here that are coming from the book on my props. So what that means, again, we go back to our previous setup, where either I'm looking for the props, if I'm the structuring over here, or keep in mind, I can also do it in function parameters as well. So yes, again, some refactoring, some different way how to solve that. I know it's annoying for some people. But in general, it is a good practice to understand that there's multiple ways how to solve it. And again, it's up to you to decide whichever method you prefer. So again, if we will console log props right now, you'll see that we are back to that setup where props is an object. So not anymore this book object that we're passing in, we're spraying out all the properties that we have in the book. So once it's back to being an object, then of course, I can access these properties one by one, either here, or of course, we can calm this out. And yes, we'll refactor it one more time where we say, MG, title, and then the author. Again, both of them do exactly the same thing. So the result will be exactly the same. But you'll see this type of syntax in other people's code. So it's very useful to understand what is happening. So instead of passing it book as an object, and then accessing those properties one by one, I can say how many properties I have doesn't matter, just spread them out as props. And then of course, I can access them. Now, of course, the names need to match. If here I call this IMG, then of course, when you're trying to access them, when you're destructuring them, then also you would need to have the same name. Not bad, not bad. We now know how we can render list of objects and nicely wrap it into our component. But the next thing that I want to talk about is, of course, events, because everything is nice. We have our list. But of course, what makes applications so appealing 
is the fact that we can start responding to some user events. So essentially, when the user clicks the button or hovers over the card or whatever. Now, the problem is that we haven't covered yet the state. So in our examples, we'll just deal with console logs. We maybe throw in some alerts. Essentially, this is just to give you a general idea. When we cover state, then, of course, our examples are going to become more interesting because we will add some items, we'll remove some items, we'll toggle some info and all that good stuff. So this is just to give you a general overview how the events will work in React. Now, as a side note, if you'd like to see all the events, because in our examples, we'll just take a look at the two, I would suggest Googling React events and then look for this link, the synthetic event. And then if you keep on scrolling, notice in React Docs, you'll find all the possible events that React supports. Again, in our example, we'll just take a look at two, one on hover and the second one on a click. So I'll navigate back to our project and we'll work in the book component. So what do we need in order to set up a vent in React? Well, first of all, we'll need to add the attribute. So right here, attribute. And then the second one is the event handler. Now, the one thing that is different from the JavaScript is that since we're setting this up in line, again, we need to make sure that we're using the camel cache. So instead of on click or lowercase, like you would normally write as far as inline JavaScript, in this case, we need to set this up with a camel case, which would mean on click and then like i said in our video we'll take a look at the on click event and the second one will be on mouse over but i just showed you where you can find rest of the events as well now the way we set that up first i'm going to create a button now technically you don't have to create button for the on click of course you can attach it to heading four heading one to the whole article if you want but just to be more correct, I'm going to add a button. So I'll add here a type. I'll say that it will be a button. And then, like I said, in order to set up a event, we would need to have the attribute. And since I would want to listen for click events, I simply will go with on click. And like I just mentioned, we would need to set this up as a camel case. So on click. And then we need to have our handler. Now, I'll set up multiple examples because we have multiple options just so you can see whichever makes most sense to you. So we can set it up as a reference or we can set it up as a inline function. How I would set that up as a reference? Well, in here, I could come up with a function. So let's say click handler. And then, of course, we are having our function. And then we just need to pass it in as a reference. So we have click handler, and then we pass it here on click. So our click handler. Now, what I would want to do over here, well, I could just go simply with alert and hello world. And you'll see that first we'll have the button, but of course I skipped the name. So let me write here reference example. And then you'll see that I have my button. That is the reference example. And the moment you click it, you have the hello world. Beautiful. So we know how we can respond to the first event, the click event. So this is going to be a reference example. But like I just said, we also have an option of setting this up as a inline function. Now, what that means is that I could simply place my function here instead of setting this up as a reference. How is that going to look like? Well, in this case, I think I'm going to go with heading one just so we can spice things up. Just please keep in mind, of course, as far as accessibility, that is not the best case scenario, but let's just go with that. So we'll have on click. Then, like I said, click handler will become my inline function. And in here, I'll simply say that I would like to console log. And I just want to showcase that, of course, within this function, I can access my variables, my props. And for time being, I'll just go with a title. So once we click on a title, 
in a console, we should also see the title. So let's see. I'm gonna go with console, and then once I click on a title, notice now I'm getting that specific title that is displayed. So for each and every book, of course, title is unique. And then once we click on that title, then of course we can see it in a console log. Please keep in mind that both of them are doing the same thing right now. Okay. In one case, we have the inline function that has the functionality. And in the second case, we have the reference. So now we're referencing the function. And again, we have some kind of functionality. So you can choose whichever option makes sense to you. Now the gotcha is going to be when we would want to pass some kind of value. So this is going to be later on where, for example, we would want to delete the item for the list, we would need to pass the actual ID. So we know which item to delete. So again, in this case, we won't delete the item from the list. However, we'll take a look at what happens if we're passing in that item, because this is going to be a gotcha. So in here, I'll set up another button. And I'll say again, type is equal to a button. And then we'll have a on click for the time being, we'll just leave it empty. And we'll say more complex example. All right, good. So what if I would have a function? And I'll call this const and then complex example. And then again, we're setting up our function. And in this function, I will get the author, I can get the ID, I can get the title, I can even get the image if I would want to. But let's just imagine that I would want to console log this author each and every time when I click it. Okay. Now, what's important, though, that this will be passed dynamically. It's not like in here where I have a console log, and then I'm just accessing the title, we need to imagine that in this function, in the complex example, I'm looking for that as an argument. So I'll say here that I will pass in the author. Now you'll notice that if I just run my complex example, and if I pass in the author, well, yeah, technically it will work, but it will work the moment I render my application. So the moment I render, notice I ran all three of them. So I have all three authors over here. So why do you think is that happening? Well, because here, notice I invoke this function. I invoke it the moment I run my application. And that is now what I'm looking for. Of course, what I would want is run it only once I click it. So here's the thing. If you have this kind of situation where you must pass the argument into the function, you'll have to first set it up a arrow function. So here we'll start with an inline and then we can either set up the curly braces if you want. That's definitely an option. Or we can simply say, you know what, once I click, then I would want to run the function. Again, that is going to be the case if you must pass this into as an argument. And again, this is going to be for more complex scenarios, where we'll start passing data, for example, to the database, or we'll be removing items. Again, this is not going to be just with simple console logs. Of course, at the moment, you can just simply argue, well, I would write it as an inline function. There's going to be cases where you cannot do that. That's why, of course, I'm showing you this. So now, of course, what happens once I click on more complex example, only then I run it, because we need to understand that once we start up the application, we run our function or our function. And then of course, we return the complex example. And only then once we click it, then we invoke our complex example. Also, I would like to mention that in all the functions, in all our event handlers, we can access the event object. In this case, I'll just show you with one with a click handler, just please understand that, of course, you can access in all of them, where essentially we have our event object. And we can do things we can console log event. And we can also, for example, go for event target. That's probably going to be the most useful scenario because Normally, you'll use this with inputs a lot, where we'll be looking for the name, we'll be looking for the value, and all that good stuff. For the button, we'll just take a look at what we're clicking on. So remember, that was the first one. So once I click, notice I have my alert. Okay, that is beautiful. And then I have my whole big event. So of course, we can find bunch of useful 
info over here, but also I have what I'm clicking on. So that is my target. And this is something that we will use quite often, especially once we start working with the inputs. And the second event I would want to take a look at is on mouse over, which essentially occurs when the mouse pointer is moved on to a element. So I can set this up anywhere I would like, but I think I'm going to go with an article just to make it interesting. So first, I'm looking for my attribute. I'm looking for on mouse over. And then again, we have the handler. Now, in this case, I'll pass this as a inline. However, instead of just implicit return, like we had before. Now, of course, notice I'm setting up the curly braces. And again, I will do some kind of functionality over here. This is just a showcase that regardless whether you go with implicit return or you're setting up the curly braces, it will work. So we have our on mouse over beautiful. And then we're going to go with some kind of function. And I don't know, I'm just going to go with console log. And I would like to console log. I guess we have been console logging the author. Why don't we console log the title? Because we can still access that specific title for each and every component. So now what happens as I hover over it? Notice the moment my mouse moves on to the element. Now, of course, I'm console logging the title of the book. So each and every time I do that, notice how I increase the amount in a console. So if I'll move my mouse on to a different item, then of course, I will console log that particular title. So that's how we can work with events. So essentially, those are the basics of how we can listen for events in react. All right, once we're successfully done with react basics, but before we move on to more interesting and advanced react topics, I would like to cover import and export statements. Now, let me tell you right away that imports and exports are not React specific. In fact, they are ES6 modules. So think JavaScript. And the reason why I would want to cover them now is because we will rely heavy on them throughout the remaining of the course, as well as the projects. And essentially, ES6 modules or ability to import and export our code allows us to split up our app into small chunks, which of course makes it easier to manage it. In general, there are two flavors named and default exports. And even though there are a few more variations for both of them, for now, we'll just cover the most straightforward setup. So as we're looking at our app, everything is beautiful. But don't you think that our index.js is getting quite big? And we need to keep in mind that at the moment, we literally have only three cards with some books. Of course, normally you have way more functionality than that. So it wouldn't make sense to start splitting up our functionality into separate files. Because that way, of course, we can manage it way easier. So here's what I'm talking about. I'm going to open up the sidebar and then in the source, I would like to create two new files. So one is going to be called books.js. This is where I would want to store my books. And the other one is going to be book.js. And this is, of course, where I would want to store my component. So my book component. Let's create those files. So a new file. And then I'm going for books.js. This is where I'll store my data. And then I'll have another one, new file. And then I'm looking for this book and then JS. Now, what I would want to do right now is head back to index.js and grab my books array. So let's keep on scrolling and just cut it out. And then, of course, we navigate to books.js, copy and paste. Now, everything is beautiful, but of course, in the index.js, where we have the book list, of course, we are not anymore accessing the books. So how we can fix that? Well, in the books JS, we would need to go for the named export. Again, there are two flavors and you can use them however you'd like, meaning we could have set this up as default export as well. But I'm going to show you the named export with the books and then with a the book. So with the component, I will show you the default export. So we go here with export. So that is a keyword. And then, of course, we go with let or const. 
and then whatever we would want to export. So that's going to be most straightforward setup. Like I said, there are a few flavors. So essentially, there are a few other ways how we can write the same thing. Again, the idea won't change. We're still exporting this box array, but there are a few more variations how we can do that. But for now, we'll just stick with the most straightforward one where we go with export and then whatever we would want to export. So now, of course, in the index.js, what I would want is to import. And similarly, like we imported the index CSS. Now, of course, I'm looking for that particular array. Now it's going to be a little bit different where I'm going for the import statement. Then since it is a named import or named export, I would need to go with curly braces. And then the name for the named export needs to match exactly. So if this is Bugs Bunny, make sure that in the index.js, you're also targeting the same name. So in my case, I need to go for books. So I go for books, and that is coming from, and now we go with the relative path. So notice something interesting. We're not importing from the package like we did with React, which of course was coming for our node module. And like I mentioned back then, since it is not coming from the node modules, now we need to set up a path. So in this case, since it was coming from node modules, we didn't care. We just said, hey, get me this one from this package. However, in this case, we need to have a relative path. But since the box is in the same folder, I just go with dot, then forward slash, and then I'm looking for the file. And I go here with books. Now, since it is a JS file, we don't need to have the extension. Previously, remember when we work with CSS, we needed to have the CSS extension. With JavaScript, we don't have to do that. So if it is a JavaScript file, excellent. We just keep on moving on. So now we save it. Okay, beautiful. And notice how our app still works. So everything works as expected. Now, of course, like I said, if I'll, for example, set this up as data and I'll save it, notice it will say, well, books is not defined. So now, of course, since I named this data, also where I'm using it, of course, I would need to rename it as data. However, it says import error data is not exported from books. So if you're changing something around, like I said, this is a named export. So for example, you need to access exactly the same name. So in here, I'm accessing data. However, React is complaining, hey, listen, you're not exporting data. So if that is the case, of course, we can just change it. So that is up to you. This is just to showcase that, of course, names need to match exactly. So once we have this particular setup, everything is beautiful. And now let's focus on the default one. Now, before we set up our component, let me just show you the extension, like I mentioned previously, where we have the React snippet. So for example, if we create this component in if I go with a snippet of RAFCE, I right away have my component. And this is going to be the case where it will always match the name of that particular file. So in this case, notice it is named book.js. So that's why right away my component is book.js. And again, there are multiple flavors, but this is the most basic one where we import React from React. Of course, we need to do that since we're setting up the component. And then as far as default export, we go with export, but then we add this default and then whatever we would want to export as default. And I'll show you the differences between the two in a second, but just keep in mind that, of course, again, these names need to match. So if you're setting up your function, your component, and uh, name it book, if you want to export as default, of course, you would need to use the same name. And also keep in mind that you can have only one, only one default export per file, meaning you can set up more named exports from this particular file from book.js. But as far as default, you can have only one. Now, what I would want in this book.js component? Well, let's head back to index.js. And then, of course, this is my component, correct? So what I could do is just keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling, cut it out. And then we can just remove the empty function that we currently have in the book component, and then copy and paste. 
And now, of course, everything works awesome. So everything is displayed exactly like we wanted. And now in the index, again, we would need to import. So the difference between named and default exports is the fact that now I can name it whatever I would want. So in here, if I go with import, and if I'll call this book, and then from and then again, we're looking for relative path, we're looking for book JS, everything will work as expected. So now once we save, notice it is running like nothing happened. Okay, so once all that is running, now once everything is in place, then of course, we can just take a look what happens. If for example, I change this name, so I have import book from the book. But like I said, this is a default export. So what that means is I don't need to look for a specific name. So if I'll change this around, and if I'll call this specific book, then of course, the only thing I need to do is change where I call it. So notice here I have my book. So if I'll just call this specific book, you'll notice that everything will still work. So even though I renamed it and from the book JS, I'm exporting the book, everything works as expected because it is a default export and then I can rename it however I would want. So in here, I rename it to a specific book that is coming from the book JS file. And then of course, the only thing I need to do is just remember what is the name I gave. So if this was specific book, of course, I need to access the same name. And then let me just show you the relative path from a different folder. Because once in a while, of course, we will use that throughout the course, where I'm just going to create a new folder. I'll say testing here. And then within this folder, let's just come up with a file of testing, and then a JS. And let's export as default. And we'll say export let and we'll call this hello world. So greeting, greeting, and that is going to be hello world. So in any of the files now, we can export this. However, of course, relative path will change, because now we need to go one level up into testing, and then look for this testing JS file. Again, it's not going to do anything. However, I just want to showcase in the index JS, where if I go with import, Remember, the name was greeting, and we're exported as a named import. So we go here with greeting, and that is coming from so now we're looking into the testing, testing folder, and then we're looking for the testing file. So testing JS. And now of course, anywhere where I would want, I can just for example, console log. it. So I go with console log and then greeting. And then of course, once I open this up, I will notice that in my console, I should have the hello world. And of course, I do notice the line 12. It is hello world. So everything works as expected. Like I said, it is not a react thing. It is ES6 modules. And if you have covered ES6 modules before you are in good shape. However, we will heavily rely on this functionality, because it will just allow us to set up our applications in a more manageable way. Where notice, now I have my index.js. In the index.js, I only have the book list. So that is my component. And then I'm getting these specific pieces of data, whether that is all the books, whether that is a specific component, or whether that is some other functionality, in this case, hello world. And as you can see, it is much more easier to manage our app where we split up our data into multiple files. So those are the basics how we can use import and export statements in create react app. And the last thing that I would want to cover in react basics section is how we can host our application on the internet. So how we can move the sucker from localhost 3000 to some kind of URL that we can share with our friends or family or anyone that would be interested in our project. Because of course, it is kind of hard to do with our local host 3000. Correct. Now there are many hosting providers out there. But for this specific one, I picked Netlify, because it is very easy to set up. And you'll have your application online 
in no time. Now you can sign up for free, so they will not ask for your credit card. So keep that in mind, you're in good shape. And then once you sign up for account, of course, you'll have ability to log in, which is exactly what I'm about to do. And then once you log in, then if you keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling, you have this option of just a drag and drop. Now later, we'll take a look at the continuous deployment option that is through the Git. However, in this case, we'll just cover the simple drag and drop. And essentially, these are just the project that I'm already hosting on Netlify. So if you just sign up for the account, of course, this part will be empty. So if you'll go with continuous deployment with Git, which we'll do later, then you'll use this option, new site from Git. However, in our case, like I said, we keep on scrolling and we're looking for this one to deploy a new site without connecting to Git. Drag and drop your site folder here. Now, before we can do anything, remember we had this option of NPM run build. So that sets up our production build. So instead of running NPM start, which spins up the dev server. Now we need to go with npm run and then build. And once we run this command, of course, our production build, the one that we can host online is being created. And once it's done, it's going to be available in the build folder. So that's the folder that we will drag and drop in Netlify. And of course, once it's done, Notice it says that everything is good to go, that the build folder is ready to be deployed. And now we either can run serve and that will just show what we have locally. But of course, that's not the option we're looking for. I would want to see how it's going to look online using Netlify. So of course, in this case, what I'm doing here, by the way, let me close my bunch of windows. And what I would want is, of course, everything is saved up over here. And what I would want is to open this sucker up. I have my build and I'm looking for this build folder, like I said, and we'll just drag and drop. So grab the build folder and just drag and drop over here. Then I'll maximize my window again. It's going to give you this interesting name. And at the end, you'll notice this Netlify dot app. Now, of course, eventually you can have a custom name. So if you have already a domain, you can connect it to Netlify. But for our purposes, we'll just use this option where essentially there's going to be this Netlify dot app. So we're looking for site settings. If we would want to change the name, we go for change site name, and then you can come up with whatever name you want. So I'm going to go with React tutorial or basics tutorial basics tutorial and then 2020. So that's the name I chose. Of course, if you'll go with some type of name that is already used, of course, it's not going to be available. So it will complain. But in my case, I think I'm going to be good to go. So of course, that is my site. So now what I would want is either go to overview and then just click on this URL. And you'll notice that this is our project. And now it is successfully running online where you can share it with your friends and your family. So essentially, all the projects that you create, you can host it with Netlify within a matter of seconds. Again, you would sign up for a free account. They're not going to ask you for your credit card. And what you could do is just use this drag and drop option where you run NPM run build first, then drag and drop. And then, of course, you have your project online within a matter of seconds. Nicely done. Hopefully you were familiar with React Basics. And I think this is a perfect time to dive into more interesting and more complex React topics. Now, when it comes to advanced React, a lot of our attention will be spent on something called hooks. And by the way, you can see that by just looking at the names of our upcoming topics. If it has the name use in it, so use state, use effect, and along those lines, that just means that it is certain React hook we will talk about. So why hooks? You see, if all we have is a component with some static data 
or a component with a list. Life is great. But once we want to make our components dynamic and more complex, and of course, as a result, also our app, we will need to use react hooks, which are functions react provides to help us to complete various tasks. For example, adding, removing the items from the list, toggling the modal and fetching the data, just to name a few. There are quite a few hooks out there, but I can honestly say that if you understand only two of them, use state and use effect, you'll be already in extremely good shape. That's why we'll cover them first, have the most number of examples on them, and we'll keep on using them, even if the main topic of the lecture will be some other hook or different subject. As we'll be approaching the end of the section, you might find some repetition, but it was done on purpose only because I definitely would want you to be familiar with those two hooks. So use state and use effect. And in my experience, when it comes to learning, the important stuff is well worth repeating. Now, even though React hooks will be the main focus of this upcoming section, we will cover other useful topics as well, like conditional rendering, forms in React, prop drilling, context API, as well as React Router, all included. So by the end of the section, you can easily build cool and complex React apps. In order to follow along with the upcoming part of the video, you'll need a starter project. And I provide a link at johnsmilk.com. So bravely navigate to johnsmilk.com and then look for the videos page. And in the videos page, of course, we are looking for React. So click on that page. And then, of course, at this point, I haven't uploaded the video. So that's why for me, I can see the JavaScript. But by the time you'll be watching this, of course, there's going to be a big, massive React logo. And then you're looking for this source code link. Click on that. And this is going to direct you to my GitHub, more specifically React Advanced 2020 repo. And once you get there, you are in good shape. And once we have a good idea of what we're going to cover next, I would want to start by getting the starter project. So just follow the link that I provided. And then you can either download zip fork or clone. And I think I'm going to go with clone option. I'm going to navigate back to my desktop. And then I'll zoom in just so you can see. So of course, I'm in terminal and now I'm navigating to a desktop and I'm just going to run git clone. And of course, now I have my repo, then I'll open up the Visual Studio code, drag and drop. Now, my preference is right away set it side by side with a browser. But of course, that is up to you. I'll also have one bigger browser window open as well. So in this case, I'm going to go with new window. And then I'll set it side by side with my text editor. So I'll have browser on a small screen, of course, and also on the big one as well. Then in the Visual Studio Code, first, what we would need to do is install all the dependencies. So we're going to go here with npm and then install. And then I'll right away run the command of npm start, which honestly will spin up the dev server on localhost 3000. And once the dependencies have been installed, and also once the dev server is running, then I'll just open up localhost 3000 on a small screen, as well as the big one. So let me open up one more browser window. So this is going to be a big browser window, of course. And at the moment, of course, there's going to be nothing there on localhost 3000 because the dev server is not running yet. And once the dev server is up and running, you should see on a screen advanced react. And the same thing should be on a small browser window. Again, the URL is localhost 3000. And then at this point, I think I'm going to close the integrated terminal. And I'll start by giving you a overview of the star project, just so we all are on the same page. As far as the starter, a lot of things should look very familiar. Since I used the same create react app boilerplate we used in the previous section. So remember previously when we ran create react app, and then we created our first project. Well, essentially, I did the same thing. But of course, I removed 
and added some files in this case. Now, when it comes to upcoming lectures, in order not to waste your time, I already prepared all the necessary boilerplate. So we just need to focus on the functionality. And the same goes for styles, even though we are not going to use that much CSS, since at the end of the day, it is still tutorial. I did prepare all the CSS for you. So you just need to include classes and you'll be good to go. I also provided the complete source code. So that way you can right away compare it with your results. So you don't have to run around and see where is the error. You right away can look in the final folder and you'll be in good shape. Now, as far as the files and folders, like I said, a lot of things should be very familiar where we have the public. And of course, we have the source. Now we'll do all of our work in the source folder. Now the difference, remember, in the previous section, we worked in the index. Now, in this case, what happens with a boilerplate, they right away set up index.js as a place where they import app component. And then remember that document get element by ID, where essentially we are placing all our functionality into that root div while well, they're doing that by just placing that app component. And I just left it the way it is. Because that way, once you start a brand new application with Create React App, you're not going to be confused. Just remember, it is the same thing. Previously, we just set up all our components in the index.js. In this case, what they're doing is they create everything in the app.js, meaning all the components meet in the app.js file. Then they export as default. Remember, by the end of the tutorial, we talked about exporting and importing. And then in the index.js, they import app as app and then just place it over here. Now, as far as this React strict mode, don't worry about it. This is just for create React app purposes. Now, in the app.js, if you just want to simply test it out, we can change our return. And we can say here heading two, and let's say advanced, advanced React tutorial. And like I said, the idea is exactly the same how we had in the previous section. The difference, of course, previously we placed all our components right here next to the render method. In this case, they have this app, so the root component where all of our components will meet, and then they just render it. Now, when it comes to CSS, like I said, I already prepared, even though there's not that much CSS, I already prepared a little bit of global styling, some fonts and all that good stuff. So if you're interested, of course, be my guest. You can come here and check it out what kind of styling I added. Now, the most important thing is the tutorial folder. So in the tutorial folder, you'll see a bunch of folders, starting with one and then hyphen use state. So what that means is that it's going to be our first topic. And then for each topic, we will have two folders. We'll have the setup folder. So this is where we'll do all of our work. And like I said, I also provided right away a complete source code. So that way, if you don't get the result that you're looking for, then just right away navigate to a final folder, look for the same exact file we're working in, and you'll get your answer. Now, in the next video, I'll show you how we'll be doing importing and how you can right away check out the final. The one thing that I would want to mention, though, is that I saved up on the boilerplate where you'll notice that in all the setup files will right away have the component. Now I'm also right away exporting as default, and I'll talk about it in more detail in the next video. But the idea is that we don't need to create each and every time the file and then the component and then all that annoying stuff. Instead, everything is already right away prepared for you. Then you'll just have to import that particular file in the app.js and then just follow along and do all of your work in this file. So that way we can focus on functionality instead of unnecessary boilerplate. And that is the brief overview of the star application. And I think we're ready to kick things into gear and finally learn some advanced React. Nice. And once we're familiar with a setup, 
course, of course, we will start by looking at the use state hook. Since, like I just mentioned, the use state as well as use effect are going to be most used hooks. However, before we do anything, let me just showcase why we would want to use use state in the first place. Now, this is just going to be a basic example. Please understand that, of course, use state can do way, way more than that. But I think it's going to give you a good idea why using use state hook is necessary as our applications get bigger and more complicated. So the file that we're looking for here is going to be located in tutorial folder. And then we're looking for use state. And then we have the final one. So that is going to be our complete code. And then we have the setup one. So this is where we'll do our work. And the file we're looking for is this error example JS. Now, first, what I would want in the app JS though is to set up the container. Now, why do I want to have a container? Because it's just going to have a little bit of styling. If you navigate to index CSS, you'll notice the container class. And I just added a little bit of styling. So I'll add that container for all my examples. Just please keep in mind, it doesn't affect the functionality. It just affects how the examples are going to look like. So if I navigate back to AppJS, I'm going to wrap all my examples into this container. So what I would want right now is where we have the return. I'm just going to go with div. And then within this div for the time being, just to showcase that nothing will change, I'll place this heading two. So let me move up this heading two. Now, of course, I need to set up a proper return and all of that. And once I do notice, like I said, if we'll just add this class name of container, we'll get a little bit of styling. So essentially, I'll place all our examples in that container. So that way, it's just going to look a little bit better. And then in order to work with our files, we're looking for this error example JS. Now, all of them have been set up as default. So we can name them whatever we would want. Now, in my case, I named them explicitly what we're covering in that particular video. So for example, if this is our example, I went with explicit name. Now, of course, if you want, you can shorten this up in the app.js. That is up to you. In my case, I'll call all of them setup, meaning as we move from lecture to lecture, I'll keep this name of setup. And then the only thing that will change is the file where I'm getting the component. So in this case, of course, I'm looking in tutorial folder, then I'm navigating to use state, and then I'm looking for the setup, like I said, and then I'm looking for the error example. So that's the component I would want to work in. That's why I'm importing into app.js. And then I'll just place it in the container. So I have my setup and I'm good to go. So what you should see on the screen is this text of use state error example. If you see that, that is awesome because that is the file that we will work in. Now, if that is not the text that you see, then of course, make sure that your import is correct. And like I just mentioned already 30,000 times, if you would want to see complete code, you're looking in the same folder in the use state. However, you're looking for the final folder and then error example JS. So the file names will be exactly the same. The difference, of course, is that in here you can see the complete code. So, for example, in the app JS, if you'd want to see the complete code, what you could do is simply go with import again, whatever name, because it is default. So in my case, I'll call this final from and then again, we're looking for tutorial. Then I'm looking for use state. Then I'm looking for final and then error example. So right below the setup, I'm going to go with my final and you'll see the complete code. OK, so this is what we'll build in this project. Now, the reason why I'm showing you that, because that is going to be our setup for the remainder of the advanced tutorial videos where essentially you'll have one setup file and then the final one where you can see the complete code. So if you ever want to run what I have built, 
then of course just import the final so that is going to be coming from the final folder but the files that we're going to be working in are going to be coming from the setup so hopefully this is clear so i can remove my final and finally we can start working in our file in the error js so let me navigate there the error example now of course notice this is the complete one now that's not the one that i want i want error example js where i just have the use state error example and what i would want to build over here well i would just want to set up some kind of logic where once we press on a button we would change the name so what am i talking about well in here i could go with let title so some kind of variable I'll call this random title. And then where I have my JSX, I would want to have some kind of return. So in this case, what I'm going to do is use the React fragment. Again, I just don't want to create this div soup. So I'm going to go with React, a dot, and then fragment. And then within this fragment, let's go with heading two, and I'll look for my title. Remember in JSX, we needed to use the curly braces in order to access the variable. And of course, once I do, I have my random title. Beautiful. Life is great. But what if I were to add a button? So I'm going to go here with button. I'll add type of button as well. And then we'll add a class name. Now, this class is coming from my index CSS. Again, if you want, you can check it over here. And it just adds a little bit of styling. And the class you're looking for is BTN. And let's set up a on click handler. And of course, we'll have to set up a function. So I'll call this handle click function. And within the button, I don't know, let's call this change title. Let's save it. Now there's going to be an error because of course we haven't created a handle click. So let's do that. So const handle and then click. Now that is my function. Beautiful. And now what I would want is to change this title from random people to something else. Now, first, let's just see whether we can access the title. And of course, I'll open up my console. And let's see, what do we have in a console? Once I click change title, of course, I can access the random title. However, the idea was that once I click, I would want to change it to something else. I would want to change it to hello people. So let's try whether we can do that. I'm going to go here with title and then hello people. Now, my question to you is once we click the button, the handle click, do you think the random title will be updated in my component? Again, the question is once we click the button, notice I'm changing the title. So do you think we'll change also the value that we have in the JSX? Well, let's try it out. We have random title. I click on change title and nothing happens. And what's even more interesting that technically you can see in a console that we change this value, correct? Because in here it is title and it is random title. And of course we change it to hello people. Now, once we console log, it is hello people. Now, the problem is that we are not re-rendering the component. So we change the value and we're not re-rendering the component. That's the reason why we cannot see any changes. Now, the second thing is that we have no way to preserve this value in between the renders as well. So essentially, we would want two things. We would want to keep the value between the renders, but also we would want to trigger that re-render and this is where the use state hook comes into play where it will allow us to do just that again very basic example of course you can use use state for more than that but this clearly shows us why we would want to use the use state in the first place all right and once we have covered why we would want to use use state now, of course, let's learn the basics about the use state. And here's what we're going to build. Let me just quickly show you. We're going to go with import. Again, I'll call this final from. 
and then we're looking for tutorial folder and use state then final and then use state basics now since i named it final of course right after the setup we can just go with final close it out and this is going to be our component we have random title and then notice how once we start using use state not only we can change the value and trigger re-render but we can also preserve the value in between the renders again this is just a showcase that you can always take a look at what we're going to build but of course the file that we're looking for is a bit different again i will still call this setup because it's just easier however i'll change the path where i'm looking for the setup folder then in the setup folder i'm looking for use state basics component or file and of course you should see on the screen use state basic example and let me open up the sidebar and i'm gonna navigate over there and essentially use state is a function and it is a function that is coming from react however notice that it is a named import so unlike react this is a named one so we must 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 have the curly braces and then the name needs to be exact where we go with use state now just to prove that use state is a function we simply console log and we write use state and you can clearly see that it is a function beautiful so once that is clear once we know that use state is a function now let's see what this function returns because that is very very important so in here i'll just invoke it and you'll notice something interesting where it returns an array and first thing is going to be undefined essentially this is going to be the state value that we're going to use and the second one is a function now this function will control this value now you're probably wondering okay well why this is undefined well because when we invoke use state we need to pass in default value now keep in mind this value can be a string it could be a number it can be an array it can be an object it can be boolean whatever javascript value you'd want so for example if i'll pass here hello world which you'll see that our value now is a string so that is my default value and then again we have this function and from this point we have multiple ways how we can access that because keep in mind if use state returns an array of course we can assign it to a variable correct so in here i could go with const and then value is equal to my use state again we would need to pass in some kind of default value so for now i'll just pass in number just so you can see that of course we can pass in a number as well and then in order to access the first item in the array we would go with square brackets and then the zero now let me copy and paste and in here i'll set up my function since that is going to be the second thing that i'm looking for so i'm going to be looking for the handler and of course i'll change this value as well where now i'm looking for my function for the second item from my array and uh, if we'll console log if we go for example with a value and a handler you'll notice that the value will be one and then the second value will be that function the function that controls this value now i fully understand that at the moment it might be a little bit confusing don't worry just remember that this handler will be the function that controls the value that we have in our state so in this case of course this is one and then in our first example this was hello world now all of this is beautiful but what i would want is to select all of these and then just comment them out just so you can stay for a reference and if you remember we had array destructuring now what that allows us to do is set up everything in one line where i'm going to go with const and then i would need to come up with a name for my state value so this name could be anything i will name this text just keep in mind you can name this bobby you can name this apple banana whatever you would want 
So I'll name my first value text. So that, of course, will be my state value. And the second thing is my function. So now, of course, I need to name that function. Now, a common convention is using set and then whatever you named your variable. So if you named your state value, for example, text, then you go with set text. If you would set this up as Apple, you go with Apple and then set Apple. Now, again, this is a convention. You can name this taco and burrito. It doesn't matter. And then per the structuring rules, you need to set it equal to your array. Now, of course, our array is coming from use state. Then we need to invoke it. And then we need to pass in whatever, again, is going to be our default value. Now, what is going to be our default value? Well, that will be that random title. And once we have this setup, now let's try it out in our return. Again, we'll have our JSX, of course. Again, I'll go with React Fragment just so we can keep on practicing. And then in here, let's use the heading one instead. And I'll look for my text. So that is my state value. And just to showcase that we can place whatever we would want over here, I can just change it around to a one or 10 or 109, something like that. And then, of course, this value will be displayed. Just keep that in mind that whatever value you would want as default one, you can set it up, whether that is an array, whether that is an object, string, number, boolean, whatever. And of course, once I have these two things, now we would need to come up with the button, correct? The button that can change this value because we saw previously how we were not able to do that. So first, let's come up with that button. And in here, I'll add a class name. We'll say BTN, just so we have a little bit of styling. And we'll do the same way how we'll have a on click. And then we'll pass in handle, handle, and then click. Now within the button, we'll write change title, like so. And again, there's going to be an error where handle click is not defined. And now, of course, let's set it up. I'm going to go with handle click. I'll probably add const over here and then we'll pass in our function. And then in this function, now we'll finally use this set text. And the way it works, we have multiple ways how we can do that, how we can pass the new value. And a little bit later on, we'll look at the function example. But for the time being, let me just go with text and then whatever we'll pass it in here now will be our new value so for example if i would want to change this around to a hello world i just need to pass in that string where if i'll say hello world now what you'll notice that once we click on change title of course we invoke the handle click and then in the handle click we have our set text function so the function that we're getting back from the use state, we get back that function. And then each and every time we'll invoke this function, we can change this value. So there it is. Once I click notice now nicely, I see my hello world. Now, of course, since I don't have any more logic, then every time we'll click after that is just going to be this hello world. But at least we already made a good progress, correct? Because previously we were not able to do that. Now, of course, we are where once we click on a button, we change this value again. We can refresh. We have a random title. And once we click, then, of course, it is going to be a hello world. Now, just to showcase that we can set it up as always to whatever we would want, just like with the default one. If I'll go to 109, you will see that I have random title. The moment I click the button, of course, I have 109. All right. Hopefully that is clear. And now let me just set up a little bit of if and else statements where essentially, depending on whatever value I already have, I'm going to set my new value using set text. And the way I can do that is I can say if, and then I'll check what is the value for the text. And if it is random and then title, then of course, I would want to invoke set text and I would want to set it equal to a hello world. However, if that is not the case, essentially, 
if it is already hello world, well, then I'll just set it back to a random one. So I'll go with set text, then random, and then title. So now you'll notice that we'll have this toggling functionality where I'm changing the title. Now, of course, it is going to change to hello world, beautiful. We trigger re render. And then, of course, again, once we click, we have random title. Awesome. And this is how we can use the use state. Again, it is a function that we get from React. Once we invoke the function, we would need to pass in default value, whatever we would want as far as string number, Boolean, or object or array. And then from this function, once we invoke it, we get an array with two values. We use array destructuring because it is just faster. However, we can also do this manually where we get that particular value and the function that controls that value. And each and every time we'll invoke this function, whatever value we'll pass in now will be that new state value. And of course, in order to access it, just like with normal variables, we just go with whatever name we passed here. Again, please keep in mind, you can name these things however you'd want, but a common practice is using set and then whatever name of the value that you already set it up. And then, of course, each and every time we click the button, notice how we invoke our set text and we keep on changing this state value. Beautiful. And those are the basics of use state hook in react. And before we cover more complicated use state examples, let me just cover some things that relate to all hooks. So this will also relate to all the other hooks we'll learn later. And first, we need to remember that as far as hooks, they will start with this use, whether that is use effect, use state, use callback, use memo, or whatever. So you'll always see this use. And that also applies to whatever hooks we'll create ourselves later on. We must use this use in the beginning. Then the components where we invoke those hooks must be the uppercase. So let me show you the example. If, for example, I'll change this to a state basics, and then this is going to be with lowercase, you'll see a big fat error. So in order to use hook, whether that is use state, use effect, or whatever, the component needs to be uppercase. That is a small gotcha, but a small gotcha that can catch up with you in very random times. Now, also, the hook needs to be in the function or component body. So for example, if you'll move this outside, it's not going to work again there's going to be a big fat error because you need to invoke the hook again, whether that is use state or whichever hook you would want, it needs to be invoked in the function body. And then the last thing is something that we'll take a look at later. And that is that we cannot call the hook conditionally. And I'll show you that with use effect because it's just going to make a little bit more sense. Now, keep in mind, I'm not talking about the function that we're getting back from the hook, Because of course, in this case, yes, we're calling this conditionally, where I'm checking the state value. And then I'm saying, all right, so if the state value is equal to a random title, then I'll invoke my handler function. Keep that in mind. I'm not talking about this function. Yes, this function you can call conditionally. However, what I'm talking about is the fact that I cannot just say if and then some kind of hook inside that is not going to work. And it's going to be easier for me to show you with use effect, because there's going to be a proper example. Again, this applies to all the custom hooks we're going to create ourselves, as well as all the hooks that you can use from react, whether that's use effect, use callback, use state, or all the other hooks. So that was fun. Now let's take a look at more interesting example where our default value, our state value will be an array. And essentially we'll be able to add the items, we'll be able to remove the items as well as clear the state value back to an empty array. 
And in order to see what we're going to create, I'm going to change, of course, my file. So I'll use a different path right now. I'll go for setup. Then I'm looking for use state and then array. And what you should see in a browser is use state array example. Now let's navigate there to that particular file. So what we're looking for is use state array JS. And again, it is located in the setup. Now, in this case, though, I'll change this around. And instead of importing as a named export, I can show you that we also have another option where, again, I would need to come up with those two values. However, I will call them. So in my case, it is going to be people. So that is going to be my array. And then the function will be called set people. So these two things I need regardless. And then in order to invoke use state instead of importing, which is always an option, we can also do it something like this, where we go with react and then use and then state. And like I said, this is where we would pass in that default value. So for example, as far as default value, we could go with empty array. So these are two ways how we can set it up. Either you import or you go with react dot and then use state. Please keep in mind, both of them do exactly the same thing. And that really depends on your preference. In my case, if I know that I will use it just once, most of the time, I'm just lazy and I go with react and then use state. However, if I know that I will invoke it quite a few times in my component, then of course, I just go with import and then use use state or whichever hook name I pick. And then that just saves me a little bit of typing. Again, that is up to you. So for time being, we just have the empty array, which is somewhat okay. But we remember that we can pass whatever we would want. Now, if you'll take a look at the source folder, you'll find data JS. Now in the data JS, we have an array. And I named this data. And then in here we have array of objects, where we have the ID. Remember, we needed to do that. If we're rendering the list, there had to be some kind of unique ID. And then we just have the name, and then value. So john, Peter, Susan and Anna. So what I would want to do right now in the use state array, I already imported the data. So notice the path, I'm looking for data. And then I need to go quite a few levels up, and then look for that data. So I leave one folder second and third, and then eventually, I hit the source. And this is where I'm looking for the data. Again, this is going to be a relative path. So now what I would want is to pass in that data array as my default value. All right, awesome. And then of course, let's work on our return. Now I could go with react.fragment or remember there is a shortcut where if I go with my angle brackets, now essentially I'm creating my fragment and I don't have that div soup. So now what I would want is to iterate over my array. So I go with people, then again, we'll use the map method. And then for each and every person, I would want to return something more meaningful. And first, I guess we can just return a hello. And then we can just double check whether everything worked. Because of course, that is very, very important. If I don't have access to each and every person, essentially, if I don't have access to the object, well, kind of doesn't make sense, correct? So if we console log, Beautifully, what I could see is john, Peter, Susan, and Anna, and then I have four hellos. So now, of course, let's do something a bit more meaningful, where what I would want right now is to destructure these two things, the ID, and then I'm also looking for the name. Now that is coming from the person. And then I would want to return a div. Now remember, when we render a list, we need to have this key prop and we need to pass in that unique value. Now I'll add a little bit of styling here, where I'm going to say item, again, that has nothing to do with functionality is just for the styling. And then let's set up a heading four with a value of name, just so we can see the name. And then eventually, we will set up our button. So awesome. Notice, I have my list. Again, I used use state hook, then I provided 
some default value, which in my case was an array. I could have added the empty array, but in my case, I already prepared an array in data.js, and it is a array of objects. Then, of course, I invoked it, and then I'm getting two things. I'm getting whatever default value I have, so that is my state value, and then I have the function that controls it. Okay, good. And then, of course, just like with any other variable, I can just access it, and then I'm iterating over like we have covered already before, where we're iterating over, and then we display for each and every item this div, and then we're just destructuring ID and name. But of course, now let's make it a bit more interesting. What if I would want to come up with a button that just deletes all the items? So right next to the people, I'll set up my button. I'll add here a class name of BTN, and we'll set up our on click. Now, if you want, you can set up here a function reference. And this is something that we'll do later once we would want to remove a specific item. But for now, I just want to showcase that, of course, you can invoke this function directly in here where we're setting up the on click. But the gotcha is going to be in this case, since we need to pass in the value, we'll have to set up a arrow function as well. Remember, that was one of the cases that I showcased before. So in this case, let me write clear items. So that is the text in my button. And let me showcase that if we go with set people, of course, we would need to pass in that new value, correct? And if I will want to set it up to an empty array, that just means that I will clear out all the items. Now, the problem is going to be that we right away invoke it. And that's not what we're looking for. So what we would want is only to invoke it once we click on it. And remember, the solution was to set up our arrow function first. So once we do that, then we'll have our button. And now what this button is doing? Well, it is calling a set people function. And then remember, the only thing we need to do is to pass in that new value. So what is the new value in this case? Well, since I would want to clear all the items, I just pass in the empty array, correct? So now let's see. And of course, everything works. So now we remove all the items. Again, that is something you need to remember where, yes, you can call directly this function. You can set up a handler like we did previously and like we will do here where we would want to remove a single item. Yeah, that is definitely an option. We could have used the reference instead, but just keep in mind that, yes, you always can also use the inline function where you just need to set up a arrow function and then call whatever function you have in the use state. That is always also your option. And now, of course, let's work on removing that individual item. So in this case, I would want to first create a button, I guess, right next to the heading four. Let's go with button. Again, we'll have on click. And in this case, I will set up a function reference. So here, let's set up a curly braces. And then we'll have, again, our arrow function, because we will invoke our reference here. So say remove item. And now I would want to pass in the ID. And then I'll say remove. Let's say that. And at the moment, it complains, well, you haven't created this remove item. So now, of course, we need to work on our function, where we say remove item. And then this remove item is going to be looking for the ID. Because of course, for each and every item, I can grab that ID. And then notice how we set up the arrow function. And we right away invoke the remove item with that specific ID. So essentially what happens, this doesn't run each and every time we render our app. In fact, it runs only when we click on a button. And this is going to be that use case that I talked about before when we talked about the events where you must have this arrow function. Each and every time you are invoking this function, you must have the arrow function because you would want this to run only when you click on a button. And in this case, you have no other options. Since you are passing some kind of arguments, you are invoking it. So that's why you always need to return it 
from the arrow function. So we have our remove item. The remove item is always going to be looking for the ID. And now let's set up the functionality. So in the remove item, what I would want is to filter out the array. So all the items that don't have the matching ID, I would want to leave them in a list. However, the one that has the matching ID, that one, of course, I would want to remove it. Now, I can say set people and then set up the functionality right here in the parentheses. That is always an option. But as far as tutorials and projects, I always like to be a bit more explicit where I'm going to create new variable. So for example, let new and then people, and that is going to be equal to my people state value. So my original array, then filter, so now I'm filtering. And then for each and every person that I have, I would just want to remove the one that has the matching ID. So if I go here with person ID, Remember, I'm filtering out the array, correct? And then each and every object is there. And then I'm saying, hey, listen, if the person ID matches the ID that I'm passing in, then of course, remove it. And the way I can do that, I can say exclamation point and then equals to an ID. So essentially, the logic is following where we pass in the ID, then we filter out our array and all the items whose IDs are not patching to whatever we're passing in, those ones are returned in new people. Now, if you want, you can console log it, but in my case, I'll pass in the, the set people. So I have my function, and like I said, I can pass in whatever I would want. So of course, this is that new array that we're getting back, and I'm just passing in into the set people. And what you'll notice right now that we have our buttons, and the moment I click, I remove that specific item. Again, I click on John, I remove John, Peter, and Anna. And of course, once I refresh, I have all my items back. Now, if I want to remove all the list, of course, I can do it also as well. A few takeaways. We can set up this logic right here where we're passing in the new value. Because remember, with filter, we are getting a new array anyway at the end of the day. So in my case, I just like to go a bit more explicit where I'm creating a new variable and only then I pass it into the set people. And the second one is going to be pretty common gotcha where since we have either function reference in here or we would want to invoke, of course, the function that we're getting back from the use state, since in both cases we're passing in the argument we're also invoking it. And that's why we always need to set up the arrow function. Otherwise, it will run right away. So essentially, when we render our app, and then it will invoke it. And then in that case, we are not running it when we're clicking on a function, we are running it the moment our app runs. And that's not what we're looking for. But those would be the basics how we can use use state hook with an array. Not bad, not bad. Once we have covered how we can use use state with array, I think it also makes sense if we would take a look at how we can use with an object because there is a gotcha. So again, we're looking for the setup folder, then we're looking for use state object. And once we save, we should see the use state object example. Now, of course, we just need to navigate to that particular file, which is in the setup again, and then use state object js and of course i would want to use my hook so let's go with two values i'm going to go with person and then set person and that is going to be equal to my use state and then i'll pass in that object directly so again that is something that i would want you to keep in mind where you can pass in the variable like we just did with an array or we can pass in directly so in this case i'll pass in the object where it's going to be a name. Now that name will be Peter, then age will be 24. So let's do that. And then lastly, we'll have some kind of message, message, and I'll set this up as a string. So beautifully, I have my object. So let's call this a random and then message. So once we save, of course, we are in good shape. And if we want to console log the person, of course, we'll be able to see our object. 
Nice. Not bad at all. Now, the thing is, what happens if we change this value? And what gotcha should we looking for? Because with array, it was somewhat straightforward, where in one case, we just wiped out all the data when we set it back to an empty array. And then the second thing, we had the function that was just returning a new array. Now, this is going to be a little bit different because we'll have some values that we would want to preserve. Now, let me showcase what am I talking about. I'll start with my return where I'll set it back to a fragment. And then in here, let's type few heading threes. So first we'll look for person name, person name. And notice, since it is an object, of course, I have my value. I'm accessing my state value, and then I'm just looking for the property. Now I will copy and paste, and we'll just change these ones around, where of course we'll have age here. We'll have also a message and let's save. And there it is, Peter 24 and a random message. And eventually I would want to have a button that changes the message again, button, then class name for the styling. So BTN and then on click. And in here, let's call the change message, change message, a function that we haven't created yet. So in the button, let's write change message and let's come up with that function. So in here, const change message. Now that is my function. I'm not looking for any arguments in this case, but I would want to invoke my set person. Now, what you'll notice though, that for example, if I would want to change the message to a hello world, the problem is going to be that when we invoke this function, essentially, we wipe out all the values. Remember, I told you, when we set up this value, the state value, it can be anything that you want to want. So even though in the beginning, we went with an object, if we invoke the function that changes the state value, and we pass in the string, this will be a string. So originally, we had an object, and we're treating it like an object where we go with person name, person age, and then the message. However, here, I just wipe out the data. And then I say, you know what? It is going to be a hello world. Now you could make an argument. All right. But what if we would set this up as an object and I'll pass in the property of message. So in this case, I'll say message is equal to a hello world. And technically you are correct where now we will change only the message. But again, rest of the data gets wiped out. So what is the solution? Well, solution is using a spread operator, where if you remember with spread operator, we first copy the values, and then we come up with whichever value we would want to override. So how we would fix this in this scenario, I would go with dot, 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 and then person and then comma. And then I'm just going to say, you know what, leave these two values, the name and age, as they are and overwrite only the message. So this is the gotcha. For example, if you're using the object, then you need to make sure that you always, always use the spread operator, or there's also some other older setup where essentially you copy the old values from the state value, and then you just decide which one you would want to choose. In this case, we want to change the hello world. So of course, once we click, Notice how we also change only the message. All right, that is clear. But as you're looking at our setup, you're probably wondering, okay, but why do we have to even bother with an object in the first place? Can we set up three separate state values? And then whichever we would want to change, of course, we would use that handler method. Well, let's try it out, but I can right away spare you the cliffhanger and said that, yeah, that is essentially what you can do. So in here, I'm going to go with name and then set name. So I'm going to be somewhat original where I'm not going to go with a wild name for my handler function. And then again, I'm looking for the same thing, Peter, and then I'll just copy and paste and we'll change these values around where now we have age and then we're looking for set age and the value will be 24. 
And then the last one, of course, is going to be my message. So we go with message set message that is going to be my function. And then as far as the original value, what we passed in here, we said random message. Now, of course, in this case, we are not dealing with object anymore. So we have these state values. So one by one, of course, we would need to access them. So now I'm looking for name, then I'm looking for a person. And then lastly, I'm looking for the message. And when we talk about this change message, well, we can either right away call set message here on click. Just remember that, of course, we'll have to set up the inline because we're passing in the argument. Or since we already have the handler, I can simply pass here and say set and then message. And we would want to change it, of course, to a hello world. So once we set that up, notice once you click, of course, I have my value. So essentially, what I'm trying to say is that there is no rule that prevents you from setting up as many state values as you would want. So instead of going for one giant object, you can set up multiple smaller state values where you have just a single value and then a function that controls it. However, if you do decide going with an object and there's going to be some use cases where object might make a little bit more sense, then always, always, always remember that you need to make sure that you preserve these old values and a nifty way of doing that is using a spread operator, where essentially we copy the properties from the previous object, and then we just choose whichever we would want to override. And of course, in this case, it was a message. So we went from random message to a hello world. However, yes, there is an alternative where you can set up as many state values as you would want, just by calling your state, your state passing in default value, and then you have that single state value as well as the handler function for that state value. Not bad, not bad. I think we're progressing nicely with our use state examples. And in our last example, I would want to showcase how we can work with numbers. And not only how we can work with numbers, but how we can set up a functional update form. You see, all this time we have been using the value update form. Now, what that means is where we have this function, the set text or whatever set function we get back from use state, we just call the function and then we pass in that new value. And that essentially sets our state equal to that new value. However, there's also a method of passing in the function. And in the following videos, I'll show you why that is important. But first, I would want you to head back to AppJS and then import again component. You can call it whatever you'd want from use state, then setup folder. And then the file name is use state counter. So essentially, that is going to be our last file. However, I'll split this up in multiple videos because I would want you to get a better understanding of what we're doing. So once you import this file, then just navigate there and you should see on a screen use state counter example. And you can probably already guess that we are going to create a counter, but not just a simple counter. We'll have one with straight up values and the second one will use the function. Now we'll start with our return first though, where it's not going to be a heading two. Again, we're going to go for a fragment. So we don't need to overpopulate everything with divs. And then once we have our fragment, then I would want to go with a section. Now add a little bit of styling right here, where I'm going to say margin, and then that is going to be equal to four REMs, and then zero. And then within the section, let's just go with heading two. And I'm going to call this a regular and then counter. So you should see something like this on the screen. Now after the heading two, I'm going to set up my value. So at the moment, of course, we don't have anything, but we will use use state. And you know what? I don't want to set up a state value because that should take us a second since we already know how to do that. So I'm going to go with value, then set value, and that is equal to a use state. 
And then as far as my initial value, well, that is going to be a number of zero. And now in heading one, I can just simply target my value. And surprise, surprise, of course, I have the zero. And now let's add three buttons, one for increase, one for reset, and one for decrease. So I guess we'll start with a decrease one. Let's go with button and then class name that will be equal to a BTN. And then let's just write here decrease and we'll just copy and paste the same button. So one, two, and then of course, three buttons total. And we just need to change these values around where we're going to go with reset as well as the increase. Let's just go here. And again, I know I have covered this before, but I'll set up two ways how we can click on a button. One is going to be with a function here. So where we reference it, for example, with reset and the decrease and increase is going to be with inline functions. Just showcase again that you always have multiple ways how to set it up. And essentially, it is up to you. Now, there's going to be some cases where you definitely need to use the inline when you are actually passing in. But then in some cases, you can simply use the reference and you're good to go. So we have our buttons. And like I just said, we'll go with on click and then set up a inline function here where we go with set value. And now I'll use the old value. I'll say value, whatever it is. Of course, at the moment, it is zero. And then I'll say minus one, because of course, the button is decrease. And we'll do the same thing here with an increase. And we'll copy and paste. Now, of course, now the value should be plus one. Correct. So once we click on a button, I would want to invoke my set function, and then whatever is the value, and then plus one. And like I just said, for the reset, let's set up a reference, just so we are all on the same page that we have multiple ways how we can get the same result. So I'm going to go here with reset, I'll have my function. And then within this function, I'm just going to say set value, again, my set function, and I'll set it equal to zero. And now where I have the reset, I'm just going to go with on click. And I just need to reference the function. So in this case, of course, it is a reset. And then let's test it out. So once we click, of course, notice how we can nicely increase, we can also decrease, and then we can reset. So again, this is a way of passing directly the value in our set function, where we pass in the value. And then the moment we do that, of course, that is our new state value. And in the following video, I would want to cover the functional updater form, where essentially we pass in a function, and why would want to do that in the first place. Nice. And once we have our simple counter, let's take a look at how we can pass in the function in our set function, and why would want to do that. So first, we'll set up a counter, However, this is going to be more complex counter. However, the JSX pretty much is going to be the same. The only difference is that we're not going to use that many buttons. So what I would want to do is grab all my section, copy and paste. I'll still keep the margin that stays the same. Let's call this a more complex or complex counter, more complex counter value will still be the same. And as far as the buttons, we'll delete most of them. And let's just say here button, and it's going to be just a increase button. So let's say here button for the class for the styling. And then as far as the text inside the button, let's just say increase later. And now I would want to set up a function that is going to be a complex increase. Why am I calling this a complex increase? Because I would want to add a little bit of the timeout. So essentially, once I click, there should be some delay. So once we click, we'll set up two seconds delay. And only then the value should be updated. And in the process, we'll see why we would want to use that functional updater form. Now, let's first set up the on click. Let's say on click over here. And that is going to be equal to a complex. 
and then let's call it my function the increase complex increase over here now of course we do need to create that function because now we're just referencing so let's say const and then complex increase that is my function and it's not going to be looking for any arguments however in here like i said i don't want to simply call my set value what i would want is to go with set timeout and then remember in the set timeout we needed to pass in two things a callback function which is going to run of course in a certain amount of time in our case that is going to be two seconds and then in here we just pass in that value that two seconds value we have our set timeout we have the callback function that is going to run in two seconds just remember that as far as the time we are passing here the milliseconds that's why for two seconds we are going to pass in 2000 and then within the callback function this is where i would want to call my set and then value because that is my function now in this case again i'm going to go with a simple way where we have the value directly in our set function so in my case i'm going to go with set value and then value plus one and now million dollar question do you think once you click three four five whatever times that will right away update after those two seconds each and every time or there's going to be an issue and you can probably already guess since we're setting up the whole example that there has to be a gotcha so let's try it out what i'm going to do right now is click three times and the moment you click you notice that yeah after two seconds something happens but essentially i have clicked only once meaning my value only increased by once so why is that happening well let's think about it so we're grabbing here the value correct but we need to understand that this set function is asynchronous so what happens is that for example i click three times and all of these three times it thinks that the value is zero or in this case if i'll click it right now of course it's going to think that the value is one so again i can click three times and yeah it's going to increase but again only by one because all those three times when we call this set value we'll still be looking for that old value meaning two one or whatever so essentially we're not using the current value in a state because what should happen is each and every time we click we grab that previous value that was just right there before and then we update and this is the case where of course we would want to use that functional approach now how does that work and by the way i'll leave this for your reference just so you can have it later and the way it works we go with set value and then instead of passing in directly that new value that we would want we pass in the function now what's really interesting about this function that as a parameter it gets that old state value so right before the update now what is really really important that it gets that current one and you'll see that in a second so in this case it gets the one that is actually current not the one that is called for example two seconds ago no it gets the current one so of course in this case what we can do is we can increase and you'll see how our values update right away and since it is a parameter you can call it whatever you want but pretty common convention is going with prev state or pre value whatever you would want and then whatever you're going to return from this function is now the new value now this is very very important because if you leave this undefined then of course your whole functionality will break now i know what you're thinking you're like well why would i ever leave this undefined well also keep in mind that you can start setting up here some kind of conditions based on something and a small gotcha is that if you will return undefined meaning if you won't return anything and we know already that in javascript functions return undefined then your whole functionality might break so just be careful when you're setting up this function whatever you'll return from this function will be that new state value and if it is undefined well then it's going to be a problem so in this case what i would want is to go with prev state so whatever is my parameter and then 
plus one. And now what you'll notice is that if I click, I don't know, 10 times, it's going to wait for that first one. And then, of course, right after that, notice how we nicely increase the function, meaning the value. And it is happening because in this case, we are getting that correct old value. So right before the update. Previously, when we used this one, no, we were not getting the correct value because if I clicked, for example, three, four or whatever times, I was all the time getting the same value that is when I call all my functions. In this case, it gets the current one, the one that is right before the update. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, okay, why we haven't used the function before? Because let me tell you right away that yes, you can use this setup for all the previous examples that we used before. And you'll see some people that prefer that type of method. Now, it is not set in stone. Of course, in this case, you have to use it because, of course, it wouldn't make sense. We saw the error that we we're getting. However, in some cases, the ones that we covered before, you can use the value way of doing that, where you just pass in the value. But just so we all are on the same page, let me change this around to, for example, I don't know, final one. Now, in this case, I'm going to look for array example, and we'll reformat a little bit just so you understand that, yes, you can use function in any of the examples that we covered, whether that is this one, whether that is the second one with array or with an object. And you might see some people who prefer doing that way. Now, whichever way you choose is up to you. Some people choose to use all the time function. Some people just use it whenever it is definitely necessary, which of course would be this case. And the way we're going to do that is simply we'll change this around. I'll say that I'm going to be looking for the final one in this case. Now, keep in mind that, of course, how we'll delete it, meaning I'll leave the final that was there before. I just want to showcase that, of course, we can use the functional approach as well. So I'm going to go with use state here. Then I'm going to go with final this case, and I'm going to do the array example. And since I changed this around, I'm going to go with final here. Now that is my array. Remember, the functionality should still work where we can remove one item, where can we can clear all of them. And now let's navigate to that final one. Again, you don't have to do it with me. But in my case, I'm just going to showcase that, of course, we can refactor this using the functional approach. Well, remember, we use the set people. Now what I'm going to do is just instead of the new people, we'll say here, yeah, that we will pass in the function. Remember, whatever we return from this function is going to be that new value. And if we really needed to or wanted to, I guess we can just set up the whole functionality here within this function. So what I'm going to do is just grab everything that we currently have within the remove item and move it to the function within the set people. Now, in this case, again, we're not really depending on that value, but just to showcase that, of course, we can use it. I will go with people. So that is going to be my new, or I'm sorry, the old value that is coming from the state. And of course, I now filter it. Or you know what? Let's just say old people. Old people. And we will refactor it a little bit. So old people. Now again, we filter it. And then whatever we return, that is going to be our new value. So once I save, notice how I can still remove the item correctly like I did before. However, in this case, of course, we're using this functional approach where, again, we're getting the parameter that is our old state value. So right before we're updating, or you can maybe also say the current value of that state. And then whatever we return from this function is going to be that new state value. And just to showcase where you can set up a bug, for example, if I say that I don't have the return, so if I'll comment this out, you'll notice that the first time I'll remove something, 
I just have the bananas happening in my application. Why? Well, because now from this function, I'm setting up my people, my state value to be undefined. That's why it is very, very important for us to always return something from this function and that something will be that state value. Again, just to reiterate, we have multiple options. We can either pass in the value, however, there's going to be some cases or there's some people who prefer using functional approach all the time where you can pass in the function in your set function. And then you can have the parameter and that parameter will be that current state or previous state right before the update. And then you can set up some kind of functionality, whatever you would want. And then whatever you will return from that function will be that new state value. While spending time in Tutorialville is nice, you'll only get better if you start applying the concepts we just covered by building something cool. That's why I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to check out the React project video where we do just that. More specifically, you're looking for project number one, the birthday reminder. If you want to see some of the projects we're going to build in the projects video, just navigate to react projectnetlifyapp Now it is still work in progress at the time when I'm recording this video. I only have one project, but don't worry. By the time you'll be watching this video, of course, there's going to be more projects. And I purposely structured them in a way where we build the easier projects first. And then as our topics in tutorial are getting more complex, we right away have the corresponding project that emphasizes the knowledge we just learned. And then if you want to check out the apps, just hover over the card and of course, click it. And then this is going to be the app that we're going to build. Now, I also would like to mention that if you're interested in more corresponding projects for the remaining of the topics in tutorial project, navigate to read me markdown file. And in here you'll find the project that relate to the topic. So like I said, once you learn use state, I would highly encourage you to go and work on birthday reminder. Then once you learn use effect and conditional rendering, of course, there's going to be some project that you can practice on. Again, this is still work in progress because as I'm recording, I only have two projects done. But then by the time you'll be working on the react tutorial, there's going to be more projects that correspond to the topics. And I also want to let you know right away that some topics won't have the corresponding project, for example, prop drilling. So keep that in mind, just follow the roadmap in the readme. And I'll also leave here the link for the project video, as well as the link is going to be available in the description of this video. Not bad, not bad. We're done with the first part of our tutorial, the use state hook. Hopefully you completed the project as well, because it will help solidify all the knowledge that we're learning in tutorial, because at the end of the day, we can stay in tutorial will for remaining of the days. But if you won't know how to apply that knowledge, as far as building projects, it is going to be somewhat useless. So even though it's not mandatory, technically, you can just keep on going through the tutorial. I would suggest every time we are done with some specific tutorial part, just go ahead and do the project that I'm suggesting. Because at the end of the day, if you won't know how to apply them to build the projects, well, then we can sit in tutorialville all day long, but it's not going to make much sense. And our second tutorial topic is going to be the second most used talk. So like I mentioned previously, the use state and use effect are going to be most used hooks. And now we finally arrived at the second hook, the use effect. An official explanation of use effect hook is following where it allows you to do the side effects. Now, before you freak out, and frantically 
start searching for urban dictionary essentially when we talk about side effects we talk about any work outside of the component now that work could be changing document title that could be signing up for subscription that could be fetching data that could be setting up a event listener and stuff along those lines so every time you think of use effect think of work outside of the component and similarly to our first topic of course we do have the folder in tutorial and we're looking for the second folder the name is use effect and then of course again we have the final folder where we have complete code and then we have a setup folder where we will set up our examples and the file that we're looking for is this use effect basics so what i would want you to do first is in the app js again come up with a name in my case it's going to be a setup just so you know that we are working in a setup folder and then you're looking for tutorial you're looking for use effect folder then the setup and then the file name is one hyphen use effect and then basics and once you render the component you should see in the screen use effect basics and once that is done of course let's navigate to the file again let me reiterate it is in tutorial then use effect then setup and then use effect basics js so that's the file we're looking for and just like with use state we have two ways how we can set up our hook we can either import it and notice again it is a named import or remember how we did react dot and then use effect so that is also an option now by default use effect runs after every render so each and every time we re-render a component use effect will run so that is going to be by default and then there's two more comments that i will cover the cleanup function and second parameter however it is going to be more important in the later videos so first let's set up i guess some kind of use effect so we have our function body again we go with use effect and then the way use effect works is we pass in the callback function so we have use effect so that's the hook and then within this callback function whatever functionality will place will run after every render and just to showcase that let me go with log and i'll say render component here and then i will log as well uh call use effect so i'll go here call use effect like so and then if we'll open up the console what you should see is a render component so we have that and then of course we have the call use effect so as you can see once we render the component we also call the use effect now the reason why you see this render component twice is simply because in the setup in the index.js they have this react strict mode so if i'll move this out and if i'll remove it you'll see that only once so basically that is their setup so as you can see now we have only render component once so if you're wondering why you'll see once in a while the render component twice essentially whatever we place as far as the function body it is because of the strict mode all right so let me close the sidebar right now and let's talk about the use effect so at the moment we have only simple console log and by the way yes even the console log is considered a side effect i know it sounds funny but that is true and once we run the side effect well what we would want to do for example i would want to change the title the document title because at the moment i have react app can we do that well let's try it out i think i'm going to close the console for now and i think i'm going to come up with a button so in my jsx i'll set up a button where essentially we click on a button then we increase the value and then we will set up a new document title that shows the messages let's say new messages and of course the value will be equal to whatever is the amount of times we clicked on a button so here let's do this way we'll go back to a react fragment and then in here 
we'll type out heading one where eventually there's going to be a value. And then let's go right away with the button class name btn just for styling and on click we will increase the value now of course we haven't used the use state yet so let's go here with const and then value then set value function set value and that is equal to use state and again we'll start with a zero and of course once we click on a button what i would want is to increase that value by one now I'm not relying on the previous value, so I will just pass in the new value in the set value. And here, let's just right click me, click me where we have the button. So of course, now I have the value. And if you'll notice, the moment I click, a couple of things are happening. So in my console, each and every time I click, I'll have that render component. And then I'll have that call use effect so each and every time we click this is exactly what is happening why is that happening because every time we click the button we invoke set value correct now what happened with the use state use state did two things it preserved the value between the renders and then the second one it triggered a re-render so every time I click on a button, I'm essentially running my use effect. Because remember, by default, use effect will run after every render. So each and every time we re-render the component, we are running essentially this use effect hook. That's why in a console we can see call use effect, call use effect, call use effect. Now, of course, let's do some more interesting side effect where not only I would want to console log, but I would want to go with document and then title. And that is going to be equal to a template string. And I'll say new messages. And in this case, I'm going to use parentheses. Then I would want to grab my state value. And what you'll notice that the moment we render the component, of course, we call the use effect. We can see that in console. But I can also see it here where I have the new messages. Notice I have new messages and now I'm using my state value, which of course is zero. But now every time we click, notice how we're updating the value here. We're calling the use effect after every render. And of course, the functionality that is within the use effect also runs because now I have document title and now new messages is three, four, and each and every time I increase. Also, my title changes as well. Now, again, just to reiterate, use effect is used when we want to set up side effects, and that is some work outside of the component. So think data fetching, think listening for events, think signing up for subscriptions and stuff along those lines. And then by default, it will run after every render. And the way it works, we pass in the callback function. And then whatever functionality we set up within that callback function will run after every render. Now, this is nice. So we're updating our document title each and every time we click on a button. And of course, we do that using the use effect. However, what if we would want to change our functionality a little bit around? where what if I wouldn't want to showcase that I have zero messages? What if I would want to do that only when essentially I have value bigger than zero? So I only would want to showcase that if I have the actual messages. So what I'm trying to say is I would only want to run it when my value is bigger than zero. Because at the moment, notice, of course, we render the component. And then since use effect, runs after every render well of course we right away do the functionality that is within the use of it and our initial thinking would be something like this where if value is bigger than zero then of course we would want to run use effect sounds pretty reasonable right but remember seems like eternity ago 
when I talked about general rules of hook, I said that we cannot, we cannot place hooks as far as conditionals. So this won't work. We right away have a big fat complaint because we cannot call hooks conditionally. And at that time, I said that it doesn't make sense for me to place a use state in the conditional. However, I will do that once we get to a use effect. And of course, we have finally arrived at the use effect example, which technically would make sense to place it in the conditional. However, we cannot do that because of the rules of the hooks. So just keep that in mind. Now, the question, of course, is, well, how we can fix that. And one of the ways how we can do that is by setting up if and else inside of the callback function. So the point of this video is to showcase that even though you cannot place hooks in the conditional, similarly, how we work with a set function where we set up a conditional and then depending on a value, we called the set function with some specific value. The same thing we can do in the use effect where inside of that callback function, yes, we can set up a if and else statement. So how is that going to look like? Well, in here, I could say if value is bigger than one, only then I would want to update document title. So what happens? Notice on the initial render, nothing happens, even though we still call this use effect. So we still call it. However, in the use effect in the callback function, we have a conditional where I'm checking the value. And I only would want to update document title if the value is bigger than one. So on our initial render, nothing happens. However, once I click the button, now, of course, the value is one. So again, nothing happens. So I guess in this case, we can either look for bigger or equals. And you'll notice how now once the actual number is one, then of course, I'm also updating right away the title because it matches my condition. Hopefully that makes sense where we cannot place the hooks in the conditionals, something we already covered before. However, as far as setting up the conditionals within the callback function, yes, we can definitely do that. And it is not against the rules. So in the previous video, we covered how we can set up a conditional inside the use effect callback function. However, question still remains. Is this the only possible setup where our use effect runs after every render? And by default, yes, that is the case. However, you can also notice the two comments that I left here. One is the cleanup function, something we'll cover in the next video. And now I'd want to talk about the second parameter. So what on earth is that? And essentially, second parameter is something that we can add here as far as the use effect. So we have our function. So that is the functionality that will run every time we'll call the use effect. But as far as the second argument, we can also pass it here a array. And that is the array of dependencies. So essentially, that is called a list of dependencies. And if we leave this blank, that just means that it will only run on the initial render. And now we'll notice something interesting, where as far as our logic, it technically is looking for the value if it is bigger or equal than one. Correct. So it will run on the initial render. And then we have our if statement, of course. So essentially, once we save, this shouldn't update the title originally, right? Because we have our if condition. However, we did call it. I can clearly see that. Yes, we have call use effect. That is, of course, coming from the console log. Now, the first time I click, notice something interesting. Where I clicked, I updated the value. But since I have that second argument, I have that dependency list, and I have nothing in there, essentially, it is empty. It only runs on the initial render. And that is something very, very important that you should remember. So if you only want that use effect to run on the initial render, 
you just add that second argument and you would pass it as a empty array. That just means that it will run on the initial render. Now, the second question probably is, well, can we add more stuff in there? Because it's fine. All right. It runs on the initial render, but maybe I would want to run it each and every time I change some kind of value. Now, what that value could be over here, we could maybe run it each and every time we update that value. So let's try it out. So in here, in the dependency array, we just pass in whatever name is for our dependency. So in this case, of course, it is the value. If it would be text, you would pass in text and hopefully you get the gist. So now once I save it again, it runs on the initial render. That is beautiful. But now you'll notice that will also run once we increase the value. So once we increase the value, we change something about this dependency. And then the moment we change something about that value, of course, then we trigger use effect to run one more time. Since in the dependency array, we have this value. So each and every time we'll change something about this value, essentially, we will run the use effect as well. So that's something to remember where by default, if you have no dependency array, the use effect will run each and every time the component gets re rendered, including the initial render, then if we set up the second parameter, the dependency array, as far as the empty list, meaning empty array, then of course, it will run only once we render the component. And then as we start adding different values here, as far as different dependencies, then each and every time that dependency will change if it is added to an array, then also use effect will run. And one more thing that I would want to add is that you can have as many use effects as you'd want. So for example, in this case, we have one use effect that will run on the initial render and also when the value changes, but nothing stops me from setting up another one. And then again, I have my callback function. And in this case, I will just set it up to be on the initial render. Now I'm not going to do much. I'm just going to go with simple console log and I'll say hello world. And what you'll notice is that, yeah, it runs on the initial render, just like the previous use effect that we have. However, it won't run the second time. So each and every time I'll click on a button, you'll notice that use effect, the second one with hello world doesn't run because the value is not in the dependency list. Hopefully that makes sense. And now we can talk about the cleanup function. Not bad, not bad. We're done with use effect basics. And now let's take a look at the cleanup function and why we'd want to use it. And first I would want to change the files. So all this time we were working in use effect basics. And now, of course, I would want to navigate to app.js. And then I'm still looking for the setup folder. But now I'm looking for the file number two, use effect cleanup. Again, it's still going to be a setup since I didn't change the name. And what you see on the screen is use effect cleanup. Now, of course, let's navigate to that particular file. So again, not the final one, we set up one. And in here, what I would want is to check for the width of the window. So we're still using use effect. All that is good. But I would want to check the size of the window. And we can do that by setting up the event listener on the window object. Now, first, let's set up some use state value. So again, notice we have imported use state and use effect. And what I'm looking for here is const. Now I'll name this size and set size. So set size, and then we'll use the use state. That is our hook. And then in order to get the width of the window, we're going to go with window and then the property is inner width. Now, if you would want a console log, you can just go with console log and check the size and you should see some value over here. So let me open up the console. And of course, it tells me here that is 484. Now, of course, it's not going to change at the moment. We haven't set up the functionality, but 
that is going to be the whole idea where we set up the event listener on the window. And as the size of the window changes, so does the value. Now, first, let me open up a bigger browser window because it's going to be easier to operate. So I'm going to go here with localhost 3000. And of course, I still have the same setup. Now, in this case, though, of course, the value should be different, correct? Because of course, the window is bigger. So as you can see, it is 1231. So now what I would want to do is to set up a some kind of return. So I guess again, we'll go with a fragment first. And then let's type a heading one, we'll say window. And then let's write heading two. And heading two will be looking for that size. So first, let's access the state value. And then let's add the pixels. So we should see here window and then whatever is the value. And of course, it should match exactly what we have in the console. And now let's set up a event listener on the window. And for that case, we will use the use effect. So we're going to go over here, we'll say use effect. And then in the use effect, what I would want, of course, is to pass in my callback function. Yeah, that is true. And then within that callback function, I will want to add the event listener on the window. So first, I'll be listening for resize event. That's number one. And then we need that callback function. So essentially, a function that will run each and every time the event will take place. So the resize one. And in this case, I think I'll call this check size. So let's write check size. Now the thing is, of course, we need to create that particular function. So let's create it, we'll say check size. And as far as the function, it will all the time update the size. So I'll write here set size, and then whatever is the value, get the inner width. So what we're doing here is we have the use effect, we have the callback function, and we're setting up the event listener on a window. And each and every time this event will take place, the resize one, we will invoke the check size function. And as far as check size, well, we just call set size, and then we get the current width of the window. So let's see whether this is going to work. So the moment, of course, this is 1463. Now let's see whether we can update it. And everything works nicely, correct? So we can make it bigger, we can make it smaller. And each and every time I'm resizing the window, I'm getting the correct value. Because again, we have the event listener, we're getting the values, and everything is beautiful. Or let me throw you a mind grenade. What if we will go to elements, then we'll check event listeners, and then we'll check for the resize one. Now, what do you think? How many we'll have there? We should have one, correct? Now, does that look like one? No, it doesn't. And the problem with this one is that eventually we'll just have a memory leak, where the moment your app gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and if you have a bunch of components that are setting up these event listeners left and right, it will cause huge problems. So there has to be a way where once we, of course, exit, then we remove that event listener. Now, first, we need to understand, well, why is that happening here? Well, we have the use effect, correct? We have the window listener. Now, in the callback function, what are we doing over here? What do you think? We have set size, correct? Now, what is the set size doing? It is triggering the re-render, correct? Because the moment we invoke set size, we update the value as far as the state value, as far as the size. And what was use state doing? It was preserving the values and it was triggering the re-render. So each and every time we call this callback function, meaning each and every time we resize the window, we also trigger the re-render. So the moment we trigger re-render, then again, we call the use effect. Now, if you want, you can just simply console log and you'll see that in a console where I'll say hello world. And the moment we refresh, notice technically we have one, correct? So now we have one event listener. But of course, the moment I'll start adding some changes, you'll notice, first of all, in a console, I have a bunch of hello worlds. So each and every time 
I'm calling the use effect. And of course, if I'll check my events, and if I'll refresh, I'll have a bunch of event listeners as well. And this is where the cleanup function come into play. So every time we have this use effect, we also have an option of returning a function. So we go here with return. And then as far as the function, whatever we place over here will be invoked once we exit. And I think the best way to showcase that is adding another console log. I'll say clean up here. And let's set up a remove event listener. So we go with window and then remove event listener. Again, we need to set up a resize and then the same callback function. So we would want to remove once essentially we are done. And what you'll notice right now is something really interesting where we call the hello world. Of course, that is initial render. But what you'll notice before we do anything. So before we set up another event listener, because notice this is happening as I keep changing the screen size, then we also call the cleanup function. So I think the best case scenario is going to be adding here console log, and I'll say a render, then in here, we'll call this use effect, use effect, and then we'll have our cleanup. And you'll notice how it works. So initially, we have the render, correct? Then we call the use effect. Now, before we call the use effect one more time, we'll also clean up. So we have our initial render. Again, don't pay attention that there's two of them. There is initial render. Then we invoke the use effect. And then again, once we trigger re-render, once we render the component one more time, before we call that use effect. So before we add that another event listener, essentially we clean it up. We remove that event listener. And of course, we can also see that by the console log. So that is going to be how the cleanup function works. So yes, the use effect will run after each and every render. That is, of course, the default. Then in this case, we're setting up the event listener. We're checking for the resize. Now that will trigger the re-render. However, before we run the use effect after that render, we will run the cleanup function first. So that's how the setup works. And you might make a good argument where technically in this example, we don't need the cleanup function. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, remember, we had that initial render. We had that dependency list. So for example, in here, I could say, you know what, I would just want to run the use effect only once we render the component. And in this case, you are actually correct. Because what you'll notice that even if we comment out the return, meaning the cleanup function, we'll still have only one event listener. So notice how I'm re-rendering the component. That is true. But if I check out the elements, I can clearly see that I still have only one event listener because my use effect only runs once. Now, before you dismiss the cleanup function where you can say, well, each and every time I'll just add this empty dependency array, you need to understand that the cleanup function is very important when we'll start dealing with component appearing and then disappearing, meaning there's going to be conditional rendering where, yeah, at the moment, this component is all the time on a screen. So to tell you honestly, this makes sense where we just set up a dependency array and we say, you know what, once the component renders, we will set up the event listener and life is great. However, we need to understand that there's going to be components that, for example, are displayed and then they are removed. And the problem with this one is that even though it runs on the initial render each and every time we will show and hide that component, it will add again the window listener or event listener or whatever side effect you added there. And that is something that I'll show you a little bit later once we talk about the conditional rendering. Just don't dismiss it, even though in this case, yeah, we 
could have fixed our issue with this empty dependency array. Essentially, don't forget that it is a good practice each and every time you set up a side effect is to also set up a cleanup function so you don't make a big fat mess by just adding tons of subscriptions, tons of event listeners, or that kind of thing. Nice. And once we have covered how the use effect works, now let's put it to good use and let's see how we can fetch data using use effect. And first, what I would want you to do is in the app JS, change the import a little bit. Now, I don't think I'll change the name, but we're going to go with use effect again. Then we're looking for the final in this case. And let's look for use effect fetch data file. And once it renders, you'll notice a bunch of GitHub users. So essentially, this is what we're trying to create, where there's going to be some title, and then we'll just get some default GitHub users. And of course, we'll do that using use effect. So now let's change it around to a setup. So instead of the final folder, we're looking for the setup. And we should see on the screen fetch data. That's the one that we're looking for. I think I can close the console. It's not going to be necessary. And let's navigate to fetch data. I already provided the URL. If you want to double check what you're going to get back, you can just copy that and then navigate to your browser, copy and paste. Browser will perform a get request. And as you can see, essentially, we'll get a array of objects. And then in each and every object, we have info about the GitHub users. And I believe we're getting 30. But don't quote me on that. I might be wrong, but I believe there's 30. So once we have this particular setup, now, of course, let's work on our component, where I think I would want to start by setting up some kind of state value. Again, we have the use state. So let's set up the users. I'm going to go with const and then users. Now I will need a set users function as well. Set users here. And that is going to be equal to use state. And then let's start with an empty array. That is going to be my default setup. Then, of course, in the return, let's also add some kind of heading three. I think this is where we'll place our users eventually or below it. We're going to go here with GitHub users. All right, that's a good start. And then now let's set up our use effect. So I'll set up my hook, say use effect, and then I'll have my callback function, of course. So within the callback function, what I would want is to perform a fetch request. Now we have multiple scenarios. We can set it up the function here. So you can just start typing away. That is always an option. Or you can set up a separate function. So in my case, I'm going to go with separate function for a very simple reason that I'm going to use async await. And that is one more rule that I would want to mention that you cannot, you cannot make this function async await for a simple reason that remember, async await returns what? It returns a promise, correct? So if I'll say here async right here, it is going to be an issue. Okay, this won't work. There's going to be a big fat error because use effect cannot be async. It cannot return a promise. Because remember, in the previous video, we talked about that cleanup function. So use effect is looking for that, not for the promise. That's why you can either set up async await inside the callback function, or you can just set it up as a separate function, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go here with const, and then I'll call this get users. Now, like I said, it is going to be a sync function because I'll use the async await syntax. And then within the function body, I'm just going to be looking for a response. So I'll go with response is equal to await. And then I'll use the built in fetch. But of course, you can use Axios or some kind of external library as well. And by the way, I think during the project, we'll use the external libraries because it's just going to be a little bit easier. And then we already know that within the fetch, we just need to pass in the string, meaning the URL, which of course 
he is right now the API github.com and then forward slash users. Now we already know that as far as fetch, we would need to run the JSON because we're looking for that format. And again, we can await for that. And in this case, I'll go for users and is equal to await and response. So that is, of course, my variable. And then I run the JSON. So my key thing here is getting this users. And before you run set users, let's just do a little bit of dance where I'm going to show you what would be an issue if you just directly call set users. So first, let's start by console logging, whether we're getting the data in a console. And then once we get the data, then of course, we'll discuss what steps do we need to take. So in a console at the moment, I don't see anything. <laughs> of course, the reason why I don't see anything because in the use effect, I didn't call it. So let me call get users, let's invoke it. And now in a console, yeah, I have 30 users. Life is beautiful. Like I said, it is an array. And then each and every user in that array is an object. Now, what are the steps that I would want to take? Well, I would want to use set users. And of course, instead of this empty array, I would want to set it up as the users that I'm getting from the GitHub. Correct. So instead of this empty array, it's going to be array of 30 users. And then once I set it up, then in the JSX, I will iterate over my users. And then for each and every user, I'll just set up some type of return, meaning there's going to be a name, there's going to be an image, and all that good stuff. Now, before we do anything, I would want you to think about something. So I'll purposely place this in the comments because I don't want you to run this right now. But what do you think is going to happen if we go with set users and then we pass in the users? And let me tell you right away that as far as the code, this is correct. There's nothing wrong here. So I have my GitHub users and then I'm just using my set function and then passing in the GitHub users. But there's a different problem. What do you think is going to be a problem? Well, I have my use effect, correct? It runs after every render. Now, again, I've said this already 30,000 times, but it's very important. What is the use state doing? It preserves the value and it triggers re-render. So what do you think is going to happen right now? Everything was fine with console log. We did not trigger re-render. That was fine. But with this one, what are we doing over here? So we're getting the users. Then I call set users. I update this. I update users. Now, what is that doing in return? That triggers a re-render. Now, what are we doing in a re-render? We're getting users. And then again, we're setting users. So essentially, we're setting up a infinite loop. So if you run this, essentially your browser will crash. Now, it's not the end of the world, but that's why I commented out because I don't want my browser to crash. If you want to test it out, be my guest. Again, it's not the end of the world, but essentially you will have the infinite loop because in your function that you call in the use effect, you are triggering re-render because you call set users. And once you trigger re-render, again, you call use effect and on and on and on and on. So what is the solution? Simple. We add here dependency array, correct? Something we already talked about. And in this case, I only want to run once the component renders. So I'll add empty dependency list, correct? So now everything should be fine, where I think I can just comment out the log for your reference, and then I can call set users. And if I don't have the infinite loop, then life is great. So now, of course, what I would want is iterate over those users. So again, we'll set up curly braces, we'll say users, then a map. So we're mapping over for each and every user. Of course, I'll have my parameters. So I'll call this user. And as far as the return, I don't know, I'm going to go with list item. And you know what, I think I'll place this in the onward list. So let me fix this a little bit where I'll add the unord list. Let's add a class name. By the way, this class is coming from the index.js. It just adds a little bit of styling. And then let's wrap our users in that unord list. And then for each and every user, 
course, like I said, I'm returning a list item. Now, user is an object, and I'll right away set up my destructuring where I'm looking for ID, login, and then avatar, and then URL. Now, if you want a console log, if you want to see what is the user, be my guest. But in order to speed up everything, I won't do that. So in here, I'm going to say HTML URL. These are just the properties that are on the object, and that is coming from my user. And as far as the list item, remember, each and every time we had a list, we needed to pass this unique key. And of course, this is what I'm doing over here. And then for the user, I would want to have the image. As far as the source, it is equal to the avatar and then underscore URL. And then as far as the alternative, you know what? Let's pass in the login just so we have some reasonable value. And then let's go with a div. So right next to our image, we're going to have a div with a heading four. And then let's place here the login. That is going to be my name. Once I save, it should look something like this. And then right below it, let's add a link that just links back to a user profile. So here we will go with HTML URL. And let's just type profile like so. And we're in good shape. We're essentially within a matter of minutes. We set up a data fetching where we're looking for GitHub users. Again, the biggest takeaway would be the fact that if you have some kind of functionality within the function, whether that is directly in a callback function or within one of the functions that you're calling within the callback function of the use effect, if you are triggering re render, make sure that you add the dependency array. So that way, either you only run it once the component renders or if certain values change. But be very, very careful of how you set this up, because essentially, if you will fail to do that, then you'll get the infinite loop. Which again, I keep on repeating, it's not the end of the world, but it might just get annoying to keep on restarting your browser just because you're not checking when you are triggering the re-render and, of course, when the use effect runs. As we're done on completing the use effect part of the tutorial, and before we jump over to the project and start practicing by building something useful, I would want to cover one more topic, and that is not going to be a hook, however, it is going to be a very important topic, and that is conditional rendering. And essentially what that means is that we will display different components or different content based on some condition. And then once we cover this topic, yes, then we'll right away jump over to projects and practice it. So we'll start first by importing a specific file. And you can probably already guess that we're looking for folder number three. The name is conditional rendering. Of course, we're working in setup and we're looking for this multiple returns file. So here in the app, JS, I'm going to go with import again. I'll call this setup from and then we're looking for a tutorial. We're looking for conditional rendering and then setup, of course. And finally, the multiple returns file. And in here, let's render our setup component. And let's see what we've got. And you should see on the screen, simple, multiple returns. So what is happening over here? Well, if you take a look at the component, you know that it is a function, correct? Now, what can we do in a function as far as returns? Well, we can have no returns. Of course, that just means that we're returning undefined, which will be an issue. So if I'll comment this out, where you know that there's going to be a big fat issue. However, what it also means that we can have multiple returns. And then based on some condition, I can, for example, return one piece of content. And then if the condition is not met, then of course, I can return something else. So how is that going to look like? Well, I could simply say before the return, before the multiple returns, I can just return a hello world, correct? And everything is going to work nicely. I have hello world. Why? 
Well, because in JavaScript, we know that once we have our first return, then of course, everything else is just ignored. So those would be the basics. However, what we're looking for is some kind of condition. And of course, based on that condition, then we are returning some type of content. So how is it going to look like? Well, on the most basic example, we're just going to go here with loading and then set loading. Now, by default, we'll set our loading to be true. So I'll say, yeah, loading is true. And once I have my state value, I'm simply going to set up a condition where if loading is true, then I would want to return, I don't know, a heading to with text of loading like so. However, if the loading is not true, then I'll simply return the heading to with multiple returns. If the condition is met, then we are returning a heading to. So we'll have our loading dot dot dot. And then if the condition is not true, which of course, we'll change it in a second, then we'll have our multiple returns. So at the moment I have the loading. Why? Well, because the loading is true. So now of course, I'm returning this heading to please keep in mind, you can set up the whole app in here. As far as this return, nothing stops you from adding divs from adding models, or whatever you would want. I mean, you can go as crazy as you feel. Okay, just keep in mind that if the condition is not met, then of course, you'll have your default one. So you'll return the heading two with multiple returns. Again, you can set it up the whole application here. And the way we can test that is by just passing in false. Now, of course, we have multiple turns. And this is somewhat typical, where there's some kind of loading state, you literally can check for loading, or if the user exists or something of that sort. And then if the condition is met, then you display one part of the application. So one giant component with multiple other components. And then if the condition is not met, then of course, you display a sign up page or something of that nature. So hopefully the basics are clear, where since it is a function, we're going to multiple returns. Now, of course, if we don't set up the condition, then we'll just return the first one, because all the other ones will be ignored. However, if we start setting up conditions, nothing stops us from setting up returns within those conditions. So if the condition is met, we'll have one return. If the condition is not met, then of course, we have different type of return. And that way, of course, you can make your components way more dynamic, because now they're not static. Now they return based on some type of condition. And once we've got basics out of the way, of course, let's take a look at the more complex example, where we're performing some type of data fetching, and then we have the loading state, we have the error state, and then we have the final state, if everything went successful, because otherwise, you're probably thinking, well, there's probably no scenario where I will be statically changing this data from true to false, meaning, of course, I would want to do it somehow dynamically. And one very good use case is by setting up some type of data fetching, which we already covered in use effect. But of course, in this case, it is just going to be a little bit different, where I would want to still keep my loading. So that stays, we still have our set loading, that also can stay. And then as far as use state, you can go with true initially, or you can go with false, that is up to you. In my case, I'm going to go with true. So initially, the loading will be true. And then I would want two more state values. And those are going to be error. So in here, we'll say is error. And by the way, again, this is one of those common scenarios, where a convention is to use this is if you have some kind of Boolean, and then whatever name, again, there's no rule for it is just something that you will see, I would say somewhat a lot, where people just add this is, and then whatever is the name. And then of course, we still have our set function. But again, it is just a naming convention. If you don't want you don't need to follow it. And again, we're setting up a state value. 
and by default error will be false. And let me add that is in front of the loading as well. So we'll have is loading and then set is loading. And the last one will be user. And essentially, as you can already see by the URL, we'll just be checking for one GitHub user. And if the user exists, beautiful, we'll display some data, just some very basic data. And if we are loading, then of course, we'll display one content. Then if there's an error, there's going to be another content. And eventually, if there is a user, then of course, everything is great. And the user will be displayed. And in here, we'll have a set user, and then use state, and we'll go with default user. Awesome. Now, like I just said, we'll be performing a fetch request. And we already know that we would need a use effect. That's why it is important. But before we do anything, let's just decide, well, what we're going to display based on those values. And we'll start by loading. And we'll say if is loading is true, then just to showcase that we can add way more than just heading two, I'll just place a div. Again, this just signals that you can have as big of a return you would want over here. So let's just write loading and then dot, dot, dot. So that happens if the loading is true. Now, in this case, we also have the is error, correct? So in here we go is error. And then again, I'll just skip a little bit by copying and pasting. And now we'll say there was an error or error, something that is nice and short and sweet. So let's say that. Of course, now we have loading. Why? Well, because this is true, correct? And then as far as the error, it is false to begin with. And then eventually we have the default case. So if there is no loading, if there's no error, then of course I would want to display my user, which simply will be a div same way. And then where we have the heading one, I'll just display the user. So you can probably already guess that if I'll set my loading to be false. Now, none of the first conditions are met. So we just go with the default case, where we display our user. But the moment loading will be true. And of course, it will be displayed. So that is good. That is going to be our return. So now let's set up our fetch request in the use effect, where we will control our conditions. So let's go with use effect. Let's pass in the callback function. Now I'll right away set up a second argument. I already covered why we're using it. So please, if you need to go back, go back to the last video of use effect, where we covered that in detail, because I don't want to repeat myself. I'll right away add this empty array, meaning it will just run once. And once we do it, let's run fetch. Let's go with URL. As you can see, in this case, I'm not using a sync await and I'm typing everything within a callback function just to showcase that, as always, you have multiple ways how you can achieve the same thing. So you don't think that you always need to use a separate function that is a sync await. Now, that is my preference because I find the syntax to be more straightforward, but you don't have to. And then we know that with fetch, we have that then because, of course, we're getting back the promise. And then we still need to go with our JSON one. So let's go with response. And now I would want to return response and then JSON. And then also I could set up a catch. And if there is error, let's just start by console logging the error. And there's going to be a little bit of code in here because as far as the fetch, it has a gotcha. So now at the moment, we fetch everything, we return JSON, beautiful. Well, what are we doing after that? Well, in between, we'll set up another dot then. So in here, we should have the user. So let's set up our function again, user for the time being, and let's just log whether we're getting the user. So let's save it here. And then if we inspect, we should see a user. And of course we do. So that is our object. So we successfully set up a fetch request. So now the question is, well, how we can start operating with these values? Well, first, we need to understand when are we calling this function? So in my case, if I set loading right away to true, 
when I would want to change it. Well, I guess when I get my data, correct? So once I successfully have my user, then of course, I am good to go. Now, if of course, the user doesn't exist, then it's going to be a different ball game. So in here, let's add curly braces like so. And now let's just set up a user first. And then let's hide that loading. Now I already know that user will be here in the login. That's what I would want to actually display. So since the user is an object, I'll just say const, and then I'll be looking for the login that is coming from the user. And then I have two functions. I have set user, and then I have set is loading. So since my initial loading is true, since it is showing now, of course, once I have the user, then I would want to hide it. So first I'll set up set user and I'll pass in my login. That's the only thing that I'm looking for. And then the second thing is set is loading. And now, of course, I would want to set it equal to false. Why? Well, because I have my data, correct? Instead of default user, now I have my login. Now I have the name of my user. And then once I set the login, then of course I can right away call set is loading. So once we'll save, we'll notice that we'll have our initial state of loading. And then once we have our data, everything is exactly like we expected. Okay. So that's the first thing that we can do with multiple returns where we have a loading state, which is either displayed right from the get go or another way you could do it like this, where you say false. So technically it's not displayed, but when you set up your fetch or right before, I guess we can set up loading. That is true. So that is another option that you can do. So let's go here, set is loading and we'll set it equal to true. And now what you'll notice first, again, we have this for split second loading. And then of course, eventually we change the state. We say set is loading is actually equal to false. And then of course, instead of is loading, which was true in the beginning, now we just go with our default one. Okay. Hopefully that is clear. Now, again, I'm just going to go by default, set it to true. And then in here I set set is loading to false, but just remember that you have this option as well. Now, if you want to see that loading for longer, the only thing you need to do is just go to new window. Then again, we'll start a local host and then I'm going to go with 3000. And in here we can just slow down the network a little bit just so you can see. And we do that in network and then I'm going to be looking for 3G, the fast one. And then once I refresh, notice there's going to be a loading dot, 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 dot. And then once we get the data, then of course we flip it. Hopefully this is clear. As you can see, it's not like every time we'll just do that manually changing these values. Notice how this is happening dynamically. Now, one problem with a fetch is that when you talk about this error, essentially you are not talking about 404, for example, you're talking about the network error. So what I'm trying to say is if I'll add here S, well, technically that kind of user doesn't exist, but it is not going to trigger my error over here. Okay. And this is why we'll have to do a little bit of dancing around where when we're getting the JSON right before that, essentially we'll check what is the status of our response. Again, this has nothing to do with react. It has to do with the fetch where as far as built in functionality, it doesn't trigger the error if the status is 404, which means that there is no such user. So how we would fix it, like I said, we would set up over here curly braces because there's going to be a bit more functionality. So within the curly braces, I will check what is the status of my response. And if the status is between 200 and then 300, then I would want to return JSON because I know that everything is correct. However, if the status is not between two and 300, then of course I will throw the error. So then eventually I'll call this set is error again. For example, with Axios, 
you would have a different setup because Axios deals with those kind of errors. But as far as fetch, when you talk about catch, you're not catching here the 404 error, the not found. You're just catching the network error. That's why we're doing this whole setup. And like I said, I'll go with the response and then status. And I'll say if it is bigger or equal to 200. And let's do the end operator response and status, status, and less than 299. So 299. If that is the case, then I would want to return my JSON. So I'll say here return and I'll look for response and then JSON. So if that is the case, however, if it is not a case, if it is 404, like we have over here, then I'll set up my else. Again, I'll have to set is loading to false because initially in my case, it is true. Then next, we would need to set is error. So now, of course, I would want to trigger that state set is error. And now, of course, we're setting it equal to true. So now we can already guess that where we have these multiple returns, this will meet this condition. So is error now will be true. Correct. And once that is the case, we should see this error dot dot dot. And then again, it's not a reacting, but I'll also throw the error. So I'll say here, throw new and then error. And I'll go with response and then status text. Usually that's where we can find more info. Of course, this is not correct. It needs to be a error. And once we save, notice now we have the error. So we have error dot dot dot. So first we were loading. You can clearly see that once I refresh for split second, we're loading. And then since our URL is incorrect, since there is no user, we are hitting the error course. And then since we're hitting the error, now we're displaying div and then hitting one with error dot dot dot. And as a side note, of course, you can place here spinners or whatever you would want. So once we start working on more interesting projects, you'll see how that works as well. But essentially, the main idea is following where we can have multiple states. And then depending on that state, we are setting up the returns again. Keep in mind, you can return different components. You can return bunch of HTML elements or whatever you'd want. This is just a most basic example. Okay. Hopefully that is clear. Now let me go back to a proper user. And now, as you can see, I first have the loading. Then since there's no error, I'm just setting up the user and removing the loading. Because I said set is loading equal to false. Beautiful job. And up next, we have short circuit evaluation. Hopefully, you're clear with that concept because it is coming from the JavaScript. Now, I will try to cover the basics. Or if you need to brush up, then please do that. Because again, this is just straight up JavaScript. Or, of course, we will take a look at the react implementation of that setup. And we're looking for conditional rendering. And then we're looking for setup, of course, and short circuit file. We save and there it is short circuit. Now, of course, we can navigate to that particular file, file number two. And this is what I'm talking about. If you need to Google how it works in JavaScript, please do so. Because again, everything we're going to talk about in this video is based on that. So we have short circuit evaluation. And the reason why we would want to use it because in react, when we talk about DJSX, we talk about the fact that it has to return a expression, correct? Meaning it has to return a value. And that's why we need to set up a expression. So for example, if I would have here a fragment, and then within this fragment, if I would want to set up a if statement where I have the expression, this won't work because as far as if it doesn't return a value. So if I'll try to go here with console log and then say hello world, it's not going to work. And it's not because I didn't pass any 
condition over here is just not allowed in react. So this is why we will heavily work with short circuit operators as well as the ternary operator to display something conditionally because we already covered it. Of course, we have multiple returns. But what if I would want to have a one return? But again, based on some condition, there's going to be either some data shown or hidden and stuff along those lines. So first, I'll comment this out just so you can see that this will throw an error. And now let's set up some state value and also let's set up some returns. So first, I'm going to go with some kind of text and I'll say set text function and that will be equal to use state. And then it's just going to be a empty value. And now notice here, I have some stuff that has been commented out. So uncommented. And now we have first value and the second value. And in the first case, we have the or operator. And then in the second case, we have the and operator. And now let's just see what are the values. And I'm going to go with heading one, I guess. And I'll just get the first value. First value. And then I'm going to go with a heading one, one more. And then let's just look at the second value, second value. And once I render, I can see that the first value is equal to a hello world. And the second value, I just have the value. And basically the way it works in JavaScript, when we talk about the or and, and operators, for example, for the or, if this is falsy, meaning false, and of course it is falsy because it is an empty string, then we essentially return the second value. That's why where we have the empty string, that is falsy. So that evaluates the false. Then we have or operator. And then essentially the second value, the one that is right from the or operator will be returned. And that's why when we take a look at the first value, that's why you can see the hello world. Now, if I'll change this around and add one letter, meaning now it's not going to be a empty string. Now it's not going to be falsy. Now, essentially, it will evaluate the true. You'll notice that now the value is K. So since this is truthy now, it's now going to return a second value. Now, essentially, it will return that first one. Now, when we talk about and operator, it works a little bit differently, where if this is truthy, which of course is now the case, then we will return the second value. Now, if it is falsy, like we had a previous case, then it's going to return that first value, which of course, in our case, is that empty string. Okay. Now, of course, you can console log and then you can see second value. And in a console, we should see that it is going to be empty, essentially. Okay. So if it is true, then it returns this one. If it is not true, then it returns that first one. Okay. So kind of the opposites. One is the or operator. And then the second one is the and operator. All right. Now, why am I showing you all this? Well, because we can use that when we're setting up the expression in the JSX. That's why it is so important. And I'll start by simply showing you the example of name. So I'll leave this for your reference. And I think I'll comment these ones out as well, just in case you would need it. But then let's imagine this scenario where what if I have a heading one, and then as far as the text, I would want to display that text that I have over here. But the thing is, I also would want to set up some kind of default if it is a empty string. So if I go here with text, everything is great. But of course, since the text is empty string, well, nothing is displayed, correct? So now I can use my or operator and I can say, you know what? If the text is falsy, then return some kind of default value just like we were doing here with the variable. But of course, now we're doing that in React. So now I'll say, if the text is there, awesome, great. If the text is not there, 
then please return John Doe. And now, of course, since it is falsy, it evaluates the false, and now we're returning this value. Now, if I'll add something here, if I'll say Peter, now, of course, you'll notice that this is truthy. So now this gets returned. Okay. Now, another thing that we can do is, of course, use the add operator. Now, hand operator, we use a little bit differently, where again, we will set up the curly braces. And in here, we're checking for the text value. And if it is true, then we're returning that element. Okay, so in this case, we were returning the element regardless. But using the and operator, we can trigger the showing or the hiding of the component or the element in this case. But you can also, of course, do it with components. So, for example, if the text is true, then I'll say that I would want to display the hello world. Hello world. Correct. Now, if the text is not true, meaning if it is going to be empty, then you'll see that nothing gets displayed. Okay. So, that is the difference. In this case, if it is true, then of course we display the first one. If it is false, then we display whatever is on the other side of the or operator. However, with and, it is the opposite. If this is true, only then I will return this particular element. If it is not true, then you can see that nothing will get rendered. And by the way, you can double check that by looking at the elements. Or notice if you're checking the root, you can see that you have the container and the only one displayed is this heading one. Because this is false, the use state is an empty string. That's why we're not returning it. And of course, we can also do the opposite, where I copy and paste, and I'll say, you know what, if this is false, then return it. So we can kind of flip it by using the not operator. That is also the possibility. And now you'll see that, of course, there's going to be a hello world on a screen. Why? Because now in this case, I'm saying, you know what, if it is not true, if it is not true, then return it. Again, of course, we'll add some more dynamic setup a little bit later on. But just keep in mind that everything that we're going to talk about and use in the examples and projects later on is based on this short circuit evaluation that I covered a little bit in the beginning. So if you need to go and research that, please do so. But the way it works in React is when we use the OR operator, if this will be truthy, meaning if this is going to evaluate to true, then this value will be returned. Or if it is falsy or false, then the value on the other side of the OR operator will be returned. However, when we talk about AND, if the value will be true, so if it will evaluate to true, then of course we will return whatever is on the other side of the AND operator. However, if it is going to be false, then of course we won't return anything. Now we also have an option to check for the opposite value. That is also the case. So here the only difference is that I'm saying, you know what, show the heading one if it is false, which of course it is falsy, so it evaluates the false. So we are in good shape. So those are the basics of how React implements short circuit evaluation. Not bad, not bad. Hopefully we are comfortable with short circuit operators. And up next, I would want to add a button to the mix. So that way we'll see how we can set this up dynamically. Essentially, instead of hard coding, of course, this will depend on the value. And then we'll change that value using the button. And then also I'd want to talk about the ternary operator and why is that useful. All right. So let's start, I guess, by setting up our button. So right below the heading one, or yeah, I think the heading one is going to be the best case scenario. I'm going to go with button. And then again, we'll add a little bit of styling. So I'll say class name, and that one is equal to a BTN. And then inside the button, we'll write toggle error, so toggle, and then error. And now let's imagine that we're going to have some kind of state. 
So, of course, this is going to be the error state. And then I'll toggle it using this button. So up where I have the text. And you know what? By the way, I think at this point, you can just comment them out. I'll create another state variable. And it's going to be an error. So I'm going to say is error. And then, of course, we have set function as well. Set is error. And then in here, that is equal to a use state. And then by default, it is going to be false. So by default, there is no error. And now what I would want is to set up some kind of element, same like we did with heading one over here. Or you're not, I think we can do the same one. Hopefully you have it for your reference, because what I'm going to do right now is just change it around a little bit, where instead of relying on the text, I'm going to rely on is error. So I'm going to say is error. And now what I'm trying to say is that if the error is true, then I would want to display this heading one. So of course, we can change the text as well. So say here error, and then three dots. Now, of course, the moment I save, I have nothing there. Correct? Why? Well, because here I'm checking whether the error is true. And we already know that with and operator, only if this is true, then of course, we'll display the heading one, unless we add the exclamation point. Then, of course, I'm checking if this is false or false, and then I'm displaying the heading one. So now, of course, I can see it. But I actually would want to only display it if the error is true. And now I would want to use this button to toggle the error using the set function. And the way we can do that is by adding on click over here. Then again, we'll need our inline function. And I'll say here, set is error. And then I'll use again, the exclamation point, And I'll say is error. So what's the code saying over here? Well, I'm calling set is error. But then I'm all the time grabbing the opposite value of the current is error. So currently is error is false. Correct? That's the default one. However, the first time I click it, it's going to check. All right, what is the value? It is false. So let me flip is error to true, because that is going to be opposite. And then, of course, the next time when it is already true, then again, we run the same function. So now, of course, it will change it back to false. So essentially, we set up a toggle state where the moment I click, notice now I'm displaying the error. Why? Well, because I changed the value in the state. I change it from false to true. And I think this would be a good use case for React DevTools. So let's go with localhost and then 3000. And remember, we had to look for components here. So let's say where it is, where it is, profiler components. And now, of course, we have short circuit. And check out the state. We have state is false. So the moment I click, notice, now it's going to be true. Okay, so again, once we click, we flip it back to false. So essentially, this is how we're toggling the state. And as we're toggling the state, we're also toggling this heading one, because we're using the and operator. And only if this is true, we display. If it is false, then of course, we don't display it. All right. And now let's take a look at the ternary operator. And the difference between the ternary operator and the and or, or operator is the fact that ternary operator will give you two possible values. So for example, in this case, I'm checking for is error. And only if it's true, then I'll display it. However, with ternary operator, we'll display something if it is false, and then something else if it is true. Again, it is just a JavaScript thing. So if you need to go and brush up on that, please do so. You can Google it or you can use my playlist. It's up to you. But essentially, we'll deal with ternary operator. And the syntax for ternary operators following where we have a question mark. Then we have first thing that we would want to show if it is true. And then the second thing, if it is false. So in our case, I think I'm going to do the same thing with is error. So let's set up the curly braces first. 
again, we'll check for is error, whether it is true or false. And then the syntax for ternary operators following where we add a question mark. And then, like I said, if this is true, then we'll have our first value. If it is not true, then we'll place the value after the colon. So in our example, what I would want to display? Well, if it is true, I would want to display a paragraph and I'll say some kind of text. Now, again, keep in mind, you can set up whatever you'd want over here. You can add 10,000 components that are sitting in one giant component. In my case, I'm just showing you with paragraph, but sky is the limit. Just remember that. And as far as the text, I'm going to say there is an error. And again, we go with three dots. So this is going to be the case if the error is true, which of course we already know that by default is not the case. Now, after the colon, we'll place what will display if the error is false. So notice in here, we had no fallback case. We only display it if this is true. In this case, though, we do have it. So if this is true, beautiful, we'll display the paragraph. However, if it is not true, now let me showcase that we can, of course, set up something more complicated. I'm going to go with div. And then within a div, there's going to be heading two. And I'll say there is no error like so. And once we'll save, check it out. Now it says there is no error. Why? Well, it's simple, because error, of course, is false. Correct? So if it is false, then, of course, we skip the first part because we check what is the value for the is error. And of course, it is false. So we skip this one, the paragraph, and then we right away go to the second value. That's why we have here. There is no error. Now, the moment I'll click, notice what's going to happen. So first, I'll have my error. We already covered that because that is, of course, our and operator. But then I have my paragraph with there is a error. So those are the ways how we can display elements or components conditionally in react, because please keep in mind, we cannot use if because if doesn't return the value, we need to use something that returns the value, whether that is a short circuit operator, or that is a ternary operator. All right. And once we're clear with ternary operator, now I would want to set up a small example where we will toggle the component in this case. And in a process, I'll try to hammer home why we need the cleanup function. So there's going to be a little bit of repetition. Essentially, we will set up again the event listener on the window. And I'll showcase why it is important to use the cleanup function because setting up the dependency list empty is not always going to save us. All right. Now, what we're looking for in the app JS is file number three. So still conditional rendering still set up. Or in this case, I'm looking for and then forward slash. And then of course, show and hide. So the moment you run it, of course, this is what you're going to see. Now I'm going to navigate to the files. So again, in the setup folder, file number three, show and hide. And first, I would want to set up a state value. So again, we have the use state, let's go and say const show, and then set show function. All right, not bad. And that is equal to use state. And then by default, it is going to be false. All right. Now, as far as the return, let's make it a bit more interesting. Where first, I'll set up my fragment. And then we'll start with the button. I will say that there's a class name for the button. And the class name is button, of course. And then remember how we were toggling the state value. Again, we'll do the same thing where we have on click, then we'll have our inline function. And then let's run set show. And each and every time we'll click, we will set the new state value opposite to the current one. So if it is false, then it's going to become true. If it is true, then it's going to become false. And in here, let's type show and then forward slash hide. Let's save. Okay, we should have the button. Everything is awesome. And now depending on that show value, I will show or hide another component. 
So that is going to be the difference where previously I mentioned multiple times that we're not limited to HTML elements. So of course, this is the example where we will toggle the react component. And for the time being, it's simply going to be a div. So let's go with div. And then I'll add a little bit of styling here. Minimal we will go with a margin top. And that is going to be equal to two REMs. And then within a div, let's again go with window, window, and then we'll check for those pixels. So for the time being, of course, we haven't set up anything. So I'm just going to say size and then colon. So once we save, we should see something on the screen. But of course, we don't because we haven't implemented that show. So what I would want here is set up curly braces. And then I'll say if show is true, then we use the and operator. And then I would want to display the item component. Now, of course, I do need to be a bit more specific here, where it is a component. So now, of course, it is hidden by default. But then the moment we click, check it out. Now I have window and then size. So as you can see, now I'm toggling the component, correct? And it is important because of two reasons. First, the fact that we're not limited to just HTML elements, like we had in a previous example. And a second thing, I would want to hammer home the fact that we need to use the cleanup function when we're setting up some kind of side effect that needs to be cleaned up, which in our case is still going to be that event listener on the window. So within the item, so not within the show and hide component within the item, what I would want is to set up that size state variable. So again, we go here with const and then size and then set size like so. And now we're using use state. And then again, let's check for that window in our width. Beautiful. And then we will set up each and every time when we render the component our use effect. So we're going to go here with use effect. Now we have our callback function. And just to showcase that it's not going to work if we simply add our empty array. Now let me add here window and then add event listener. So as we'll be resizing the window, we'll be listening for this event. So resize. And then we'll run our check size. So like I said, a little bit of repetition because we already set this up when we work with use effect. Now, of course, let's come up with our function. So it's going to be check size function. It's not going to be looking for any parameters. However, each and every time we will resize the window, I will set my state value equal to a window and then inner width. Okay, beautiful. And remember when we covered use effect, I said that even though in that particular scenario, the empty dependency array saved us because we were not toggling the component. Essentially, the component was there. And the first time the component rendered, we set up the event listener and we were good to go. However, the problem now is going to be that we will be toggling this component. So even though we run this only once because we will toggle the component, essentially we will set up multiple event listeners. And I guess in order to see better what is happening, let's just go with size here in heading two. So now once I click, check it out. Now, of course, the window is 462. By the way, we can add pixels as well if we would want. So let me go here with pixels. Again, I show. And then as I'm going to be increasing or decreasing the size of the window, of course, this value will change. Now, the problem is a little bit different, where every time notice as I'm clicking, I'm toggling the component, correct? And if we check out the elements and then event listeners and then resize, notice, is this the behavior that we're looking for? No, of course, it is not. So even though empty array saved us in a previous example, because we were not toggling the component. This is why this cleanup function is so important. 
because even though this runs only once because we're toggling the component, we run it every time we show the component. So that's why, remember, we need to go with return. And then we have the function that runs when, of course, the component is removed. And in this case, of course, once we remove it from the DOM, and then we'll go with window, then remove event listener. And then again, I'm looking for resize and I'll run check size. So now what you'll notice that once you navigate here, well, you can see that there is no event listener and that should be the case because the component is not displayed. Then at the moment we show the component, then of course we set up the first event listener. But then as I'm clicking, notice I'm not going to be adding those event listeners. So there's always going to be one because we have our cleanup function. So once we remove the component from the DOM using the show and toggle, then of course, we'll also remove our event listener. So that's how we can toggle components in react using the and operator. And also that's why it is so, 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 so crucial to use the cleanup function. Excellent. And up next in tutorial, we have the forms. More specifically, we're going to cover controlled inputs, what they are and how they work, and also how we can set up multiple inputs with just one function. And before we cover any of those topics, though, I would just want to give you general info about the how the forms work in React. So we'll start working in controlled inputs, but we'll cover them in the next video. In the beginning, I would just want to give you the general overview. And the file, of course, that we're looking for is, again, I'll call this setup just so I don't have to change stuff around in here. And we'll say tutorial. Then we're looking for the folder number four forms, then setup. And then, of course, we're looking for controlled inputs. And now instead of deciding two, I'll render my setup. And there it is. And if you work with forms in JavaScript, you know that it worked something along the lines of setting up some kind of ID or class or whatever on the input. Then you targeted the input. And then in order to get the value, you are looking for the value property on the node. Now in React, it's a little bit different where you have those controlled and uncontrolled inputs. And by the way, we'll talk about uncontrolled inputs when we talk about use ref. But whenever we deal with controlled inputs, you will be hooking up your input to a state value. And since it's going to be easier for me to show you, of course, let's just put this one on ice. Just remember that the setup is going to be a bit different than a regular JavaScript. So what I would want to do first well, I think we could change our JSX a little bit, where we'll start with article. By the way, there's going to be two articles. One is going to be displaying the items, and second one will be dealing with form. So let's just start with the form, and then next video we'll add those items as well. And when it comes to a form, we're not going to deal with action. So we'll deal with that on our end. Now, I do want to add here a class name just for styling purposes, and that is going to be a form. And inside of the form, let's set up, I think two inputs is going to be good. So we'll go with form control. Again, this is just for styling. Please keep that in mind. And then once I save, I should have the form on a screen. Beautiful. And then within this form control, again, this is just for styling. Please keep that in mind. It has nothing to do with the react within this div. Now I would want to set up my input, but I also would want to set up a label because I would want to showcase how we can connect label with input in react. And as far as the react, because the naming conventions in JSX are calling for camel case, you'll see the syntax where in regular HTML, of course, you wouldn't write that like this. But in React, if you have label and you want to connect it to the input that we're about to set up, you need to use this HTML for written in camel case. 
And here you need to pass in the ID that is eventually going to be on the input. So in my case, it's going to be first name. That's why I'm adding it right here. And I'll write here name and then colon like show. And now, of course, we would need to set up our input. So I'm going to go with input. Now type the same works as with regular HTML. So we have multiple types. In this case, I'm going to go with most basic one, which is going to be a text. And then, of course, I would need to have two things. I would need to have the ID as well as the name. So we're going to go here with an ID and I'll set the sequel to a first name, just like I had in the label. And then let's also set up the name. So say here name, and that is equal to a first and then name. So I'll save it. And there it is. Now, of course, I have my label. Notice once I click on a label, I right away highlight my input. And of course, I have the input. And since I would want to have two of them, I'll copy and paste. And we just need to change some values around where form control stays exactly the same. Now, ID is going to be a bit different. So let me select both of them. And we're looking for email. And also the name will change. So let's write over here email. And by the way, in here, I also would need to change it to a email. And once I have my second input, I also would want to set up right away a button. So I'm going to go here with button, then type will be submit. And in here, let's just write add person. And you'll see why we do that in next video. So we have our button. Awesome. And then when it comes to react, we have two options. Either we can add on submit on the form. So the form element, or we can still add on click on this button. And I'll show you in a second how both of them will work. But let's start with on submit because that is something we haven't covered. So on a form, we can set up on submit event listener. And then, of course, we'll still need our handle and then submit like so. And of course, we would want to come up with that function. So const and then handle submit. Now, eventually, there's going to be an event object. And I'll show you why in a second. For time being, let's just go with hello world. And let's see what is happening. So I type my values, both of them, like so. And now once I press the button, or I press return, I should, I should see hello world in a console. However, it's not happening. Why? Well, because by default, browser will try to submit the form and then refresh the page. That's why we don't see this hello world. And just like in JavaScript, we have access to the event object. And on that event object, we have a method called prevent default. We're essentially we're saying, you know what, prevent the default behavior, we will deal with this form data on our own end. So the way we prevent the default would be falling away, where we go with prevent default. And now, of course, once we fill it out, either we can press enter, or we can press on the button. And now, of course, we'll be able to see the hello world. So essentially, now we're not refreshing the page the moment we submit the form. Awesome. And just to showcase that it will still work if we set this up on the button with a type of submit. Let's go here with on click. And it's the same deal where we pass in handle submit. Now I'll remove it for the second, even though I uh, will place it back. And here again, let's try it out and check it out. It will still work. So again, that is the case where you have multiple options of how you would want to submit the form in the react. Either you use this on submit, but make sure you place it on the form or you can still use the good old on click to make sure that the button is type submit. And then of course, make sure that you in both scenarios as a parameter in this function, you are accessing the event object. And then however, you would want to call this parameter. In my case, I call this E and then you can look for the properties that are available on that event object. 
So in my case, I'll remove this on click. So that would be a basic setup when it comes to forms in React. Nicely done. Hopefully we are clear on form basics. And now let's see how we can connect our inputs to the state values. Because at the moment, yeah, we can prevent a default. We can console log the hello world. But of course, what I would want is to access the data that is inside the input, correct? As I'm typing or as I'm submitting. And the way we do that in React, we set up state values. So again, we'll use use state. And then we'll need to add two attributes on the input value that will reference the state value and then on change and on change event listener will fire the callback function each and every time we type something in the input. And I guess let's start by setting up our state values. So here I'm going to go to const and then first name, and then I'll say set first name, first name, and that is equal to my use state. And then by default, it is just going to be an empty string. I'll copy and paste. And of course, I'll do the same thing with email, where it's going to be an email and then set email. And again, by default, it is going to be a empty string. So now what I would want is to head to my inputs. And then like I said, we have to add two attributes. One is going to be value. And the second one will be on change event listener, where we'll set up our callback function. So in here, let's write value. And now which value would want to reference from the state? Well, I guess most sense would make first name, correct? So again, I'm just referencing here the state value. And now I'll do the same thing with my email. So again, we go with value. And then we're looking which state value would want to reference. And the moment you do that, you'll notice something interesting. First of all, there's going to be a big fat error, because react will complain, or maybe more specifically a warning, where react will complain that I provided value prop. However, I missed out on the on change handler. Don't worry, react we will add the on change handler a little bit later. Now I would just want you to understand that notice how you're typing, and nothing is happening. Why nothing is happening? Well, because we connected our forms, meaning our inputs to the state values. So since both of my state values are empty strings, they all the time will stay like this. Now, of course, if I'll say hello, world, now of course, in my name one, I will have that hello world. Just keep in mind that of course, now we have connected those inputs to the state value. And the last thing in a puzzle is to set up that on change. So each and every time we will type something in a form, we'll fire that function. And within that function, we will set up this state value. And then in return, you'll right away see it in the form as well. Just hopefully this is clear, where now the value in the form depends on the state value. And since it is an empty string, that's why you can type all day long and nothing won't change in the form. And with that said, now let's set up our on change handler. So we go here with on change. And again, we can set up a reference, meaning we can set up a separate function and just reference it. Or we can set up the inline one. Now, since this is already fifth or sixth example of inline and reference, I'm not going to set up two separate scenarios. I'll just do the inline where we'll have to pass in our arrow function first, because again, we will be invoking. And now we go with set first name. So here comes the interesting part. Remember when we were submitting the form, we had access to the event object. And in this case, the method that we were looking for on the event object was prevent default. Now with on change, we also would want to access the event object. However, in this case, what we're looking for is the event target value. So the same deal, 
like we had with handle submit, where we had access to the event object. Same works with on change, where again, we can access the event object, or in this case, what we're looking for is the event target, and more specifically value. So that is going to give us whatever is typed in the actual input. So I'm going to go here with event, then target, and then we're looking for the value. So now what you'll notice with the first one, as you start typing, actually, the values are displayed. And what is even more interesting, if you go to the components, you'll notice that at the moment, there's nothing there. Yeah, that is true. My controlled inputs or I'm sorry in here. So notice we have the state value. And as you start typing, notice the state value also changes. So we're affecting that in two places. Because we have connected our form each and every time I type something in the form, the on change function fires. And then within that function, I have set first name, and then I'm controlling the state. Now, in turn, I'm also controlling the input. Because remember when it was just empty string, well, we could type all day long and nothing was changing in the input. So now, of course, once we have our on change, and we have the function, we access the event object. And then in order to get the value for this particular input, I would need to go with event object, then I'm looking for the target, and then I'm looking for the value. So similar, like we worked in just vanilla JavaScript, however, in this case, we directly can access our input, because we have an event object, then we have a target. So that is going to be our input. And then more specifically, we're looking for the value property. And of course, once we have this set up, I would want to do the same thing for my email, where I'll copy and paste. And in the email, I'll also do the same thing. So I have on change. However, in this case, of course, I would want to call set email, not first name, but the event target value, of course, won't change. So I'm going to go here with email. And once we do that, check it out. Now I can type and everything is displayed correctly. And of course, once we have this particular setup, now in the handle submit, instead of looking for specific inputs, once I submit the form, now I have access to them in the state, the first name, as well as the email. So let's do that. I will console log here, the first name, and the last name, first name, and then or I'm sorry, email, I guess more properly. So let's type. We're going to go here. You know what, let's write some reasonable name john. And then we're going to go with john at gmail.com. And once we add the person, there it is. Now we have john and john at gmail.com. So that's how we can set up controlled inputs in react. Remember, you need to have a value property that references some state value. And then you have on change event listener, where either you set up a reference. So either you set up a function here, like we did with handle submit, just make sure that in either case, you're looking for this event. So you pass in that first parameter, because that will reference the event object. And then in order to control the state value, you call the set function. And then what you would want to pass in is the event target. So you're grabbing the input. And more specifically, you'd want to get the value. So each and every time you'll type something in a form, in turn, you'll change the state value. And then since that state value is a reference over here, also, it will be displayed in the form input. Excellent work. Now we understand how we can set up controlled inputs in react. And just to complete this particular part of the forms, I would also want to create a little app where we can add that person to our list. Because up until this time, all the time we work with lists, we were just getting some kind of data, whether that was external data coming from the API, or it was ours. However, in this case, we'll take a look at how we can 
add those items dynamically to the list. Since now we have covered forms and I can grab my inputs. Now I'll start simply by creating my state value for my list of people. So I'm going to go with people and then set people over here. That is use state. And we already know that we need to start with an empty array. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Now, what is the next step? Well, once I submit the form, I can see that I can grab these values. So wouldn't it make sense that once we submit the form, I would want to add that new person that I'm creating to my people array. I think that would make sense. Now, before we do anything, though, let's think about it. Do we want to have the functionality where once we click, we can also submit the form and notice how as I'm clicking on adding the person, I have two empty values. Now, why do I have two empty values? Well, because first name and email are both empty strings, right? But nothing prevents me right now from console logging that. So essentially, if I would want to set up some kind of functionality where I'm adding this to a people array, I can definitely do that. So that's why I'll right away set up the condition where I'm only going to submit the form, meaning I'm only going to add my item to the array if both of the values are true, because we already know that empty string is falsely value. So of course, that condition will fail if both of them or one of them essentially is a empty string. So in this case, I'll say first name, and I'll use and operator and email. And what you'll notice that only then I can submit the form, submit the form, the form. And then in here, let me write empty values. So if that is not the case, of course, the values will be empty. So I'll set up the else. And let's say empty values. And you know what, I think I will leave this for your reference. So we'll have the else, there's going to be no modal, no info to the user. But at least we will know that if we see in a console empty values, that just means that the user is trying to submit with empty values. Now, if both of them have some kind of value, what I would want, and I guess I'm going to start by creating a new object. So I'm going to go here with const and then person. And I'll start with first name and email. So what's really cool in ES6, if the property value matches the variable that you're assigning to, then you can skip one step where essentially, if I'm creating a new person, I could say something like this, first name is equal to a first name, and then email is equal to an email. And now if I'll add the value, let me just console log the person first. But if I'll say here, by the way, let me save it here. No, nope, not here. Sorry, got confused a little bit. I would want to save my file first. And then let's write again, john. And we're going to go john at gmail.com. So once we add the person, notice how in a console, I did create this person, I have the object, and everything works beautiful. Now, the thing is that I can shorten this a little bit because in the ES6, we have a shorthand where if the key name matches the variable that holds the value, I can just write something like this where email is email and first name is first name. Please keep in mind both of them essentially have the same value, it's just a little short syntax which I'm going to use throughout the tutorial, as well as the course. So if we go here with john at gmail.com, you'll notice that new person, yeah, we still have the value. So everything works correctly. Now next, I would want to add this new person to my array. Correct? How do we do that? Well, we go with set people. And just so we can keep on practicing on the function setup as well. Remember, that was my old people or current people or whatever. So I will call this same thing, the people just remember that we're talking about the current value in the state. And then what I would want to return from this function is dot dot dot. 
So whatever we have as far as the values in the array. So we're using the spread operator. And then of course, I'm returning a new array. However, I would want to add that person object as well. Again, I know I said this 20,000 times, but we also have an option of just passing this directly in a set people. The reason why I set this up as a function is I would want you to practice on setting up the functions as well. If you see that in someone else's code, you're not confused of what is happening. And now, of course, what I would want is also set both of these, the first name and the email back to an empty string. Correct. That would make sense. So let's go with set first name. And that is going to be equal to a empty string. And I'll have also a set email the same way. So now, once we click, and by the way, if you want, we can console log it somewhere, the people or you know what, let's use the react dev tools. Sorry, let's go here to a bigger screen. Notice I have this value over here, the empty array. And now if I'll go again with maybe Peter, and if I'll set the email at Peter at gmail.com, check it out. Once we add the person, now we clear this one. We clear the first and the second value in my state, email and name respectively. And then in the state, check it out. Now I have email and the first name for the Peter. So of course, now we can keep on adding more and more people. Now, before we add more people, why don't we also set up here a return where we display what people we have in our array. So again, we'll iterate over the state value, then each and every item will be that object. So I'll name this in my parameter as a person. And then as far as the return, I'll return a div over here. And then I'll go with const and then ID and then first name, first name and email. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm destructuring. Now you're probably wondering about this ID. Well, don't worry, we will create that ID in a second. Because remember, for the list, we needed to use something unique. So even though technically, I could do something like this index, and then I'll set it equal to a index, the problems will start once we start removing the items. Now I'm not going to do that in this particular example. But in general, you don't want to use index once you start adding and removing items to the list. So even though yeah, technically in this example, we might let it slide and then use the index. I'm not going to do that. I'll show you how we can quickly set up the unique key as far as when we're creating the person. So for now, let's just go with div. And then notice how we destructured the first name and email from the person, because we already know that, of course, it is there because we're creating that particular object. And then in here, what I would want is to have the heading four. And I'll show the first name. So heading four, and then first name. And I'll also add a class name of item, just so we have a little bit of styling. And then let's have the paragraph with a email state value. So now every time we add something in our form, that person should be displayed. Now, react will complain, because we don't have that unique value in the key. Don't worry, we'll set that up in a second. So let's go with Anna. And then it's going to be Anna at gmail.com. And yeah, we do have the Anna, everything is displayed correctly. Again, the problem right now is that unique key prop. And this is not the most vigorous setup. But we'll cheat a little bit where I'm going to use the new date get time to string. Normally, you would use some kind of package. Uh, UUID is one of the most popular ones, where it's a NPM package, you install it, you import it, just like we did with, for example, react, and then you set up that unique ID. Again, in my case, I'm just going to cheat a little bit, where I'll use a nifty setup of ID. So now notice how I'm creating this new person, I'll also add this key of ID, and that is going to be equal to a new date. And then we're going to go with get time to a string, we invoke it. And now what you'll notice that each and every time you create that person, 
there's going to be that unique ID. So you fall console log the person in this case, and we're going to go with Susan, for example, Susan, and then Susan at gmail.com. Check it out. And once we add the person, there it is. Now, of course, we have the ID. And the last thing, of course, is where we are rendering the list of people. Now we want to also get that ID. Now I already destructured it out of my person. So now remember, we needed to use the key prop and set it equal to the ID. And once we do that, we shouldn't have no issues whatsoever. We can type whatever names we would want, and we can clearly see how they're also affected in our state. So we go here with gmail.com. And then, of course, once we add the person, there is my person in the list. And I can clearly also see that in the state. And I shouldn't have no errors in the console because I am using those unique keys. So that's how we can combine our controlled inputs with our list. So each and every time we add some kind of item in the form, we can just submit the form if the values are more than empty string. then of course, we trigger this functionality, where again, we have some kind of state value for the list. And we just add a new item to the list, clear the items. So set them back to an empty string. And down at the bottom, we just iterate over the list of items, grab all the properties that we would want, and nicely display them on a screen. Beautiful job. Now we know how we can use our controlled inputs with our list. And next, I would want to showcase how we can have multiple inputs with the same on change handler. Now, the use case that I'm trying to showcase is the one with many, 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 many inputs. Now, in my case, I'm just going to add one more to our current setup. But keep in mind that the whole idea is to show you what if you would have, I don't know, 10 inputs, and you don't want to have 10 different state values, and 10 different functions that you're calling inside of the handler. Now, first, we would need to navigate to the app.js. And we're looking for a different file. In this case, we're looking for file number two. And then the multiple inputs is the name. So save it. And what you'll notice that it is exactly the same, like we finished in the controlled inputs. And that is by design. So essentially, I'm not the biggest fan of refactoring. But this is exactly what we'll do in this video, where we will refactor it a little bit. So our whole setup is going to be exactly the same where we are still submitting the form, we're still adding the items, and all that good stuff. It's just the implementation will be a little bit different. And I would want to start by adding one more input. And again, when you're looking at this setup, the one that we're about to set up, please keep in mind that we're talking about the form with multiple, multiple, multiple inputs, not just two or three. If you have two or three, probably there's nothing wrong with our previous setup. So now what I would want is to copy and paste. So we're adding one more item over here. And I'll call this age. So we'll change this around. We'll say that HTML four will be for age. So also, of course, the ID will change. We're going to add here age value as far as text. Let's change the ID to age. Now we also would want to change the name, which by the way, we haven't used it yet. So in this video, you'll finally see why we're setting up that name attribute all the time. And then I would want to get a state value. So for the time being, I will copy and paste. I'll copy and paste and I'll say age and then set age. And by default, age will be, I don't know, I think I'm going to go same way with an empty string. Okay, that is going to be my age. And of course, in here, where I have the value and the unchange, I would want to change it to age and then set page. So this should work, correct. But wouldn't it be better if we would have only one value in a state 
instead of three or instead of 10 or 15 or how many inputs you have. And also wouldn't be better if we would have only one function that is responsible for on change, regardless which input we're typing in. Because that way, if we need to make some changes, we only need to do it in one place. And we would do that by first setting up one state value. So instead of first name, email and the age, I will go with const and I'll call this person. So I'll say person. And then of course, there's also going to be a set person function. Now it is going to be equal to a use state. And now I'll set this equal to a object. So I'm going to go with first name. And then that it will be equal to a empty string, then email, same spiel, empty string, and also the age, and you guessed it, empty string. So once I set up these values, now instead of using them one by one, the first name, email and the age, now I would want to reference the person. And you know what, by the way, I will delete that handle submit and we will rewrite it from the scratch. So let's just delete it. So it's not in our way. And then eventually, we'll set up one more time. So now, of course, I have my person with all those three properties. And now where we see the inputs, of course, we would also want to change where now the value will be person dot first name, not just the first name. And by the way, I think in here, I'm just going to comment this out or you can delete it. It's up to you. So we have person dot first name, then person dot email. And then eventually also we have person dot age. Correct. Now the gotcha here is that we're still using these functions, correct? So we have set email, we have set age and all that. Now there's big fat complaint from react because of course we don't have the handle submit and also we don't have the functions. So what I would want to do right now is just delete. We will flip it over to the submit button. And as far as the on change, let's just reference the function in this case instead. So go with handle and then change. So that is, of course, the function we haven't created yet. So I'm going to go with const and then handle change. And again, I definitely would want that event object. So I need to set up my parameter and I'll have access to the object. And like I said, we'll copy and paste. So we'll change this around. There's not going to be three separate functions. There's going to be one function. And again, think 15 inputs. That is where it definitely makes way more sense. So we have on change equal to a handle change. And then on the submit button, well, let's go with on click just so we can see that, of course, it is going to work. And in this case, I'll call this handle submit. Let's scroll up const and then handle submit. Now, still the same setup. We need to have access to the event object. And we'll right away prevent and then default like so. That is the function that we're looking for. Now, at this point, it's complaining that handle change is not defined. So, of course, I call this handle. And that's not what the function name is. So, let's save. Now, we don't have the errors. Beautiful. Now, everything works. But if we'll start to try typing, of course, again, nothing will work. Well, because the handle change is not doing anything yet. Now, why am I showing you this particular setup? Well, because now I would want to run the handle change regardless of the input. And I would want to get those values. And depending on which input I'm changing, I also would want to affect the person. Now, two properties that I definitely want from the event object are the name and the value. So if I go here with const name and equal to event target and then name, copy and paste. And if we go here with a value and change this around again to event target. So that is the input where we're typing and same how we access value in my previous case. Remember in the controlled inputs, we use the value, correct? when we were setting up the first name or the email. 
we used event target so that acts as the input and then we used dot value property in this case i'm looking for two things i'm saying whenever i call my handle change i would want to check for the name of the target and the name will be right here remember each and every time we set up that name attribute on the input well now we'll use it now i'll say event target name and then the value so if you'll console log you'll notice something pretty pretty cool where we go with a name and value and then depending on which input i'm typing notice this tells me that the name attribute on the input is first name and then i'm also getting the values now nothing is displayed right now in the input because we haven't updated the person yet meaning we're accessing of course the person that first name and we're not doing anything with that person yet but don't worry we'll do that in a second but if we change to an email beautiful now notice again it gets me the name of the input and it also gets me that current value and the same of course is going to be with an age now why is that so cool well because now once i know the name and the value i can use the dynamic object properties again this is coming from javascript so please either utilize my javascript nugget series or just google dynamic properties how you would set them up in javascript so now i have the object correct and of course the object is set person so what i could do here is i could say set person and then remember i need to copy the old values first because since it is an object it has multiple properties as i'm updating one for example name i don't want to remove or delete the email and age that's why we first start by spread operator dot 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 we copy the person from the state and then we add a comma and then after the comma we would want to come up with whichever property we would want to update now of course that is going to depend on which input we're typing in correct and this is the case where we can do this dynamically where i can say you know what get me the name on that object because in here i'll pass in the value now what were my values it was either first name it was either email or it was age so now we'll dynamically update this property equal to whatever value we have please keep in mind it's the same thing as you would write over here first name and then it is equal to a value now the difference is that we are doing this dynamically because we have three inputs so if i'll just leave this as a first name you'll notice that each and every time i type something it's actually is displayed over here which kind of doesn't make sense right why well because i'm not setting this dynamically i'm saying first name where if i have access to the name and of course those names need to match to whatever i have in the object now each and every time i'll type in any of the inputs i'll dynamically update that state value as well so that's why i need to go with that name and that's why we added the name right from the get-go now you're not going to use it all the time but there's going to be some use cases where it is very nifty to update whichever state value references the input so now again let's navigate to a bigger screen notice i have my state and now check it out where i have the name i'll start typing and there it is in my state in the person right away i'll access the first name and now of course that it will be equal to a john now if i go with email i go with john at gmail.com and there it is now we have john at gmail.com and lastly we have age of 24. so notice how nicely we updated all the values and now what's left to do is again to submit the form so we prevented the default and then now i would want to check if and in this case i'm checking for three things so first name and person then dot email and then the last property of course was age so i only would want to submit this form if all three of them are more than just an empty string and then let's do the same thing 
where we are creating a new person, correct? So we go here with const, then new person. And then as far as the value, I would want to copy the person value from the state, this one, since this is what we're setting up as far as the inputs. And now I also would want to add that ID. So I'm going to go with ID is equal to a new date and then get time, get time invoked. And then we have two string invoked as well. And lastly, let's just add person to a set people. And then let's set up person back to an empty string. So we go with set people. That is my array, of course. And like I said, previously, we used the function. In this case, I'm just going to pass in new array, where I'll copy the values from the state. And then I'll add that new person. So we were just practicing in the previous example, where we used a function, we can also pass directly here the value. And then like I said, I also would want to set person back to empty values. So we pass in the object, we say first name is equal to an empty string, then email is empty string, and then the age is empty string. Now let's just set out on a bigger screen, where we go with Susan, then we're looking for Susan at gmail.com. And then the age will be 25. And the moment we add the person, there is, there is our Susan. Now, if you want, of course, you can add also in the JSX that particular age, if that's what you're shooting for. Of course, we're going to go here with age. And then in the first name, instead of the first name, we're going to go with paragraph. And let's just say age, like so. And let's try it out one more time with Anna, Anna at gmail.com. And she's going to be 26. And of course, the moment we add the item, there it is displayed in our list. So that essentially is how we can set up multiple values with the same handle change function. Now, again, are you going to use that all the time? No, but there's going to be some use cases where it's just going to be much faster and easier instead of setting up all these multiple state values and the separate functions that update each and every time you type in the input. In this case, we have the same function. So even if I would have 20 inputs, if I would want to change something around, I just need to do that in one place. Amazing work. We're done with forms. And to take a breather, we will cover use ref. Remember, when we talk about forms, I said that we have controlled inputs, but we also have option of using uncontrolled inputs. And we do that using the use ref hook. So even though there are multiple things that we can do with use ref, the most popular one is targeting the DOM element. And then essentially, in turn, that allows us to set up uncontrolled inputs similar to how we would have it in JavaScript. Now, the file that we're looking for is user folder. And then, of course, we have a setup. And then we have the basics. And in the app.js, of course, I imported that file user of basics. And I'm just rendering the setup. If we navigate to use ref basics, we can see that I have three comments. And essentially, user ref works a lot like use state. However, there are some differences. So as far as similarities, it also preserves the value in between the renders, just like use state. However, the difference is that unlike use state, user F hook does not does not trigger re render. And like I just mentioned, one of the most popular use cases is targeting the DOM element. Just like all the other hooks, we import as a named import or we use react and then dot and then whatever the hook name. Now I'll start with my return because I simply would want to create a form. So I'm going to go here with form element. We'll add right away a class class name will be form just we have somewhat good looking form. And then inside of the form, there's going to be a div 
with an input text, and eventually we'll set up our ref. And then also I would want to have my submit button. So let's go with button, then type. And by the way, type needs to be placed here. Type. And then we're looking for the button. And let's just type here submit button. And we should have a form with a submit button. No surprise there. And now let's take a look at the handle submit. So again, we have the form. We can either place it where we have the button or where we have the form. Again, just to spice things up, I'm going to go with on submit. And then, of course, we'll have our handler. So handle, handle, submit. All right. Awesome. And let's try to submit our form. Const handle submit function. I would want to have access to the event object. So in the parameter, I type E. And then first, I would want to prevent, prevent the default. And then second, I'll set up my use ref. Now, the way use ref works, we would need to come up with a name. So in my case, I'm going to call this ref and then container. And that is equal to a use ref. And now we need to pass in that initial value. So I go with user ref, and by default, I'll set it equal to a no. Okay. Now, next thing, we need to use this value, in my case, a ref container, and then set it equal to a ref attribute. So in this case, I have the input and I have the button. So what I could do is add this ref attribute. And I need to set it equal to my ref container. And once we have invoked use ref and assign it to a container by passing some kind of initial value, and then use the attribute in our input and set it equal to the name that we chose. Now, of course, let's console log just so we can see well, what is actually a ref container. So ref container, of course, that is my name. And we notice something interesting where it is a object and it is a object with the property of current. So now what happens when we submit the form, what are you going to see that since we added this ref attribute and set it equal to a ref container, when we're submitting the current dot value will hold the value of our input. So to showcase that we're going to go with console log here and then go ref container and then dot current. So I'm looking for that current property. And now this, the current property is now our input. So what I could do is just grab the value like we did before. Okay. However, in this case, of course, we're not using e dot target. We're using ref container. So whatever is the name, then current property, which initially is null. And then once we submit the form, it will have the value. So if I'll type something here, and by the way, I probably need to save it first. So if I'll type something in my input, and once I click, I should have some kind of value in the console, but I don't. And the reason why I don't have it is because this should be submit. My apologies, it shouldn't be button, it should be submit. And once we change this around, now, of course, once we type something in input, and once we click, check it out. Now we have the value. So this is going to be that different case where we're not setting up a controlled input. So notice, in this case, we don't have the state value that reflects the value that is going to be in the input. And we don't call on change each and every time we type something in the input. Instead, we use this ref. So use the ref. And then we add this ref attribute. And then in the current property, we're going to have a value. Now, of course, you can add this ref to any HTML element, you're not limited to just the inputs. And then in order to access it, you'll have to go with ref container, and then the current. For example, if right next to the form, I pass in a div with a hello world. And if I'll set up a ref, and I'll create a new container. 
So let's call this div container. Copy and paste. I'll call this div container. I'll still set it equal to null by default. And if I go here with div container now, once we console log when we're submitting, we should see that div container current should point to that div. So let's try to submit. I'll type something. And there it is. Now notice the div container current is pointing to my div. So if you would want to do something specific with this particular DOM node, you can use the use ref hook. Again, the general idea, it preserves the value between the renders, but it doesn't trigger re-render. And then it's mostly used to target DOM nodes. Now, one really cool thing that we can do once we have the general understanding of use ref hook is to focus our input the moment our app renders. So the moment we see the form, we'll right away place a input. Now, since use ref doesn't trigger re-render, I can simply call use effect. I can pass in my callback function, and I don't need to worry about setting up this dependency array. I don't. I can just call it here because it won't trigger the re-render. So for example, again, I go with console log, and then I'm going to be looking for ref container and then dot current. And we're going to go with a ref container, then current, and we're going to call the focus method on it. So what you'll see the moment we render, we're going to get our input text and we'll right away have the focus. So once we refresh, notice the focus is there. And then I can clearly see that in a console log that the ref container current is pointing to that input. That's why I'm able to grab that value when we submit the form. Because again, we just call that dot value property. But what we're doing each and every time we render the application, well, we're adding the focus on the current one. Okay. And we simply can do that without any kind of dependency list because the ref, the use ref hook won't trigger the re-render. So those are the basics of use a ref hook. And probably the most likely use case will be targeting DOM nodes or elements. All right. And up next, we have use a reducer hook. Now, use reducer hook is used whenever we have a more complicated setup as far as the state. So you can definitely use it with simple examples. But to tell you honestly, if you have like a to do list or something like that, I think using just regular use state is good enough. However, as your app gets more complicated, it definitely is a good practice to add use reducer, because essentially, it will add more structure to your state. So you won't be able to add just willy nilly, however you'd want and change the state, it will have to go through certain steps. And that is very, very useful when you work in a team. Again, if you have a simple to do, I don't see a big use case for that. However, as your app gets complicated, then of course, I definitely would suggest using use reduce because it will just add more structure to the initial setup that you have in the state. Now, before we go any further, let me just mention that I purposely picked this example to be somewhat simple in tutorial. And then once you're done with tutorial, I would highly, highly, highly suggest going right away to the projects and then do the use reducer project, because that project will be a bit more complicated. And of course, a better use case for reducer. And before we start working in our setup, let me just showcase what we're going to build. So I'd want you to import from tutorial, then six, the user reducer, and then the final one. And notice how we don't need to go for a specific file. And I'll talk about it in a second. But for now, you'll just looking for that component that is coming from the final. And once you're under, you'll notice that again, we have the form, we have some kind of 
input and I can go here with item. I can add it. And not only I can add the item, but I also have this modal. And notice how the application gets a bit more complex. And that's a good use case for using user user. And if I try to add the item that doesn't exist, then I just have please enter value. And we'll start simply by building this using the traditional setup where we had two values in the state. And then we will refactor it to user juicer. Now, user juicer relies heavily on Redux. So if you're familiar with the Redux, awesome. If you're not, then once you understand user juicer, it is going to be very easy to pick up Redux because a lot of the lingo and the functionality is exactly the same. So first, let's deal with this specific path where we don't have any file name. And we're going to do that by going to a setup here. And then instead of final, we are looking for the setup. So I'm looking for the setup. Of course, I'll change my component name as well. And once I save, I should see the use reducer. Then we navigate to the six and we're looking for setup. And then notice something interesting where I have two files in there. I have index.js and then the model. So here's what's happening. In this particular setup, what we can do is use index.js in the folder. And then once we import, we don't need to go with specific file anymore. Because index.js in every folder, unless you change the setup manually, will be the main entry. Meaning if I, for example, go with import from the folder, and if I have their index JS, it will right away import that index JS. And you'll see that in a lot of people's setup where we have a bunch of folders and then each and every folder has this index. And that index is that main entry in that folder. So in here, I can do whatever I would want inside of that folder but index.js will be that main entry point. So everything at the end of the day will be either imported here or the logic will be sitting here. So I can have as many components as I would want in the same folder, but all of them in some way or shape or form will meet in that index.js. And like I said, we'll just start with a very, very basic setup where we'll still have the form, we will still have the simple state value and all that. And also we'll have a simple toggle as far as the model. And then slowly, but surely, we will refactor it to use reducer. Now let me close some of the folders over here. And notice we have the modal component. And that is the component that's sitting right next to our index js. Okay, beautiful. In the index js, I would also want to import data, import data. And that is, of course, the named import. So we go from and then again, we go a few levels up. We're looking for the data because first, we'll just try to do that using the regular setup. As far as the state values are concerned, I'll close the sidebar, we're going to go here with const and then people and then set people that is equal to our use state. And then we pass in our data. Okay, awesome. And also, I would want to toggle that model. Now, if you check out the model, there's nothing there. There's just a div that I am model, but eventually, it is going to be there. And as far as my state value, I think I'll say show model, and then set show model model. And by default, I'll say that I'll hide the model. So it will be hidden by default. And now, of course, I would want to come up with my return. So let's go again with our fragment here. And then as far as the return, we'll start by just checking the model. What is the show model scenario? So if it is true, then I would want to showcase. We already know how we can do that, of course. 
we have our modal component, correct? So I go with show modal and then I go here with a modal component. So if the show model will be true, awesome. If not, then we're gonna hide that. Now we're gonna go with form. We'll go with form, and I think I'm gonna go with on submit, on submit. And as you can see, I'm kind of keeping up the pace here because we have already covered this before, and we'll have a handle, and then submit, and then of course we need to have a div and then input. It's going to be a text now. As far as the value, well, we'll have to come up with a new state value, correct? So let's just go with text, I guess. I can call it that way. I think it is going to be good enough, or you know what? Let's just go with name. So name and then set name is equal to a use state, and then it's just going to be an empty value for now. Then we'll type name here and then on change. Well, then we'll invoke again our inline function. And then once we invoke it, we would want to go with set name, set name, and then we pass in whatever we're getting back from our input. So event, target, and then dot value. Now at the moment it complains, well, we have no access to event because E is not defined. There it is. Now it is defined. And also the handle submit. So let's just go with const and then handle submit. That is my function. Now I would want to prevent a default, of course. So I'm going to go here with E and then prevent default. Let's invoke it. Let's save. Yep, we should have something there. Then let's add a little bit of styling as well. So let's say here that there's going to be a class name and then form. Let's also add our button. So right next to the div, we're going to go with button type is going to be submit. And let's just right here, add person or add or whatever you would want. And there it is. Now, of course, we have our form. And if I would want to add that item to the people, well, I would need to do that when I'm submitting the form. Correct. So first we prevent the default. And then now I'd want to check if the name is more than just a empty string. If it is a empty string, then of course, I would want to display the model. Now how I can display the model? Well, I can go here with else. And I can say show model, and I'll set it equal to true. Correct. Because now I would want to display it. And I'll say that you know what, the value is empty. Now I'm not going to pass in any kind of values. We'll deal with that once we set up use reducer. So for now, we'll just display that show model. Now, if the name is of course there, if we have typed something, then we can say show model. And again, we'll set it equal to true. So that is also going to be use case where we show the model. And then I would want to add that item to my list to my people. So let's write here that we go with set people, then we'll pass in that new array where we spread out the old values first. And then we pass in what? Well, we pass in the new person. Now new person is going to be an object. So let's say here ID property. And we'll go with new date again, a little bit of cheating, get time invoked. And lastly, to string invoked. And now let's set up a name. Let's say that the name will be equal to our state value. And now, of course, we show the model we added to the people. And then lastly, let's use set set name is equal to an empty string. And now, of course, let's iterate over. So we show the list. So right after the form, we're going to go with people, people then map. And then of course, I'm looking for each and every person like so. And then once I access it, I would want to return the div. And then it needs to have a ID, of course, so key, and then person of that ID. And we're going to go with heading four. 
and let's just display person dot a name. Now, eventually, we'll add the button, but not right now. So let's type some gibberish. And once we add, of course, show modal is not a function because, well, it's not a show modal, it is set show modal. So set show modal as well as here set show modal again let's try it out some gibberish and i can see the item over here and i also can see the model and once i refresh it will also happen if i try to submit the empty value so that would be a scenario if we use these state values and like i said if you have a small application there's nothing wrong with that but as your app gets bigger 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 you would want to have some kind of structure because notice here how we have no problems changing state values however we would like and that's not usually a best use case if you have a big app and if you work as a team you would want to have some kind of guardrails where you're only updating the state in a certain way so that way everyone is on the same page and this is exactly what we're going to do starting from the next video our basic setup worked somewhat okay now let's refactor this sucker to use a reducer and i'll start by removing this people and then show more so we won't need these guys because we'll set up a new one and we're gonna go here again with our array the structuring and we'll set up a state again that is just a name so you can call this burrito if you want but i'm gonna go with state and then we have a second thing a function a specific function by the name of dispatch again you can call this whatever you'd want but a common practice is using this dispatch why well because when we invoke use reducer again we're getting two things back we're getting the state value and then we're getting the dispatch function so similarly how we had with use state now the difference right now is that in the use reducer the first thing we pass in is the reducer function and the difference between the use state and use reducer that each and every time you want to do something with that whole state you always 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 must use dispatch and it's going to go through the reducer and you can think of reducer function as something that takes the old state and takes in something called action, which we're going to cover a little bit later, and then spits back that new state. So you always need to have that reducer function. And the kicker here is that eventually we will move this into a separate file, just so we have less code in our main component. So reducer function, it is just a simple function. So we set up a reducer and then eventually it's going to look for two things. So state, that is going to be the state right before the update and then the action. And you can think of actions of what are we trying to do? Now for now, we'll just leave it blank and we'll get there in no time. So use reducer is looking for reducer. So the function of that will manipulate the state and it will happen once we call dispatch or once we dispatch the action i guess that is more proper way of saying that and then the second one is that initial state now we can set this up as far as the separate variable if you want or you can type it directly in here i think i'm going to go here i'm going to say const and then default state and that is going to be my object now, in the object, what I would want? Well, we had a people, correct? So that was my people array. And for time being, it's just going to be blank array. Then we had show modal, right? So if you want, you can go is modal open. Let's maybe try it out that way. Is modal open. And by default, it's going to be false. So it's not going to be open. And then last one is going to be modal content. Whatever text we would want to place over here. So we'll have a modal content. And in here, let's just start with hello world. Eventually, of course, it is going to be an empty string. And now where we have this use reducer, we pass it that default state. Again, you could have easily set this up as an object right here as well. 
Now, once we have that, of course, our app will break for multiple reasons. For example, there is no show model anymore. So first, what I would want you to do is just save and then slowly, but surely we'll start dealing with these errors. And first, I would want to remove all these three functions if name is there as well as this one, because we won't need them anymore. And where we have show model, well, now we have a state, correct? That is the object. So now what I would want to do, of course, is to change it around and say state, and then is model open, because that is the property that is responsible for showing the model. And then where we have the people, again, we need to go with state and then people. Now, of course, it is going to be an empty array. So don't be upset if there's nothing on the screen. And of course, there's nothing there. So we are in good shape. And before we go any further, let me just pass in two things into the model. Or you know what, let's start with one and then eventually there's going to be another one once we set up the function. So in a model, I would want to set up a modal content and I'll pass in state and then modal content. Again, property that is coming from my state value. And then before we go any further, I also would want to show the model, meaning I would want to add some changes to the model where it's going to be destructuring two things, modal content and eventually close modal function, which we don't have at the moment. And as far as the return, let's add a class name and then I'll add modal. And then inside this paragraph, let's just go with a modal content. So modal, modal content. Let's save. And now, of course, if you want to test it out this manually, the only thing you need to do is just change these values. So we have the data, right? Now, I'm not going to set up adding data because that one we will do through the reducer properly. However, if you want to see whether you can access these values in a state, simply set people equal to the data. Now, of course, you'll have the data, okay? Just to showcase that it is still just an object. We're still accessing that in a state and it is an object and it has properties. So if I would want to show the model, and of course I'll say that it is true because I have state model is open. So if it is true, then show the model and modal content will be hello world. And there it is. Now, of course, I have the hello world. Yes, of course, we will do this dynamically starting from next video. But for now, just understand that we have a state, which is an object. And in that object, we have these multiple properties. And the whole idea is why we're using that user reducer, because I only want to update these things once I call dispatch. And once I pass in the proper action, and I'll handle all of them in one place, it's only going to happen in one place in that reducer, and essentially will just be affecting this state. So now let me go back to proper default values where we have empty string where it is hidden by default and then the people will be an empty array. Now let me save it and now we can start dealing with our reducer. All right. And once we have refactored to basic use reducer setup, now let's see how the dispatch works, how the reducer works. And what is a action in order to affect anything in our state, we would need to dispatch it. And I'm going to do that if the name is there, meaning if it is true, if it's not an empty string. So initially, I'll have to add at least one letter and then I'll click on add. And in here we call dispatch. So that is our function. And we always, always need to pass in the object with a property by the name of type. So that is going to be our action. So action is going to be our object. And then in that object, you must have the property by the name of type. And then you need to set it equal to something. A common practice is using uppercase, but you don't have to. So in my case, I'll just call this testing. And then once you dispatch, once you dispatch your action, that's what it's called. 
then in reducer, you need to handle it. And like I said, reducer is taking as parameter two things state right before that update, and then what action you want to do. So in our case, that is, of course, testing. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind that from reducer, you always, always, always want to return some kind of state. Because again, this is going to be that use case where if you don't return, well, none of the functionality that you have later is going to make sense. So let me just simply start by console log and you'll see how there's going to be a big fat error if we don't return the state. So we get the state right before the update. And then I also would want to console log the action. But if I don't return the state from this function, then this functionality won't make sense. Because now, of course, it is going to be undefined. So once I save and once I add the letter over here, check it out. Now I have cannot read property is model open of undefined. Why? Well, because I had the initial state, the default one that is right here. But since I dispatched the action, then the action went to reducer. And in reducer, I did not return a new state. My whole functionality went bananas because there's no more is model open. That's why you always, always need to return some kind of state if you want your functionality to work. So once I save and then once we add, for example, letter F, once we click, check it out. What do we see in the console? So now, of course, I see my old state, correct? And I also see this object with the type of testing. So that is the state right before the update where we have people array and then is model open and then modal content. So now let's see how we can work with these values. So we have the state and we also have the action. So why don't we go with if statement, the condition, and check whether we are dispatching the action with a type of testing? Let's do it. Let's say if, and then we go with action, then that type, remember that was the property name, and if that is equal to a testing, then we would want to do something. So essentially what you do, you set up your dispatch functions with your action objects where you set up type property with a value. And then in reducer, you catch them. You say, all right, if I dispatch testing, this is what I would want to do. So notice how we are not directly affecting state. It's not like we call set name or set people or set model. We're not doing that. We only control the state when we dispatch the action. And then in reducer, this is where we deal with our state. And essentially, it is more structured. So even though it's a little bit more boilerplate, it is less prone to errors or some kind of silly bugs. So let's deal with our if. So if the action type is testing, well, what I would want to do? Well, I would want to return, correct? I always need to return a state. So in this case, this is a default one now. But now, if the type is correct, if it is testing, then I would want to return that new state. And since it is an object, again, we need to keep in mind that if I just add some kind of property here, then still my functionality will go bananas. Why? Well, because I need to have people, I need to have is modal, and I also need to have modal content. What was the way of getting all those values? Well, we are returning the object, correct? And then we go with dot, dot, dot. And then I would want to copy all the values from the state right before the update, correct? And now we add a comma, and then we just decide, well, what values we would want to change. And for now, we'll just do it manually, where I will say, you know what? People will be equal to my data array. Then is modal open? is going to be actually true. So we'll say the model. And also, as far as the modal content, modal content, well, we'll set it equal to item and then add it like so. Let's test it out. Again, this will only happen when we click on a button, correct? So let me add something here. And there it is. Now I have my list, John, Peter, Susan, Anna, and also I have item added. 
So the next time I will do something as far as dispatch, I will already have this particular state value. And you can clearly see that if you console log. So if we go here with a state, the first time we'll click, notice it is going to be empty. But then if we just click one more time, then of course, we already have the last state value. That's why it's so important to always return the state. Now, as far as this default one, you can return a state if you want. But another way how we can do that is throw the error if the action that you passed in does not match any of the types that you're checking for. For example, here I could go with throw and then new error. And I'll say no matching action type. So where I would use that, for example, if I have here the else, and then I dispatch, and I don't know, by mistake, I'm going to go with type, and then random, random. So once I save, once I click on the button, if my value is not there, if it is empty, of course, I'm going to have a big fat error, where it's going to say no matching error type. So what is happening here? I could technically return a state. Yeah, that is an option. But this just gives me a clue that I'm dispatching something that I'm not catching in the reducer. Because in the reducer at the moment, notice, I have my action. Action, of course, has the type. And I'm just checking for testing. Now, if I would be checking for random, the one that I passed in, of course, that is a different scenario. Then everything would work fine. But this is a good default scenario where I have a bunch of these ifs for all the action types that we're about to set up. And then if none of them match, then we throw the error. Again, the alternative would be just returning a state. And then if we return a state, you'll notice that nothing will happen because, of course, we're not checking for that random. But also the problem might be that you won't notice that, hey, there's something wrong. I'm not checking for this action. That's why the alternative would be throwing the error. So let me delete it. And now let's set up to something useful. Now, what is that useful? Well, instead of testing, I would want to say add item, because essentially, this is exactly what I would want to do. So I'll say dispatch and then type. And now I'm going to go with add and then underscore item. Again, this is just a naming convention where everything is uppercase. And then in between the words, we just use the underscore. That is not a rule. And of course, in the reducer, I would also want to check that. So I'm going to go back to add and then underscore item. Now, everything is awesome. But of course, we understand that we won't return just a data. So this is where I would want to get that value that is coming from the input, and then add to my empty array, the people array. For now, let's just leave it blank the way it is. And we need to decide, well, how we can pass that data. And the way we pass that data is by adding more properties in here in the object. Now, of course, what would help is if I would actually create that item once I'm trying to submit the form. So let's do it this way. I'm going to go with const and then new item is equal. Again, we need to have that ID. So I'll come up with that property new date. And then let's go with get time. And lastly, we'll set it equal to a string. And now I'll grab that name. So whatever is in my state value. And now once I dispatch, remember, I just said we can add more properties. And a common convention is calling this payload. But again, there's no rule. And the way you would do that, you would add comma since it is a new property. And payload is equal to my new item. So now in the reducer, not only I'm checking for the type, which of course I'm doing since I would want to set up some kind of return. But I also would want to grab that payload. So right above my return in the add item condition, I would want to say new items. 
and that is going to be equal to dot dot dot. So let's copy all the values that we have from the default state or the state right before the update, which of course essentially is going to be empty array. But as we keep on adding items, there's going to be more and more items. We go with state items, so whatever array items we have, and then I would want to add action and then payload to the new items. So now where we have the people, I'm going to go with new items. Now, of course, I would want to open up the model. So I will leave is model true. And then of course, I'll also leave item added. So once we say we have a big fat error, because I did not add the space in between new and date. So now let's try it out. I will go with random. And then once I click on add, then I have another issue. Set items is not iterable. And of course, the reason for that is because it is not items. Sorry, it is people. My apologies. So now everything should work. And you know what? Well, we're still in a subject. Let's just call this new people. The reason for that, because in my original setup, I went with items. And now as I'm recording, I just changed my mind. That's why we got this bug. Let's just say random and then we'll add. And there it is. Now we have item added. So we display our model. Beautiful. And then also we showcase that here in our list. Now, what else we would want to do? I guess I would want to clean out my values once I submit. Correct. That only makes sense. So let's do it this way where we have the name right after that. I'm going to go with set name and we'll set it back to empty string. And now let's dispatch another action However, this one will be no value action. So if I try to submit item without any values, then of course, I would want to showcase that in my model. And we'll just change the action around where it's not going to be type random. We'll say no underscore and then value. Now, when it comes to our no value action, and by the way, let's just go with action type is equal to no underscore value. So if that is the case, well, what I would want to do, I simply want to return different modal content, correct? And I also would want to showcase the model. But remember, I still want to return my people, I still want to show my items, correct? So that's why again, we go with return dot 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 state. So we copy everything coming from the previous state state before the update. And then we say show model is true. And also, of course, I would want to add different model content. So I say model content, and that will be equal to a please enter value. Let's save it. And the problem here is that, of course, smart enough, I added in my previous condition. And you know what? Also, the name is a little bit different. It is is modal open like so. And now let's test it out where I'll try to submit empty value. And now, of course, we dispatch the no value. And then in action, we just check again the whole point where we copy these values because essentially we just want to change two properties on that state is model open and modal content. And I want to leave the people the list of people intact. Maybe there's going to be cases, for example, with closing model that will only affect one property. That's why it is very important. Once we return to state, always to copy the values, the previous values from the state, and then just decide, well, which property value we would want to change. And in our previous example, of course, we change all three of them. If you want to dispatch a action, and then change only one thing, just make sure that you copy all the values. If you would want to change two things, again, the same thing, make sure that you copy the values. If you want to change all of them, again, it is a good practice to always make sure that you're keeping track of your old state values. And I think we're in good shape. So now we can add more actions to our arsenal. Nice work. And let's add two more actions, one for removing the item, and then also 
the close model one. So I removed that console log. I don't think we need it anymore. And let me just keep on scrolling. So we added one for no value. And I guess let's start by passing in the close modal function. And the way we'll set this up, notice we have handle submit. And let's also create a function that will be responsible for closing the model. So const close modal. It's not going to look for any arguments. However, within the function body, we will dispatch an action that we haven't set up in our reducer yet. And the type will be close underscore modal. And the only thing that I would want to do as far as this functionality is again to return all the state values and then change is modal to false. We're going to go if action and then type is equal to close and then underscore modal, then return again, copy all the previous state values state. And then let's go with is modal open. And let's set it equal to a false. Now the gotcha here is that I would want to call it in the modal. And I would want to call it after three seconds. So what I would want is to pass this close modal as a prop down to a modal. So let's go with close modal is equal to a close modal, like so. And then once we do that in the model, of course, we can access it. So I'm going to say here, close, close model. And in the model, I would want to set up a use effect where, like I just said, I would want to close it after three seconds. So let's go here with use effect. And then in our callback function, let's just set up a timeout. And let's say we have a callback function. And I would want to go with close model here. And I would want to call it after three seconds. And that, of course, is 3000 milliseconds. So once we type something, first of all, that item should be added. We added the item. But then after three seconds, notice how we dispatch. We dispatch this action of close model. And of course, model is hidden. And similarly, we could add here a button to our items and then remove that item if we click on that button. And for that, of course, again, we'll have to dispatch an action. And of course, we'll have to handle that action in the reducer right below the heading four. Let's go with button. I'll set up on click right away. And then in here, let's pass in our callback function. And I would want to dispatch an action. Now type will be remove item. So type and then we go with remove underscore item. And then I would want to add the payload again. Why? Well, because I need to be specific which item I would want to remove. Now notice in this case, we're not passing that ID. Otherwise, how do I know which item I would need to remove? So again, we go with payload and payload in this case is going to be equal to that person and then dot ID. So once we save, of course, we should be able to see that item. And there it is. And by the way, should have added the item class. First of all, it's going to look a little bit better. And then also I would want to add some kind of text here. So let's say remove. And now of course, let me try and say item. And then once we add, there is our item. Now that is our modal. Okay. It is hidden after three seconds. And now I would want to handle that remove item. So if I'll click right now, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we're not handling that, right? So we should have this error. And this is awesome because at least it tells us, hey, listen, you are dispatching an action that you're not handling in the reducer. So I go with if action and then dot type is equal to remove item, remove, remove item. So within my condition, I'm going to come up with new variable, new people that is equal to state people. And then I would want to use filter. I'm going to access each and every item as far as the parameter of person. And then I'll say person ID does not match to a action and then payload. So if that is the case, then I wouldn't want to return this particular item. 
And now, of course, I just need to return this state. So I'll say here return and then new object. So we go with dot 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 and then state and then where we have the people that is going to be equal to a new people array. We save it. And now what should happen once we click the button, the model shows up for three seconds and it says, hey, please enter the value. Now, if we successfully add that item, for example, we'll say a random item, then once we add it, it displays random item. And of course, we can remove it as well. So that's how we can set up our state using user juicer, where notice how it adds way more structure. And last thing that I would want to showcase is that normally, since reducers are going to have a lot of functionality, you do move them to a separate file. So in a setup, I would want you to create a reducer JS, then take everything as far as the function. So reducer, cut it out like so. And then in the reducer, copy and paste. Now, of course, we would want to export. Now, if you want to export this as default, you can definitely do it. In my case, I will export this as a named export. And here we go with import, then reduce. And then, of course, we are importing this from and then the reducer. And now our functionality should still work, but I just need to make sure it is a reducer. Like so. And now, of course, I can keep on working with my form and everything will work. And now notice how much cleaner and more structured is our application where we have the reducer that just deals with our data. And each and every time we want to do something, we just dispatch this action again. Like I've said this before, of course, it has way bigger use case as your application gets bigger or you get more people on a team. And if you'll go right now to the projects and start working on the use reducer project, you'll see use reducer in a more complex setup. And of course, like I keep on saying, it is going to be a better use case for use reducer hook. Amazing job. And once we have covered use reducer and hopefully worked on practice project as well, I would want to talk about the prop drilling. Now, let me just emphasize something right away where prop drilling is not an official term. However, it is somewhat of the side effect when you have multiple components and then you have the big component tree and then you need to start passing some state from the top component all the way to the bottom of your component tree. And the reason why we'll cover prop drilling first is because in the next tutorial chapter in the use context, we'll see how use context fixes that. And more specifically, we'll take a look at the context API that is designed for that. And then use context hook is the new way how we can access that context. So this is going to be somewhat of a repetition where we will set up a component where basically we have a list and then each and every item in the list has a button and we would just want to remove that item. So a little bit of repetition just to see what is prop drilling and how it looks like. And then in the next chapter, we'll see how we can fix that using the context API as well as use context hook. All right. Now we're going to navigate to our prop drilling folder. We have prop drilling JS, and of course it is in the folder number seven and then the setup file. And in the app, I would want to import, I guess I would want to start with that where I'm going to go with import. I'm looking for setup and then it is coming from the tutorial, then prop drilling, of course, and then the setup. And now we would want to render. So we're going to go here with a setup and there it is. Now, of course, it complains that there is some type of issue. So let's navigate there. We have the prop drilling. Everything should work. And of course, the reason why it doesn't work because I successfully messed it up by not pointing to a specific file. And now, of course, we have the prop drilling. Now, 
once we're here, like I said, a little bit of repetition where essentially we'll create a list and then we will have the items in the list, of course. And then each and every item will have that option of removing itself from the list. Now we do need to have a data here. So let's go with import and then data that is coming from. And of course, we need to go multiple levels up. So I believe three. And there is our data. So once we have the data, now I would want to set up my main component where I have the const, I'll have a list value here. So people again, so set people, set people, and that is equal to a use state. And then we'll pass in that data. So we should have again, that basic array that we already covered before. And now, of course, what I would want is to do some kind of return in my JSX. So let's start by returning a section. So let's go with a section. And then let's write heading three, maybe. And let's just say prop drilling. And also, I would want to have a list. So there's going to be a list component that takes as a prop the people. So we're going to look for people here. And that is going to be equal, of course, to my people state value. And what's missing is my list, correct? So we go with list. And now I already know that I'm going to be looking for people props. So that's why I will destructure it right here without any hesitation. And as far as the return, I would want to iterate over that array because we already know that it is an array. And then for each and every item, I would want to render the single person component that I haven't created yet. So let's just go with return. We will close out our fragment. And then, like I said, we'll just go with people array. We'll use map. Each and every item is a person. And what I would want to return is a single person component that we're going to create in a second. So const and then single person is equal. And now in the single person, again, I know that person is an object. There's going to be multiple properties. If you need to jog your memory, this is our data. So we have ID and name. And what I would want in that single person is to target the ID and name for now. Eventually, there's going to be more data. But for now, we'll just target ID and name like so. And then as far as the return, let's just return a div with a class of item class name and then item here. And for the time being, let's just write single item. So heading four with single item. And now, of course, what I want is where I'm returning. I'm going to go with single person and I'll right away get my ID because remember, we still have the list. So we need to use the key prop. And let's just say here person and then a dot ID. So once we save, we should have four single items on the screen. Now, why do we have four? Well, because my array has four objects. And just so we all are on the same page, we have our array, we set it equal to data, that's our initial value. Then we have the first return, where we have the heading three with prop drilling, and then our list component that takes a prop, and I named it people and I set it equal to my state value of people. Then in here, I destructure right away the people prop out of the props. And I'm returning a people map. So a new array where I'm iterating over people. And then for each and every item in my array, I return a single person component. And then since it is list, I need to pass in the key. And then in this component, of course, I'm accessing the ID and name, which I'm not using at the moment. And as far as the return, I'm returning a single item. So that is something that we have already covered more than a few times when we talk about tutorials, as well as the project. Now here comes the interesting part. Well, what if I would want to set up a function that deletes that one single item from the list? Okay. Let's first set up the functionality. And then of course, we'll do 
with rest of the use case. So we're going to go with const. I'll call this a remove person is equal to an ID because this particular function will be looking for the ID. Then we need to call set people. Then again, just so we can practice a little bit, I'll call this in a function. I'll say my current state value is equal to people. And then let's just return people filter. And then each and every item will be set up as a person. And I'll say if the person ID does not match to whatever ID I passed in, then of course, I'll return it. If it does match, then I'll remove it from the list. So person ID is not equal to an ID like so. Let's save it. And we have the function beautiful. And now the interesting part starts where now I need to get this function where? Well, I need it here, correct? So what are we doing? First, need to pass into the list, then we'll have to destructure it, of course, then we'll need to pass into a single person. And then eventually, we'll also have to use it over here. So the big question is, how can we get this function all the way here? And this is that prop drilling where essentially, we have the component here. And you can make a good argument that this component, the list component does not does not need that remove person function. But there's no other way for us to pass it down to a single person. I mean, I cannot simply say, all right, remove person, you'll be called here in a single person. So single person needs to somehow have access to that remove person. And this is what the prop drilling is, where the list component will have to take the remove person and pass it down to a single person. So first, let's start by passing the remove person as a prop down. And that is something that you need to keep in mind, where when we talk about the functions, we also can pass them as props. We're not limited to just state values. So in this case, let's go with remove person is equal to a remove person. So now I'm passing in my function. Now in a list, like I said, I would need to destructure it. I would need to say, all right, so get me this remove person from my props. And now I need to pass it into a single person. Now I will also need to pass in this ID and name. And like I already previously covered, we have multiple ways how we can do that. But my preference is using this spread object notation, where I just go with curly braces, and then dot, 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 and then whatever is the name of my parameter, meaning this now points to that item in the list. And I'm just saying, you know what, add all the properties, meaning in this case, ID and name onto the props of the single person. And that's why I right away have access to the ID and name. And then again, we need to pass in that remove person. So we'll go here with remove person. So now we're passing it down. And of course, if I'm looking for ID and name, I can also look for remove person prop, correct? Because now we passed it down. So we say remove person. And now let's finally set up our logic where I'm not going to say heading for single item. I'm going to say name here. So I'm going to be looking for my name prop. And also I would want to set up a button where I could set up a on click that will trigger that remove person. So button and then on click is equal to a inline function here. And we'll say remove person. And then I also would want to grab that ID. Each and every item, the single person item will have that unique ID. Correct. And now of course, I would want to invoke my remove person once I click on a button with that specific ID. And then as far as the value again, we write remove. And again, idea of prop drilling is following where list component technically does not does not need to have access to the remove person, but we have no other way to pass down our function into the single person, unless we actually pass it through the list. 
So that is something called prop drilling because we need to understand that there's definitely could be more components. So if we, for example, set up this function all the way up in the prop drilling, what if I'm going to have, I don't know, two, three components down the component tree? So from the single person, I would need to keep on passing and passing and passing and passing all the way down to that one specific component that is looking for that removed person. And that is something that the context API as well as Redux, but Redux is definitely for more complex cases. I wouldn't suggest setting up Redux for this particular scenario, but context API is beautiful for this type of scenario where essentially we can avoid this prop drilling. Okay. Hopefully that is clear. We understand what is prop drilling. And then in the next chapter, we will take a look at how context API helps us to fix it where we won't have to pass in return through the list or any other components we would have into that one specific component that is looking for the function that is all the way up in the component tree. And once we have looked at prop drilling, let's see how context API as well as use context hook will help us to resolve that issue. And first, I would want to start by pointing to a different folder and a file. Again, we're looking for tutorial, then I'm looking for use context, as well as the setup and then context API. So once we render, we should see the prop drilling, and essentially everything that we worked on in a previous video. And that is by design, because this is going to be the use case where we'll have to add a little bit of code as well as refactor our old one in order to see how context API as well as use context works. Now, what you'll notice here is the same exact file. And I would want to start by adding a few things. I'll say use context. So that is the hook that we'll use eventually. And also, you know what? I don't like the same name. So I will remove it and I'll say context API not a big deal, but just makes a little bit of sense if we do that. And then once we have the setup, then let's see. So we have this remove person. And again, the whole deal was that we were passing this remove person through the list and through many other components. Of course, if we would have more components down to that one component that is looking for that particular function. So how we can fix it? Well, first, we will need to create the context. So I'm going to go above the context API, and I need to come up with a name. So in this case, I'll say person and then context. Now that is equal to a react. And then we say dot. And now we're looking for the function of create context. Now we can pass in some default one. But in my case, I won't do it. Now the moment we do that, now we have access to two components, the provider and the consumer. So let's say here two components. And then one is going to be a provider. And then the second one is the consumer. So with the arrival of use context, we won't use the consumer. Previously, before the hook was introduced, we were using the consumer. However, now we don't have to, I'm just telling you that you will get essentially two components back once you set up that create context. And the way you access those components, you're going to go with person context and then dot and then provider or the consumer. So the thing is, provider works as a distributor. So what you would want to do is, for example, this is your root component, correct? This is where rest of the components are rendered because you have a list and then within the list, you have a single person. So you would need to find that root component and then return of that root component. You would want to wrap in person context and then the provider. Let me show you why is that important. So instead of section, I'm going to go here with a person context. And then, like I said, I'm looking for that provider. Now, why is that important? Because for the provider, we have the value prop. And what's really cool 
is that we can pass whatever we would want. So we'll start very simply by passing in the hello. And what's even more cool, I can also use use context to access this value, whatever it is. And to showcase that, if I go to single person, I can simply say const, and then I know that there's going to be some kind of value. So I'll call this data. All right. Now we'll refactor it a little bit later, but for now, let's just say that it is data. And then now let's use our use context hook. And inside the use context hook, we need to pass this context that we created. So please don't mix the two. We have person.context provider that needs to wrap your whole component tree or later in different projects, it will wrap our whole application. Okay, that is important. Please keep that in mind. But when we talk about person context, we need to pass in that context into the use context. So don't mix and match. Don't say person context that provider here. No, here we're looking for the person context, but we would want to wrap our component tree or our whole application in the person context dot provider. Now, of course, I keep on all the time mentioning person context, whatever the name you have over here for the context. Okay, in my case, that is person context. If you would have bananas context, then you would go to bananas context dot provider. And what's really cool that if you log data, you'll notice something really, really interesting. Check it out in a console. I have hello, hello, hello. And isn't that awesome? Because what it means is that I have here person context provider all the way down in my component tree, and I can pass whatever values, regardless of how many levels deep, and I'll have access without this prop drilling. So without passing it through the list. Now you're probably saying, okay, you just pass in a simple hello. I mean, it's not a big deal. Yeah, but remember, we are using JSX, correct? So why don't we pass in the object? Again, we have first curly braces, which just means that we're going back to JavaScript land. And in here, I'm just saying object. Again, this is not some secret JSX syntax where we have double curlies. It just simply means, yeah, I'm going back to JavaScript. And in here, I would want to have an object. Now, what do I really want in that object? Well, I would want a remove person, correct? So here's what I can do. I can say remove person. And now, of course, I need to scroll down. And I know that this is going to be an object. So I can right away destructure it. And I can say remove person. And now you'll notice that our functionality still works. Now, of course, it's going to be a big, fat, massive complaint because the name is exactly the same. So now what I would want is to return or to remove all these instances. I don't need it over here. And I also don't need it over here. Correct. And lastly, I don't need it where I'm setting up my list. So I can remove all of them. Now, of course, data is the same name like I have as far as the import. So now let me remove it. And there it is. Now, my functionality still works. But I was able to go around that list. So if I would have, I don't know, two, three more components that are inside the single person, I would be still able to do it. So we set this up in a root. And then whatever is set up inside here, all of those components will have access to whatever we pass it down into the value. Now, in this case, of course, it was just remove person. But keep in mind that since you're setting up the object, you can do pretty much anything. And similarly, you can argue, well, we can also maybe omit the people. And you're right, because I can pass here the value of people. So the state value, and then I can access it where? Well, in my list, right? So now I don't need to pass it through the component as a prop. I can simply say that I would want to access it using the use context. Now, in order to speed this up, I'm just going to copy and paste. And then notice we have the remove person. Now, in this case, I will showcase that it is an object. So let me call this uh, main data, something like that. 
And if you'll console log, you'll see that, of course, main data will be my object. Now it's going to complain that people is not defined because, of course, now we need to access that main data and then dot people. Now, of course, everything works. Now, the reason why I set up a separate variable, because I want you to understand that in this case, we right away destructured the remove person from the object that we're getting back. In this case, I'm just showcasing that, of course, we're accessing the object and you don't have to destructure. If you want to do it this way, you can do it this way. Whatever is the name of the object, whatever you're getting back, and then whichever property or method you want to choose. So in my case, since I'm looking for the people array, that I just passed in. That's why I go with main data and then dot people and that I'm iterating over. Now, a few things that I would want to mention. I personally don't find it that useful if I have only one level, meaning with the list, I see no problem of passing that people state value as a prop. Where I would introduce the context that is definitely if I have two, three, or whatever levels deep, then it definitely makes sense. And also, a lot of times I stick to setting up it one time globally. And don't worry, we'll cover that in the projects where essentially we cover our whole application in that context provider. All right. And the way we do that, we would need to export the person context, the provider, as well as the main context. And then we would need to wrap it in the index.js. Again, that is something that we'll take a look at in the projects. I didn't see the point of jamming everything here in tutorial. But just keep in mind two things that I have no problem of passing this one level as a prop. Now, some people right away introduce the context. And again, that is their preference. It's just a lot of times I see students where once they learn about the context, they say, well, why we're we still doing the prop drilling. Now, in my opinion, the prop drilling starts when we start passing in two, three levels deep. And essentially, we start passing through the components that don't need that info. When we look at the people that we just passed into the list, and then list was using it, again, I have no big issue over there. All right. Now, Last thing, I guess what I would want to do is just change this title. I'm going to say context API and then forward slash use context hook. So hopefully it is clear how we can avoid passing unnecessary data through the components. And now we can move on to our next topic. Nicely done. And up next, we have custom hooks. And essentially, custom hooks allow us to reuse the functionality. So let me be clear, we're not talking about reusing HTML elements. We already can do that with components. We are talking about the functionality, whether that is fetching data, saving to local storage, and that sort of thing. Also, before we begin, let me just mention that I purposely added only one example of custom hooks, since you can easily find other custom hooks examples so the code that community has created for free use by just typing custom hooks in your favorite search engine. The point of this example is to make sure you understand the purpose and the setup of the custom hooks. So after that, you can either create your own custom hooks or with ease use someone else's custom hooks in your own apps. With that said, let's start by importing the module and the module we're looking for is module number nine by the name of custom hooks. Again, we have final and a setup folder. And of course, in the app.js, we're going to be looking for the setup folder. So we go here with import. I'll name the setup and we're looking in the tutorial and then more specifically folder number nine, custom hooks. And of course, the setup. Now, in this case, there is a file name and we're looking for fetch example. So in this case, I'll remove the heading two, And then, of course, I would want to showcase the setup. So once we load, notice we have loading dot dot dot. And then we have the data. So what is happening over here? Well, if we navigate to our file, the fetch example, 
we'll notice that we'll have somewhat standard setup to fetch data. So we have use state, we have use effect, we have loading state variable, we have set loading, of course, by default loading is true. Then we have some kind of state variable that is called product. Um, initially, it is an empty array. Then we have the function that fetches something. So in this case, this is fetching from my own API. And we use this in my JavaScript course where we have the product. Now, if you want, you can, of course, navigate to a bigger screen. And then copy and paste. It is an array of products. And don't worry, we'll use it a little bit later in tutorial. So you'll see what this is all about. But essentially, it's just a bunch of products with some price with some name and image and all that. So we're fetching that I hit the URL. Of course, I get the response, I run the JSON, and then I set two state values, I have set products, and then I have set loading to false. And of course, I'm running this with my use effect. And I have the empty array means that it runs by default, the moment we run the app, and that's it. And then of course, I'm just console logging the product. Now the point of this is not to tell you that there's something wrong with the setup. The point is to showcase, well, what if I would want to reuse this functionality, because there's no way for me to reuse it. I mean, I can use this with this particular URL. But if I have a different component, that also needs to fetch something. Again, I'm just reinventing the wheel. Now, before we do anything in our custom hook, let me just showcase that if you'll console log, of course, you'll be able to see the product. Now, again, the point is not to set up anything as far as the component, we simply have the loading. So we check whether the state value for the loading is true. If it is, then we showcase loading dot dot dot. And then once we're done with loading, we just display the data. And what you should see in a console are these 12 products. So again, this is not our main concern. If we have the products, that just means that our fetch was successful. Our point is somehow to come up with functionality that we can reuse. So if I'll have another component that also would want to fetch data, I don't need to duplicate these lines of code. And by the way, in this case, we don't have the error. Keep in mind, normally, you would have the error as well. And of course, once we set up our custom hook, we can definitely add error as well. And I already said that we'll be creating a new custom hook. So you can probably already guess that in the second file that is in the folder called use fetch, this is exactly what we're going to do. So if I navigate there, I can see that I have the react, I have use state, and I have use effect. Now, to tell you honestly, we actually don't need the react, we can just use use state and use effect. And then I have this function, I have this use fetch function. So here's what we could do. First, I could save it. And then where we see the fetch example. So our previous component, I can just cut out the lines starting with loading, all the way to where we have the use effect. So let's just grab everything. So starting with line five, all the way to line 17 and just cut it out and then navigate to use fetch and copy and paste. Okay, that's an awesome start. So we still have our loading state value, we still have the products. And of course, we still have the function. Now, if you want, you can rename this something more generic, for example, data. But since we will use them later, so we will use this custom hook later, but we'll still be fetching products. I won't do that. Just keep in mind that you are not limited to calling this product. It's state value. So you can call it whatever you would want. So my whole idea is that I would still want to perform this functionality, correct? But I'm not doing this anymore in the component. So I have my custom hook. And of course, in order for this to work, I would need to return something from this custom hook. And what I would want to return is an object. And then in the object, 
I'm going to place my two state values. One is going to be loading. And then the second one is going to be product. Since I also would want to make this reusable, I will set it up where I'll pass in the URL into the function. So that way, when I call this use fetch later in different components in different topics, I can simply pass in the new URL and I'll still get back my loading, meaning whether that is true or false, and also the data that I'm getting back. So I'm going to say here that I'll be looking for one argument, the URL argument. And then also, I would want to call this use effect when the URL changes. So it's going to run one time when essentially we invoke the function. And also if we change the argument for the use fetch custom hook. So I'll save this beautiful. And now of course, I need to navigate back to fetch example, and I need to import. And as you can see in line number two, this is exactly what we're doing. So we import the use fetch custom hook. And of course, it's coming from the file, the use fetch. By the way, I just noticed that my naming is somewhat off should be use fetch. So of course, in your example, it's already going to have a proper name. But in my case, I would need to change this where this is use fetch. And also my import should be use fetch. Now, once we're done, of course, now I'd want to invoke my custom hook. And this is the case where notice, we are returning a object over here. So normally, when we use use state, since we're returning an array, we did a array destruction. So this is going to be the case where now, of course, I would want to destructure the object, because that is what I'm getting back from my custom hook. So here I'm going to say const, and then loading. So that is the first thing that I'm looking for. And the second one is the product, correct? And then I'm going to set this equal to use fetch. So not use effect, not use state, but my own custom hook by the name of use and then fetch. And now, of course, I need to pass in that URL. And of course, we already have the URL in the component, correct? Because we have the variable by the name of URL, and that points back to my own API. And now the cool thing that you'll notice that once we run, our functionality didn't break. So now we can still check the loading and we can still get the product. If I navigate there, check it out. Once I refresh, I definitely can see that I'm still fetching my products. However, now my functionality is tucked away in a separate place. Now my functionality is tucked away in a custom hook. So if I would want to reuse it, and which is exactly what we'll do in the later topics, just so I can emphasize the point of using the custom hook, every time I would want to fetch data, instead of using use state and setting up the loading, setting up some kind of array, and that type of thing, I will just call use fetch past the URL. And from the function, I'll get back two things, the loading, as well as the products. So like I said, if you'd want to introduce error as well, definitely be my guest. But in my case, we're just going to stick with loading and product. Now, the one thing that I would want to mention that since this is a custom hook, it has to have this use. So for example, if you'll just say fetch, so you're exporting fetch, you'll see a big fat error, even if I change the correct import, because we're not allowed to use hooks inside the regular function. So either the function needs to be a component, or it needs to be a custom hook. That is something you need to keep in mind. So that's why we need to make sure that when we're creating our own custom hooks, we need to use this use. So in this case, I call this use fetch. So now, of course, I just need to make sure that my import is correct. So I'll say here, use fetch. And of course, everything is going to work. Nice work. And up next, we have prop types. 
and effectively prop types allow us to validate our props. So the props that we're passing into component. And in order to get up and running with our example, of course, we will need to import from folder number 10. In this case, again, we're looking for the setup. And then as you can see here, I have the index.js, meaning the main entry. So we just need to look for the folder in the app JS. So we go with import and set up from and then tutorial, of course, then we're looking for the folder number 10, the prop types and then forward slash setup. And we are in good shape. So right after the heading to or you know what, let me remove it. And we'll write here set up. Let me close my component. And I should see the products and then the divs with a single product text. So what's happening over here and what we're trying to achieve? Well, of course, we would need to navigate first to the index JS. And what you'll notice is the imports. So we have import for the product component, which essentially is where we're going to do most of our work. Then we have our use fetch custom hook. And if you didn't watch the last example, the last topic, then please do so, because I'm not going to go over what is happening with use fetch with our custom hook. So we import from the folder from the final folder in this case. And then of course, I have the URL, which I pass into the use fetch. And that's the nice thing about the custom hook, because now every time in a project when I want to fetch some data, I can simply use my use fetch then pass in the URL. And I know that I'll get back two things. I'll get back the loading as well as the product. Now, in my case, notice how I don't need the loading. So I'm not using it. So I'm just getting the products. Again, this is just to emphasize the cool thing of custom hooks, where now, of course, I don't need to set up use states, I don't need to set up use effects, everything is already done in the use fetch custom hook. Now, with that said, of course, I'm grabbing the product out of my return. And then I have the section with the class name of products Then I'm iterating over those products. And then for each and every product, I'm returning a product component. And then of course, we need to pass in the key prop that is equal to a product dot ID. And I'll show you the API in a second. And then we do the object spread operator where I pass in all the properties from each and every product into the product component. Beautiful. Now, I guess we'll start by checking out the API. And essentially, I set up this API myself, just so we can have the example. And of course, what you could do is again, navigate to a browser, and then just copy and paste URL. And you'll see that again, we have some kind of array. And then each and every item in the array is an object which represents product. And in there we have the ID property, we have the name, we have some kind of image, of course, if you want, you can open this up. And then we also have the price. So far, so good. Everything that we have covered already before. And we can probably already imagine that in that product component, well, we'll have to access those properties one by one, correct? We'll need to have the name, we'll need to have an image with the URL more specifically, as well as the price. So let's try that out. And let's see where prop types come in handy. So I'll open up the sidebar. And I'll check my product. Like I said, at the moment, the single thing that I'm returning is just single product text. But of course, I would want to change that around and access those properties, because I know that I'm passing in them in correct? In the index.js, we do pass them in. So it's not like they're missing. But there's going to be a gotcha. And I'll look for my image, I'll look for my name, and I'll look for my price. So now, of course, in the return, well, I would want to make it a bit more interesting, where I'm going to return article with the class of product that still stays the same. But then I'm going to look for heading four. And I'm going to say, you know what, show me the name, get me whatever is the name of the product. 
and so far, so good. We have Utopia Sofa all the way to a sofa set. All right, so that worked. We got our prop by the name of name, and of course, we can display it. However, what do you think is going to happen when we try to do the same thing with a price? So let me access here the price. And what you'll notice that all of them have some kind of price, but the last one, for some reason, displays nothing. And that some reason is simply because in this API, well, all the objects have those properties apart from the last one. And I did this in purpose because if you have ever worked with APIs, you know that you're not always guaranteed some kind of value. Yeah, for the most part, of course, if you have an array of objects, the values for the properties will be there. But once in a while, with some images, with some prices, some of the values might be missing. So here the problem is that I'm relying on the fact that I will for sure have this price. But the question is, well, what if on the data that I'm iterating over that property so that value is not there? What then? Because yeah, it's nice to say, yeah, I would like to get the price, but if the price is not there, what are my next steps? And what's even worse is because we have the image and image purposely, I set it up as an object in the object. I'm looking for the URL. Now, what do we know about JavaScript? If I'll try to access the URL property on the image that is undefined, in my last object, you'll see that we'll get a big fat error. So what I'm trying to showcase that even if 99 out of your 100 items have all the properties, if one of them is going to be missing, since you're checking for the property that is in the object, you'll get a big fat error. And of course, you'll have to deal with that. Showcase that I'm going to go here with an image. And then what I would like is, of course, set up my return. Then I have my source. And then remember, we need to go for image and then dot URL. All right. And now, of course, for the alternative, we'll also go with a name. So once I save, like I said, there's going to be a big fat error. Now, why is that error? Well, it's simply there because I already mentioned a few times that we are getting the property that is on the object. And even though for the rest of the items, image property is right there, the last one doesn't have it. And since I'm checking the property on undefined, of course, React is complaining. And if you ever see this kind of setup, first of all, I would suggest not freaking out. And what I mean by that, a lot of times I see students right away going for a question and saying, hey, listen, there's something wrong with my project because, well, I cannot access the property. I have this undefined. If you ever get this case, what you simply need to do is just make sure that you're turning some kind of static value. And then one by one, you start checking, hey, listen, what is happening with my props? Now, why do I want to return a static value? Well, because of course, I don't want to access them dynamically because that will always throw the error. So always, always, if you ever run into some kind of issues like that, I would suggest, in this case, commenting out and then saying some kind of value, some kind of return is going to be heading for and then again, back to single product. I'll save it. And now, of course, I would want to check, hey, listen, what is happening? Where is my image? Where is my name? And where is my price? So once we go back, of course, I'm going to do that in the bigger browser window. And I can see that something's off. So yeah, for some of them, I have the values, but then I see those undefined. And of course, now I would want to set up the prop types that essentially would check that for me. And the second thing that I would want to do is set up some kind of default values. So first, let's start dealing with those prop types. And what's really cool, as far as the prop types, we don't need to install any extra package. It is coming right away by default when we set up create react app and we go with prop types and then from and the package is exactly the same. It is called prop types. So 
So notice how this one is with an uppercase. And that is done on purpose. Because in order to set up prop types, we'll have to set up a prop types property on the component. So we go with the name of the component. In this case, it is a product. And then we go with prop types. So that is the name of the property. Keep in mind, this is an import from the package. And then this is the property on the component that is always going to be there. And then we just say, hey, listen, what kind of props are we getting? So if I have image name and price, then the same way in this object, I'm going to say that I'm going to be looking for image prop, and then I need to run my import, the prop types. And then of course, we have multiple prop types, whether that is a string number object, or whatever JavaScript value. So in my case, I know that image is going to be what? Well, it's going to be an object, correct? So I go with prop types, then I go with object. And then since I would want prop types to yell and scream if something is missing, we also add this is required. And effectively, for every prop that you have, you would want to do the same thing. Now, in my case, I have name and price. So just copy here. Then since it is a JavaScript object, I just need to add a comma, and of course, change the names. So I'll change it to name. And also change it to a price. Now, in this case, of course, I'm not looking for the object. I'm looking for the string. Like I said, we can add whatever JavaScript value would want. And here we go with number. Now, since I set them up as required, what you'll notice in the console, now we don't need to go and manually check and say, hey, listen, is one of them without the image in price, because I can clearly see that in my console where I have the warning that says failed prop type, prop image is marked as required, but then the value is indefined. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't point me back to that specific product, but at least it tells me, hey, listen, there's something off. You need to do something because the props that you're expecting, well, in one of the items, they are missing. So that's step number one. Now, the next thing that we can do is start using either the short circuit operators, or we can set up default props. So first, let me show you how we would set up a default props. And then from then, we'll take a look at the short circuit operators as well. And the way we set up default props, simply because I don't want those big fat errors, if the image is missing, is like so, where we go with product, and then the property name is default props. And it's as straightforward as it gets, where again, I write my props. By the way, here, I need to have a equal sign. And then of course, what is going to be a default prop if that prop is missing. So I go here with default name. If the name is missing, then I go with price. Now for the price, I'm just going to go with 399. Just in case it is missing. Remember, the last one also had the price missing. And then we have the image. So in here, I'm going to go with image. But it would help, of course, if I would show some kind of image, correct? So that could be either URL, or in our case, if we check out our project, we should see the assets folder. So right next to tutorial, notice we have the assets folder. And in there I have default hyphen image JPEG. And this is going to be the case where I'll also show you how we can import images into our components when we work with create react app. So what we would want to do in that file in the component where we want to use, we're going to go with import, then we need to give it some kind of name. So in my case, I'm going to give it somewhat explicit name and somewhat long, I'm going to go with default image. And then we need to navigate to that folder. So this is going to be three levels up. Because of course, now we're in the product. So we need to go first to the prop types, then to the tutorial, and then eventually we need to be in the source. And this is where we look for assets. So we go dot dot, and then we leave one folder, then dot dot next one. And then finally, we arrive at assets. And then since it is not a JavaScript file, 
we need to go with default and then hyphen image and then JPEG. So essentially, you need to have a full path, including the extension. Okay, hopefully that is clear. And now, of course, what I could do is just say default image. So if the image is missing, then of course, this is going to be set up as a default image. And now what are we doing next? Well, now I can save. And of course, I can try to uncomment. So I'll uncomment. And of course, I can see something beautiful. So that is not that bad. I can see that I have all these products. Okay, good, good, good. And by the way, there's extra single product that I don't need. And then for all the products that have those properties, life is great. But then the one that is missing, remember the last one, not only the image was missing, but also the price was missing. Now I can see that I see that default price. So that's already a good start. However, there's one more problem where now, of course, this image is an object, correct? So even though I set up default value for the image, when I'm going with image.url, well, I still cannot see the image. Why? Well, because there is no URL property on the image that I'm providing. So we'll also need to take a look at how we can use short circuit operators in order to fix that. Now, before we go any further, though, I would just want to showcase that as far as the image, we can import it in any file we would want. So if we go back to index, and if I'll just copy and paste the path, because of course, it's going to be exactly the same. And if I would want to place my image, I'm just going to go with image, then source. And then of course, we're going with default image, just to showcase that each and every time you would want to use it. And by the way, I need to place it above the URL. That's why it's not working. Then, of course, I can use my image. Again, same setup is going to be for every component. So you can set up your images. And then as far as the import, you just need to give it some kind of name. And then, of course, the full path because it is not a JavaScript file. So that should cover my images. And I'll just comment them out for your reference. But now let's finally deal with this product. So I have the product, I have some props that are there, some that are not. Technically, I was able to fix somewhat a lot when I talked the default props. But there's also another way how we can set up those default props. So I'll comment this out for your reference. And now I'll take a look at another way. Now, yes, there's going to be a big fat complaint. But first, I would want to showcase that we can use or operator. So if I know that price might be missing, what I could say is, get me the price. If the price is not there, then we use or operator, and then we can add that default value. So in this case, I can go with 399. Now the problem is going to be that we'll still have this error. Because when we check for this URL property on the image, we cannot use this or I cannot say, yeah, get me the property on the object. But if the image is undefined, well, this won't make sense. So even though you might think that, yeah, I could just check for default image this way, it's not going to fix the situation. Because JavaScript still complains that we're trying to access the property on the undefined, which of course is going to be our last project. And this is where the and operator comes into play, where we can set up some kind of variable. In my case, that is going to be URL, where I can say, you know what, if the image is there, only then get me back the URL. So if the image is there, then get me URL. If the image is not there, well, then it's just going to be undefined. So that way, what we're doing is we're only checking for the URL if the image exists. If the image doesn't exist, then we're not even checking it. So the last product, of course, it doesn't have the image, it is undefined. So if that is the case, we're not even checking for that URL. So in that case, you'll notice that I nicely display that default image. Because for all the products, 
I'm checking for the image. Image is there. And then I get back the URL. And then, of course, I display the URL over here. However, for the last one, since the image is not there, I'm not checking for the property that is not on the object. So I don't get the error. And then in here, I say, well, you know what? If this is falsy, then just display the default image. And of course, I can do the same thing here for the name. If I would want, I could use my or operator. So that's how we can use prop types in React. And before you ask the question, well, why we won't use it all throughout the projects as well as the remaining of the tutorial, the simple answer is that, well, it is adding too much code. And in my opinion, it just gets a little bit messy. So since our goal is to learn whether that is building the project or working on specific part of the tutorial, that's why I will avoid using a bunch of these prop types, because in my opinion, they just make our files bigger and harder to read. Now, one last thing before I let you go is the fact that, of course, you can set it up the prop types using the snippets as well. So I'll just create some testing file here, testing JS. And if you'd want to add prop types, you just go here with this P. So you have R A F C and then E is going to stand for the export. But then if you add this P, you'll also right away get this prop types. And then of course you export the testing component. And then one more thing, if you want to have a shortcut where you're setting up the prop. So for example, I could go with name prop. And then if you want that e is required, then you go with PT. And then whether that is an array or string or whatever. So in my case, I'm going to go with a and then if you want required, then you just go with R. And then notice you have prop types array, and then e is required. So those are just the shortcuts that you can use. And those are use cases for prop types, where they first allow you to see which props are missing. And then when you combine them with short circuit operators, you can just make sure that if the prop value is not there, you have some kind of default value. So far, all our examples were in the same page. And even though it works for our tutorial, when it comes to real apps, it's nice to have multiple pages. Now, when we talk about a JavaScript, frameworks, we are not talking about traditional HTML pages. In that case, we have a new term, a single page application, which just means that we have our one page, in this case, where we have div with an ID of root. And instead of going back to a server and requesting info about the pages where the user navigates, we set up a routing on a client side without the page refreshes. To give you a visual example, navigate to app.js and then import. And uh, as always, you can call it whatever you would like. In my case, I'm going to go with final, of course, from and then we're looking in tutorial, then we're looking the folder number 11, and the final folder. So here where we have the advanced react, in this case, I'm just going to add my final component to give you a good understanding what we're going to create. So notice here how we have the nav bar, and then we have three links. And check out the URL bar as well as this refresh icon, where notice as I'm going from one page to another one, I'm switching the URL, but we're not doing a full page refresh. So each and every time we navigate to about or people or home, we're not going to a server and fetching the data and then coming back. Instead, all of this is happening on a client side. And of course, this is what we're going to create in the following videos. Now, when it comes to React, it does not have built in routing, and we'll need to use an external package for that. And the most popular routing library in React land is by far the React router. But let me be very clear, it's not part of the official React, even though it might seem so because of its popularity, it is still an external package. If you check the folder for React Router, you will find a markdown file 
with more info. So what I would want right now is to remove my example. Hopefully you can see what we're going to create and then navigate to react router folder. And then you're looking for react router info markdown file. And in here, you'll find a link to official docs, just so you can see where I'm getting the information from. And also keep in mind that for your own project, you'll have to install the react router DOM first. And you do that by running npm install react router DOM. Now, of course, I already installed this. So if you go to package JSON, if you check out the packages, you'll see that there is react router DOM, and more specifically, the version of 5.2. Now, just to showcase how we would install the package, I'll stop the dev server. And then again, we'll run npm. And remember, what was the command? It was npm install and react router and then DOM. So that's what you would need to do in your own project, you would install the dependency, and then it's going to get added to the package JSON. And then of course, you can start using it because you'll see that there's going to be some imports in the upcoming videos. Now let me start up the server again. So we go with start. And the last thing that I would want to mention, as far as the react router general info is the version number, it is safe to say that you'll be watching this in the future. And just like any other software, of course, there's going to be some updates. So if you're watching this, and if you install it, and you can see that the version number is already, for example, six, then of course, you'll have to go to docs and see what are the changes if there are any, and most likely there will be as far as the syntax. So the syntax that we're about to cover is for version five. Keep that in mind. Once they switch to a different version, it's a good chance that also some syntax will change as well. Now you'll still be able to use this syntax if you go with this specific version. But if you want to use a newer version, if it is available already at the time, then of course, you'll have to go to a docs and then make sure that you follow the proper syntax that relates to that specific version. Nice. And once we're done discussing the general concept of React router, now of course, let's get to work and set it up in our own application. And first, of course, we would need to navigate to app.js. Then we're looking for folder number 11. And you can probably already guess that we're going to go with the setup folder. And you would be correct. So we navigate to tutorial, then we're looking for folder number 11. And then we're looking for the setup. Again, I have there the index. So the main entry point. So we don't need to show specific file. And then of course, instead of this random text, the react router one, I'm going to go with a setup component. Awesome. Now it's still going to display the same text. So you're not hallucinating. But now of course, I would want to navigate there. And most of the files that you'll find in a setup folder are going to be our pages. Now, if that is a bit confusing, don't worry, once we set up the router, you'll see how it works. But essentially, we have about error, we have also the home as well, nav bar, people and person. So everything apart from index where we're setting up our react router, and then the nav bar where we display the links, those are going to be our pages. Okay, hopefully that is clear. And that once we have that out of the way, now let's navigate to index.js. And notice how I'm importing all the pages. So once we set up the router, depending on the URL, we'll display that specific component. For example, there's going to be a home page, as well as a single person page. Now, in order to get up and running with the react router, we'll need to import from the package from the react router DOM, the browser router, and a common practice is giving it an alias. In this case, we're giving it an alias of router, and then a route, 
as well as the switch. So one by one, of course, we'll cover what each of them does. In this case, let's start by setting up our return. And this is the part where we would want to wrap all our index return into the router. As a side note, normally when you work with react router, you'll wrap your whole application. Again, in this case, since we have a separate folder for each and every example, that's why we're wrapping the return of index.js. Just keep in mind, when we will be working on our projects, we'll go over how we wrap our whole application. So essentially, the setup is going to be exactly the same. But the difference is going to be that router will wrap our app.js or the index.js doesn't matter, whichever place you pick, as long as it is a root component, because that way, of course, your whole application can access the react router and can use it. In this case, only the setup folder, uh, of course, the final one, where we have the final code can use the react router down. So with our router in place, now we need to set up the routes. And essentially, it just means that in the URL, when we navigate, whether that is the home page about, well, then we display that specific component. Like I said, these are just components, but I gave it a comment of pages. So these are just components that will become our pages. And the way we set them up as pages, we're going to go here with a route, then we have a path prop. And this is a specific prop. So make sure you name it exactly the same. And then this is where we showcase well, what is going to be our URL. And the first one I would want to showcase is the home page. Now for the home page, we just go with forward slash. That just means the domain. Now in this case, of course, our domain is localhost 3000. But then normally you would have cnn.com or I don't know, google.com or whatever. Just think of the domain for your application, whatever is going to be. So that is going to be the home page. And then once we have the route component inside that route component, this is where we display whichever component we would want. So keep in mind, technically, if you want, you can place whichever component your heart desires. Because even though this says that, yeah, it is going to be a home page, you can easily place here people component as well. Keep that in mind. But of course, in my case, since it is a home page, I also have a home page component meaning the component by the name of home. And then, of course, I'm displaying it. Now, in order to make it a bit more interesting, I'm going to copy and paste one, two. And then, of course, I'll add about as well as people. Now, for the about, what is going to be my URL? Well, if the forward slash is the home page, let's say that for the about page, I'm going to go with forward slash about. But again, you are in charge. If you want to write about shake and bake, that just means that this is going to be the page where you navigate. Okay, keep that in mind that you are always in charge. Well, what is going to be your URL? Now, in my case, I'm just going to go with forward slash and about. And of course, in order to showcase my about page, I'm going to say that once we navigate there, I'm going to display the about component. And finally, I'm going to go also with a people. And you can probably already guess that we're going to be going to a people page. Now, the moment we refresh notice, now I have the home page. Now, why do I have it? Well, let's check it out. If we navigate to a home just our home component, this is what we have. So if I'll go here and say shake and bake, you can probably already guess that will display the paragraph with that specific text. So hopefully that is clear. We have our home page. And now, of course, in the URL bar, since we haven't set up the nav bar yet, if we go with forward slash and then about, we should. And let me emphasize something because there's one gotcha. We should see the about page. And once I press, yeah, I can see the about page, but there's a tiny issue where I can also see the home page. Now let's try it out with people. So in the URL bar, go here and say forward slash, and then people. And let's see what we're going to get. 
And again, same thing. I can see that I have the content from the people page. And if you want to check it out, here it is. Essentially, I have my data here. I set up the state variable and I'm just iterating over. And don't worry, it's going to make sense once we get to URL parameters, why we have this specific setup. Most importantly, what is happening here? Why we have homepage with shake and bake and then the people page, even though technically we are in the people page. Well, you see what's happening by default when it comes to React Router. If the path matches, it's going to display both components. And as you can see by the URL, well, for the home page, it also matches the about, correct? And then it also matches the people. That's why when we navigate to people, to about, or whatever page we will set up, it will also display the home page because technically the path matches. Now, in order to fix that, we would need to add another prop where we say exact. So once we save, you'll notice that now only the exact path matches, whether that is people or whether that is about or whatever URL you'll set up. And only once I go back to my domain, then of course I can see the home page. Now, if you want, you can add this exact path to every route. That is totally up to you. But in this case, since I don't have any nested pages, so there's not going to be about forward slash and something else, I'm just going to avoid that. Just keep in mind, you're not limited to adding this exact to only the home page. You can add it to every route and that way only the exact match will be displayed. So that would be a basic setup for React Router where we have a router, we wrap our whole app, meaning in this case, of course, it is just the index JS in the setup, but normally you would wrap the root component and then you have routes. And then for each and every route that you have, you just set up a component, whatever you'll place in that component in return is going to be displayed. And then we need to remember about the path prop, where essentially we say, well, what is going to be the URL as far as the home page is just going to be a forward slash. And then you can come up with your own components. Of course, the ones you'll display as well as the URL, just go with forward slash and then whatever the name you choose. And then in order to set up exact match, you just need to add this exact prop. Nice and easy. Now we're familiar with React Router Basics. So now, of course, let's make things a bit interesting and talk about the error page as well as why we'd want to use a switch component as well. And as far as the error page, well, if we go right now to the URL and if I go with forward slash and then hello, what do you think is going to happen? I have three pages. I have home, I have about, and I have people. However, in the URL, well, I'm navigating to a hello. And with our current setup, the only thing we're displaying is a empty page. It would be a better experience if at least we would tell the user that, hey, listen, such a page doesn't exist. And then he or she can navigate to some different page, most likely the home page. And of course, the answer is that, yes, that would be a better setup. And the first thing we would need to do is go with error page. So, of course, that is going to be our component. But as far as setting up the route, it's going to be a little bit different where we go with a route component. And then for the path, we go here with the star. So instead of setting up forward slash error or not found, we just go here with a star. Now, what star means that it will always, always match. And of course, in here, I would want to display the error component. And now you'll see that I have my error page and technically everything works nice. Now I have my hello. We haven't covered links yet. So don't worry. Eventually we will add here a link that allows us to navigate to a different page, but at least it's a good start. Once we navigate to a page that doesn't exist, whether that is a hello or shake and bake, then of course we have the error page. Now the problem here is going to be a bit different where once I navigate to a homepage, I can see the error page. 
once I navigate to a about page, I'll also be able to see the error page. Why? Because this one always matches. And this is where the switch component comes into play. Where we go with a router, and then we'll have our switch component, and we'll place all our routes in the switch component. And with a switch component, only the first one that matches is displayed. So that way, if I go to a home page, then I can only see the home page. If I go to about page, of course, I'll have the about page. But if I'll nicely go to a hello, since this one always matches, we have the error page. That's how we can set up error page with a switch component in React Router. Nicely done. I think we're making a good progress. So now let's talk about the links. Because even though we could technically leave it the way it is, where the user needs to navigate using the URL bar, you would have to agree that probably that is not the best user experience. And for that, of course, we would create a nav bar. Now, I already created the component. So the only thing we need to do is place it inside the router. Now, again, please don't place it within a switch inside the router. So right above the switch, we're going to go here with a nav bar. And at the moment, the only thing we have is some kind of text. So now, of course, let's navigate to our nav bar component. And this is where I would want to set up a unordered list. So I'm going to go here with unordered list and then list item. And then instead of going for traditional link, like we have been doing already in the HTML, in this case, you need to import a link from React Router DOM. And then again, there's a specific prop, and that is two. So you go here with link, then two prop. And this is where you specifically need to say, well, where I would want to navigate. And in this case, I'm going to go with a home page. So, of course, the only thing I do is match whatever was my setup in the index. So, for the home, I had a forward slash. So, of course, if I would want to navigate back to a home page, well, I would just use two prop and then forward slash. And here I say home. Now, I would want to make two more items and I'm looking for about and then people. So, first, let's just change this text around and we'll say people. And also, we, of course, need to change the URL. So if for about my URL was forward slash about, and of course, make sure that it matches. Otherwise, you'll navigate to a error page. Not the end of the world, but probably also not something that you're looking for. So let's save it. And there it is. Now I have my links. So instead of using the URL bar, now what I can do is just say, hey, show me the people page. And as you can see, like I said before, now we're just displaying the people component. Then we go to about and then we go to home and we can already put two and two together. If this link component allows us to navigate to a different page, not only I can use it in a nav bar, I can also use it in the error. Correct. So I navigate to error. Notice here how I have imported already a link component. Just keep in mind that that is a named import. So make sure you add the curly braces. And the only thing that is missing here is link to then we go, for example, to a home page. Again, you can navigate to whichever page you'd want. I'm just going to a home page. And just to add a little bit of CSS, I'm going to go with class name. And we're going to go with BTN. And let's just say back home, back and then home. And now let's try it out where not only, of course, I can navigate around with my nav bar, but I can also do it here where I say forward slash and then shake and bake. And now I have the error page. Now, in this case, if I would want to navigate back to the home page, either I can use the nav bar, which is still there. And by the way, this is somewhat important. We'll notice this nav bar will be added to every page. So these are my routes. This is where we're setting up everything with a switch component. But navbar will be added to every page. 
So that will be displayed on every page, regardless which page it is, starting with home all the way to error. So if I want, of course, I can navigate back using the navbar. Or can if we go to a hello, the page that doesn't exist, I also have a nice link that says back home. I click it. And of course, I'm back home. We're almost done with our basic react router setup. But before we move on to a different topic, I also would want to cover how we can deal with a list. So in this case, notice I have the list of people, which is of course, coming from my data, correct? If we navigate to a people component, like I said, I import data, the file, the data that we have been using all throughout tutorial, I set up this use state hook, where I have people and set people. And in here, I just iterate over my list, and then display the name of the person. But now what I would want is to set up some kind of placeholder, where we can imagine that this could be a list of blog posts, or list of products or whatever, some kind of list of items. And then once we click on that one specific item, we go to that placeholder page that just grabs the item that you clicked on, and then displays it. So essentially, I don't have to create four different pages for each and every item in a list or 20 different pages, depending on how big is the list. In this case, I can just create one placeholder. And then regardless whether I have 4000 items or four items, the moment I'll open up that placeholder, I'll grab that specific ID or some kind of data that is specific to that item, and then display only that one item. And if you're a little bit iffy of what I'm trying to make, well, just hang with me and we'll be in good shape. So I have my list of items, correct? I display them, of course, by iterating over my list. But what I would want is to set up that placeholder. And we can do that if we navigate to index.js and I already have this person component. So if you navigate to a person component, you'll just see that we have a person component. And then it has a text of person, just like the other components that we used for pages. Now, though, I would want to set up different things in index.js, where this is my person component. And I'm going to go right above the error, where we set up the route. So that will still say the same, where we go with route, or the values are going to be a bit different. Because in this case, I would want to go with path. And then instead of just forward slash, we also add something called URL primers. So the first part, the beginning part can be up to you. You can either go with forward slash and then you can set up the URL parameters. And by the way, those are going to be in React Router, the colon and then whatever name you would want. So in this case, you can go with ID, you can go with name. It's up to you. Again, this is just going to show up once we start accessing that value. So naming is up to you. Just remember that name because you'll have to use it. So in this case, I'm going to go with ID. But remember, I said the beginning part is up to you. If you want, you can write person and then forward slash and then, of course, colon and ID. If you don't, you can simply write forward slash and then colon and then ID. So this beginning path, you can make as long or as short as you would want. And then in here, we do a little bit differently, where we don't place that component inside, we go with children, and then we set up well, which component we would want to display. So this person component will be our placeholder. So each and every time we will navigate to a person, and then some kind of ID, we will display this person component. Now the difference is going to be that in that person component, we will grab that ID and fetch that data. So in our case, that is going to be that one specific person. Hopefully that is clear. We have our placeholder. We used our URL parameters. In this case, 
I am named this ID, but you'll see in a second that the name is definitely your choice. And now what I would want is navigate back to a people. So let me find my people array. And in here, right next to the heading four, I would want to set up a link. Okay. So I have imported the link component and I'll say here heading four. And now, of course, I have my link component. Now, the difference and now is going to be that check it out. We're iterating over the list, correct? And I have each and every ID available for the person. We already know that that's how our data is structured. So now when we set up two, we need to set it up dynamically. Now, what do I mean by that? We set up curly braces and then we go with a template string where I say that I'm going to be navigating to a person. So the only reason why I'm adding this first part is because in the index, I also added this person. If you don't have it, if you just have the forward slash, then of course, don't add it. In my case, I did add the person. So that's why I need to make sure that they both match. Then I have another forward slash. And this is where I place that ID. So I know that in the data object, I have that ID. So the only thing I need to do is go with person and then ID. And what you'll notice that the moment you click on any of the links that we're about to display, they will all open the same page, that person page. The difference is going to be in the URL where the IDs will change. So within a link, we can just write whatever we would want. So in this case, I'm going to say learn more. And once we save, notice these are my links. And like I said, every time you click on them, we're still opening the person page. So we're still navigating to the person and then ID. And then, of course, since in the children, the value was person component, that is what we're displaying. The difference is going to be the URL. Because notice now we have person and then one. So if we navigate to the third one, we have person then forward slash three. And hopefully you get the gist. So now, of course, the question is, well, how I can access that value? Because the idea in the person is somewhat simple. Where in the person, I would want to grab that value. And then in my case, I'm just going to look for that specific person in my data array. Now, again, this is oversimplified example. Normally, the way it works is you have list of blog posts of list of products, and then you already fetch them from the API. But then if you would want to have a more specific info, then of course, you fetch it one more time. So you set up the link where you navigate to your placeholder page, and you pass that ID. And then in that placeholder, this is where, again, you set up another fetch. Now, in our case, since data, of course, is local, I don't have to do that. So I purposely didn't want to overcomplicate things, but just understand that this is oversimplified example. And in order to access that, we need to use use params hook from React Router DOM. So again, this is coming from React Router DOM where they provide this hook that allows us to access the parameters. Now, just to showcase that we can name our URL parameters however we want, I can go with a log and then we go with use params and then let me invoke it. And what you'll notice that the moment I navigate, for example, to John, I will see, of course, my placeholder, my person, and then in here I have the object. So in the object, I have the ID property and the value is equal to a one. Now, one gotcha, though, is that this will always be a string. And if you remember our data, it was a number, correct? So that sometimes might trip you up where some APIs have their IDs as strings and some of them have as a number. So, for example, if their strings, no big deal. Once you pass it through the React router, you'll be still in good shape. But if they're numbers, then of course, you'll have to keep on watching because in the following few minutes, we'll fix this issue where 
this is a string, and that is very, very important. However, keep in mind, this name is an ID. So what that means is when I was setting up my index, and when I say person, and then the name of my URL parameter was ID, if I change this around to a orange, you'll notice that the value doesn't change, it's still going to be one. So still within the people, we can navigate around because we just pass in the value. However, the name, of course, is the orange. So this is where I'm trying to make a case that, of course, naming is, as in most cases, up to you. So I have ID. I'm showcasing these placeholder. So now I would just want to have a simple setup where I'm going to display, well, which person is actually the one that I have clicked on in the people. Because for now, I'm just displaying the person. Correct. And the way we do that is navigating to person JS. And then I would just want to get that value. And since I'm getting back the object from use params hook, I can simply say that it is going to be an ID. And I'll say use params. Sorry, not use effect. I'll say use params. So that should give me my ID. I know that I'm getting back the object and I'm just destructuring the object. Then I also would want to set up some kind of state value. So I'll say const and then I'm looking for name and then set name. And that is equal to use state. And for now, I'll just say default name. And where I have the heading two, I'll change this around to heading one. And I'll say, yeah, you know what? I would want to display the name. I also would want to add a link just so we can navigate back to the people page. So let's say here link. And as you can see, of course, I have already imported. So we go here with a link and then two. And in this case, I'm just going to say, let's navigate back to people. I'll also add a class name here because I would want to add a little bit of CSS. And then as far as the link value, I'll say back to and then people. Beautiful. So once I save, when I click on Peter, I should have default name and back to people. But the good news is that I have my ID. So we could set up the use effect where we could filter out, well, which person I actually clicked on. And then, of course, just change the name. So that way we can always be sure whether it is Peter, Anna, or John. So we're going to go with use effect. So essentially, once the component renders, then we want to call our callback function. And I'll set up empty array. I'll say there's no dependencies in here. So just on the initial render. And now I'd want to get that person. So I'm going to go with const and I'll call this new person. And that is equal to a data. And now I'm just going to use the find method. Now the gotcha here is that, of course, I would want to parse the string. Because keep in mind that this is a string. And in my data, this is going to be an ID. So if you'll simply say like so, where you have the person ID matches the ID, this is not going to get you any person. Why? Well, because this one is a number and this one is a string. So what you need to do is go with parse and then int and then you wrap the ID inside there. And of course, I need to add the closing parentheses. So now I have my new person and then I can go with set name and we're going to go with new person and then dot name. So now what will happen? I have the Peter. So if I navigate back to people and I click on Susan, now, of course, the value will be Susan. So that's how we can deal with lists, set up the placeholder. And then each and every time we click on some item, instead of creating a brand new page, we use the same page, but there is already some kind of setup where I can get that unique value about that product or blog post or whatever. And then we can fetch it and display that specific item in the placeholder. So we create only one component, only one page, and that could be used by 4,000 items or four items like it is in our case. Excellent work. And up next, we have performance optimization. 
more specifically, we're going to cover react memo function, use callback hook, and then use memo hook as well. Now, before we go any further, let me just be very, very clear where I purposely added this topic to be our last one. Why? Because react is fast by default. Again, let me repeat. React is fast by default. And what I mean by that is just because you have these tools to optimize the performance of your app doesn't mean that you need to run over to your to do list app and start optimizing. That's not how it works. Now I did include it. And by the way, I was debating back and forth. I almost skipped it. But I did include it in tutorial because I wanted you to be aware of these functions and hooks and how they work. But it doesn't mean that you need to use them in your apps. Yes, there are some specific use cases where they're useful. But trust me when I say this, just because Twitter guru says that you need to apply these optimizations, you have to do it. No, react is fast by default. And when it comes to optimizations, they do add their own costs. So it's not like it's a free ride where we just add these magic functions and everything works like peaches. They do use the memory. They do use the computation power. So be mindful when you actually use them. During the videos, I will mention term memoizing. And that is not my term. That is not react term. That is a computer science term, which just means that we're caching results. And I'll simplify it even more during videos where I'll say, remember, we're remembering the value. Just keep in mind what the official naming is, because of course, remembering is something that I added, because I thought that we should simplify this memoizing term. And then lastly, if you don't trust me, if you think that everything that I'm saying is gibberish, and that you should use all of these functions, I would suggest going to your favorite search engine, and just type use callback or use memo and then type Kent. And you should get the article by Kent Dodds, where essentially he talks about when you should use memo and use callback. Hook. And there's not much to add there. He just lays out step by step why you shouldn't go crazy with use memo and use callback. Hook. So that's what we're going to cover next. There's going to be, of course, an example. Now, I created that example with this specific purpose. Again, it's not normally where you would use these optimizations. But since I wanted you to have an idea of how they work and where you can use them, that's why I created it. So we get a good practice on the react memo as well as use callback and use memo hooks. And once I've shared my two cents about the performance optimizations in react, of course, let's go to our example. And we're looking for the folder number 12. I named my component again setup. And then you're looking in the memo use memo use callback folder. And then more specifically, the setup folder, again, it's going to have the index. So you don't need to give it more specific path. And what you should see on the screen is the count. So of course, I can increase the count, as well as I have some products over here. So now, of course, let's navigate to that index. And let's see what all the big fuss is about. And you can see that I have some imports, I have use state, use callback, use memo, something we'll use in later videos. And also I'm using my custom fetch. So use fetch hook, where I pass in the URL. In this case, again, the URL is my own API, where I'm just sharing my product. So that is for my JavaScript course, we built a e commerce store. And this is the API that is providing those products, I get back the products notice again, I'm not using loading, then I have the count and set count. So this is my state variable. Notice I have the heading one for my count. And of course, I have the button 
that increases the count. And then, of course, things get a bit more interesting where I have my big list. So again, this is oversimplified example. We're talking about the big list, whether that is 100 items, 1000 items or something along those lines, because if you check it out, my list is not that big. So I have big list, then the prop name is products and I pass in the products that I'm getting back from my custom hook. And again, if you didn't cover custom hook, please go back because I'm not going to cover it one more time. And then in here I have the section I iterate over the products and I created single component. So single component for the product, just to emphasize one of the points. And then of course, I have the key that is that specific value, the unique one, because I have the list and then dot that dot product. So I use the spread operator where I grab all the properties that are on a product. Of course, if you would want to see what we're getting back, be my guest. In this case, I'll copy and paste. And you'll notice that, of course, I have the array. And then each and every item is that product. I have the ID. I have the image and all that good stuff. Now, that is not the most important part, though. Because yes, in single product, notice I'm accessing the fields property on the object, then I do a little bit more destructuring, I get the image, and this should look very familiar because we have done it 1000 times already in this tutorial. The point that I'm trying to make is something else, where at the moment I have the list I have click me. And you'll notice that if you add use effect in a single product, as well as the big list, each and every time you click on a button, you're actually re rendering. And let me show you how is that going to look like. So I already imported the use effect. By the way, I didn't. My apologies. Let's go with use effect. Now, again, in your case, it's going to be already there. And if we scroll down here and if we go with big list, and if you go with use effect and then you call it, and we'll just log. Uh, big list called big list called and I'll do the same thing over here where I'll copy and paste and you can also add the array here the empty dependency array it's not going to change the simple fact that every time you click on a button you'll invoke both of them so again I have use effect and I'll say single item called by the way I can add here a count as well. So if I navigate to a bigger browser window, if I refresh, notice. So once we call our component, yeah, I have item called, item called, and it goes all the way up to a 24. Now, what's more important though is that if you check out the console, I keep on clicking. Notice these values, they keep on increasing. So I have 12 items and then pretty much each and every time I click on a button, I see this big list called and then also each and every item gets re rendered. Now, first of all, well, why is that happening? Because I have the state value using use state. And then each and every time I click the button, what am I doing? Well, I change the value, correct? And remember, use state was doing what? It was preserving the values between the renders and it was triggering the let's say it all together re render, correct? And of course, in my component in the index one, I have my big list. So each and every time I click on a button and I update my count value, I'm triggering the re render. And then, of course, I'm re rendering the big list. And then in the big list, I have my single product. More specifically, I'm iterating over the array and I return for each and every item my single product. So those ones also get re rendered. So, what would be the solution? Well, solution is the memo function that comes with React. Again, please don't confuse it with use memo. Use memo is going to do something else that is a hook. We're talking about function by the name of memo. If you want to be really specific, then of course, it is a method because it is on react. And what we would need to do here is just go with react. 
and then dot memo, or you can import it. You can also do that up here where we're importing everything. And then what you would want is to wrap your essentially whole component in that memo. So memo is a function and you just pass in your component. So simply you set up parentheses and then you set up all the logic that you had for the component in that memo. All right. So once we save, we will notice that yes, on the initial render, notice we have 12. So we call this 12 times because we have 12 items, but then each and every time I increase, notice how we're not calling that use effect. Why? Well, because memo is checking, it is memoizing, well, what is the value? So if this props value did not change, then we're not triggering the re-render because we need to remember that every time the props or the state changes, component re-renders. So in this case, what's happening is that we're triggering that re-render with a count, correct? Because each and every time we change the state value, we're triggering the re-render. Now, when we add this React memo, what we do is we check. We say, hey, listen, did the value for my props change? Or it's exactly the same. And of course, the answer is, as you're clicking on a button, the value for the product is exactly the same. So then React is like, okay, so now I don't need to re-render my component. So if we don't re-render the big list, of course, as a result, we also don't re-render the single product. So that is the memo function in React. Not bad, not bad. We've got React memo method out of the way. But now let me throw you a mind grenade. What if I were to create a state value and I'll call this card? We'll not add the actual item in a card, but we'll somewhat simulate that action. Where we go with cart and then set cart. Of course, we use use state, our awesome hook. We provide the initial value, which is going to be zero. Then we'll also set up add to cart function. So we're going to go here with const and then add to cart, like so. And for the time being, it's just going to be an arrow function that does one very simple thing it sets the cart to the previous value plus one. So cart and then plus one. So that's my add to cart function. The thing is, though, that now I would want to pass that function down to my item. So first, right after the button, I'm going to create a heading one and I'll add a little bit of inline styling here. I'll say margin top is equal to three REMs. I think that is a good value. And then in here, let's say cart is equal to my cart value. Let's save it. It should be zero. Of course, that is my default one. But then, like I said, I would want to pass this sucker down to a single product. Yes, granted, we'll do some prop drilling, but I think we can live with that because there's something else that I'd want to show you. So where I have the big list, now let's go with a prop of add to cart. And then, of course, I'll add to cart function. Add to cart prop is equal to my add to cart function. Then, of course, we need to destructure it. We already know that. And then we need to pass it into that single component, correct? The single product component. Add to cart again, add to cart over here. And then finally, we get down to the single product. And then in the single product, I would want to add a button that, of course, calls it. So right after the paragraph, I'm going to go with button. Then we'll add on click. And then we'll pass in our add to cart. So we're not going to add that item literally to the cart, but we'll simulate that action. So add to cart. And again, there's going to be a issue. And the issue is going to be simply because we click to add to cart and notice again, we're calling that single item. So every time I click on this button, again, I'm re rendering all the items. Okay. Now, why is that happening? Well, if we scroll up, 
we see that we have this big list. Now, in this case, we have the products that we technically took care of with a memo. Okay, but then we have add to cart function. So again, this is our prop. And I told you in the last video that every time props or state changes, component will re render. Now, the thing is, when we change the state value, we trigger the re render. And each and every time we create this function from the scratch. So that's why React thinks that, hey, listen, this value changed because it was recreated from the scratch. And that's why, again, we're triggering the re render. Now, what is the solution? The solution is using use callback hook, which essentially does somewhat similar like we were doing with a memo, but now it's going to do with a function where it's going to check, hey, listen, has the value for the function changed? If it hasn't changed, good. I don't need to recreate that function from the scratch. If the value has changed, well, then of course, I would need to create that function one more time. So what we do is call use callback hook. And then we would want to pass in that function. So here again, we wrap our function in the parentheses. That's step number one. But also what I would want is to add the dependency array. And that is very important because what I would want is each and every time I update the cart value, I also create this function. And I'll show you what happens if you don't do that. But the good news is now that if I'm just working with a count, I'm not going to trigger that re render. Because what you'll notice that once you click on the count, check it out. See, the items are still just 12. So I don't re render each and every time I click on account because with our previous setup, so without this use callback, by the way, I didn't show you that. So my apologies, let me delete it and I'll recreate it from the scratch here, where now the problem is that as I'm clicking on account, all the items still get re rendered because again, this function gets created from the scratch and then react thinks, hey, listen, the props change. So I need to trigger the re render. That's why we use this use callback. So now we create this function only when we update the cart value. So just like we had dependency array with use effect, we have the same thing with our use callback. And that is a very important because you might be tempted to do something like this, where you go with, okay, I have my count, I have the cart, so I only want to create that function when I have the initial render. Now the problem is going to be you're not going to get that second value. Because if you go and if you console log the cart, it is always going to be zero. So if I go here, and if I will click on the add the cart, notice the cart is going to be zero. And then even though my value got updated in the state, since I didn't create this function, when the cart value changed, well, it's always going to be sitting on a zero. So here, you can keep on clicking. And notice it's always going to be one because I didn't create that function one more time when this value changed. So that's why you have the dependency array. That's why you add whichever value you would want to use to recreate the function, which of course, in our case is the cart. So once this value changes, we would want to create that function one more time. Now, of course, in that case, we will trigger the re renders. That is normal. That is not unexpected. But at least in this case, notice how I can keep on clicking the count and I'm not triggering the re render. Also, as a side note, if you check out the console, you should see here the warning where we have React hook use effect has a missing dependency, the get product. And that is coming from our custom hooks. And this is another use case where we can use the use callback. So just wait a little bit. In the next video, we'll cover use memo, and then we'll circle back 
and we'll take a look at how we can use this use callback to get rid of this warning in the console. Nicely done. And up next, we have use memo hook, which unlike the use callback, which memorizes or remembers the function. So if the cart value didn't change, that means we don't need to recreate function from the scratch. The use memo deals with a value. So like I said, please don't mix and match the two where react memo will essentially be looking for the props and see whether the props change or the use memo is specifically for the value. Now, in order to set up our example, I'm going to create a function first that returns some kind of value. So in here, I'll say cal who late again, I'm somewhat of the fan of explicit names for my functions. So expensive, expensive here, and then I'll pass in the data. And what I'm trying to do with this function is just to calculate the most expensive value as far as my products. And the way we set up the logic, I'm just going to return from this function, a value using the reduce function. So I'm going to go with data, whatever I'm passing in, and I can tell you right away that I will be passing in the product, then I'll use the reduce function. And again, it's not really important what I'm doing over here in this calculate most expensive one. But since I would want to make it a little bit more realistic, I will actually calculate the values from my items. Keep in mind that you can return for this example, some kind of random value, and it's going to work exactly the same. So in here, I'm iterating over my products. And then I know that the price is sitting in the fields and price. And again, if you want to double check that you can see it over here, I have my array, I have my object that of course represents that one specific product. And then I have this value for the price. So that's what I'm looking for, where I would want to reduce it down to that one single value, which is the biggest one. So that's why I'll say that I'll be returning a number and I'll divide it right away by 100 because the price is in cents. And then I'm just going to say that there is a price variable and that is equal to item fields and then price. So that is the property here. And we know that with reduce, we always need to return the total, correct? That is my first parameter. And I'll just say that if the price so that variable is bigger than the current total one. Well, then the total essentially will be equal to that price. So I'm simply checking for the highest value of the price, whatever it is. And then once I have my function, what I would want in my return, right above the big list, but below the cart, I'm going to have another heading one. And in here, I'll say most expensive. And that is equal again to a dollar sign, I guess that will make the most sense. And I'm going to go with most or you know what? Sorry, the function name was calculate most expensive. And then I would want to pass in my product. And what we need to keep in mind that we talk about some functions that take a long time to calculate. So the function returns a value. But let's imagine that it takes a long time to calculate this value. And if I log, I'll be able to see that every time I click, for example, on the count, I'm calling this hello. And imagine that if this function takes a long time to get that value, it's somewhat of a pain because I'm calling this every time I'm updating the state value. So if it would be nice if I would somehow be able to remember that value and only recalculate it or essentially run it one more time, the function, if my data changes. So in my case, of course, that is the product, correct? Because that's what we're passing in. And this is where use memo comes into play, where we go with const, 
and I need to come up with some kind of variable in this case. So I will just rename it to most expensive over here. Then I call use memo. So that's my hook. And what we need to pass into use memo is a callback function. And the first thing we need to set up is the function that returns a value, which in our case, of course, is calculate most expensive. Then we invoke it like so. And the second thing is the dependency array. And again, in this case, I'm passing in the product. And then, of course, I need to change from calculate most expensive to most expensive. And I can remove those products right now. So what you'll notice that it is still the same value. So we still call this function. But then every time we click on account, well, we don't see the hello, correct? So that means, of course, we're not calling this function. We remember the value using the use memo, and that only when the products change, essentially the data that we're passing in, only then we run the function one more time and recalculate the value. So that is react memo, use callback, as well as use memo hook in react. And the last thing that I would want to showcase, just like I promised, there's another use case for use callback. And that is essentially when we're fetching data. And an awesome example is over here. If we check the terminal, we can see that I have this warning where react use effect has a missing dependency, get product either included or removed from dependency array. And of course, that is in my custom hook, the use fetch hook. So let's see, we'll navigate over there, we have our custom hooks, and then we have our use fetch. And I can see that the react is complaining that hey, listen, you have get product function over here. So you need to add it as dependency. But before you jump over there and add it as dependency, let me warn you that you will create infinite loop. Why? Well, let's see, we have get products, correct. And what is this get products doing? Well, it is calling set products. So it sets the state value, which triggers the re render. So if I'll go over here, and if I'll say, get products is my dependency, the first time I'll call the get products, I'll change the state value. And then since this needs to rerun every time, of course, when we change something about this value, well, since get products, once we add it there, since it will get created from the scratch, once we re render, that's why we'll create a infinite loop. Because again, the same scenario like we had over here with index, where we had the add to cart, each and every time you re render, you create that function from the scratch. So if this gets added to dependency array, Technically, each and every time when it gets created from the scratch, well, you will re render the component. Now, in a function, though, you'll also change the state value. So you'll have that infinite loop. And what is the solution? Well, remember, we have our use callback, right? So we can go here with use callback, and then I can set it equal. I can say use callback over here like so. So let me wrap everything. And now I just need to say, well, when I would want to create that function. Of course, the answer is when I have a URL change. So once the URL changes, yeah, please recreate that function from the scratch. And now, of course, once we have this set up, I can bravely go to use effect and just add my get product. Again, let me reemphasize the point where previously, before we added this use callback, if we simply would add this get product, we would get a infinite loop. Why? Because this would get created each and every time. Now we only create a new function once the URL changes. And of course, as a result, we're not getting this infinite loop. So that would be another use case for use callback hook.